people should submit them? Um, right now? So just if you're not... Oh, wait, yourself no. of any to meet, to meet um, Yeah, so if you're not um, the person speaking, if you could just mute yourself uh, out of respect for everyone else, that'll make um, this meeting go a lot smoother. And before we begin, I see we have a lot of new faces. So just, um, or a lot of visitors, guests, what have you. So if you want to speak, just raise your hand, use the little raising hand icon in the corner. And um, yeah, and then I will call on you in the order that you folks raise your hands. And uh, what else, what else? All right, so before we get started, I just have a couple of requests for excusal um, from Marlena, Roman, and Howard, who could not make it here today. Margo asks for one as well, last minute. Oh, thank you. I didn't see that. And yeah, Margo... right there. Hey, also, also Sorry? I'm actually here. Um, oh. I might need, I'm Marlena, I'm here. Um, I might have to leave a little early, but I'm here for the time being. Oh, okay, perfect. So in that case, we will take your name off. So Roman, Howard, and Margo, if anyone wants to excuse them. Motion to excuse. To excuse James, do we have a second? Second. Second by Shivani. Is there any opposition? Okay, so that carries okay. unanimously. Oh, oh, sorry, was there a question? Uh, never mind. Okay, um, so I'll just do a really quick roll call, um, just to make sure everyone else is here. Uh, Isaiah, are you here? Yep. Here. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, are you here? Uh, Sarah, are you here? I am. Thank you. Uh, Manuela, are you here? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Daniel? Present. Thank you. Victoria? Here. Thank you. Uh, Holly? Present. Thank you. And Eduardo? Here. Thank you. Uh, once more, Malcolm, are you here? Okay, we'll keep him on the back burner. Uh, Jared, are you here? Not here. Diana, I remember we spoke before, so I know you're here. Uh, Harrison, you too, I know you're here. Chelsea, are you here? I'm here. You are here. Uh, Howard. Oh, no, we just excused Howard. Uh, Jeremiah, are you here? Not here. Uh, Lauren, are you here? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Zachary, are you here? Here. Thank you. Uh, Arie, are you here? You know you yes. Know. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. Present. Thank you. Margot is not here. Shivani, are you here? Here. Yes, you are. I saw you before. Uh, Yasmin. I believe I saw Yasmin as well. Uh, Marlena is here. Uh, Chris, are you here? Uh, present. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, are you here? Yeah. Thank you. Roman was excused. Sean, are you here? Yeah. Thank you. Anais, are you here? Here. Thank you. James, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you. Desiree. Yep. Thank you. And Hirsch, are you here? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and Malcolm, I just saw, is joining us. So that is all good. Um, so if uh, we are done with matters pertaining to roll call, we can move to approval of the agenda. So if there's anything to add, remove, amend, um, please speak now. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I would like to move the uh, discussion on the elections policy right after the uh, Sustainable Concordia um, presentation uh, and the uh, policy on uh, council and committees. Um, is there a reason just because there's a couple of uh, external presenters that usually well, you know after the after the external presenters right so oh, I said okay, after yeah, Sustainable yeah. Concordia right okay. I said after Sustainable Concordia because the other presenters are uh, Eduardo so uh, I put them like before Eduardo because uh, the reason is because uh, the election stuff is very time sensitive because as it currently stands uh, people are unable to gather signatures that would qualify them to get nominated and this policy fixes that. Okay, that's fair. Oh, after Space Concordia. Sorry, that makes sense. Um, oh, Edward, Space Concordia is also doing one? Okay, well then after them as well. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Eduardo, go ahead. Uh, afterwards, please. Sure. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. Um, I didn't get to check if this was actually in the minutes, but I'd like to pull the minutes of um, B-Levy Review, if they're in there. Okay. I believe they are. Um, 
And the uh, referendum questions that you had sent, um, obviously you want those added to the agenda as well? Sure, but I mean, like I thought I sent those before the deadline. Yeah, that was a um, confusion there. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it was just like if we're moving the elections policy and um, the standing one, can I have um, the HR policy then right after for the HR consultant proposal? Uh, I was just about to ask about that because I figured you'd want that moved up. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry about that. Just the other two were very no, no, don't quick worry. on my mind because like because I don't think there was any discussion on uh, on the HR policy. I think everybody just approved it in committee. Uh, well, it's just the I other will. one. Yeah, that's not a problem. I can move that up so as well. Um, Eduardo, go ahead. Eduardo? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me pull up the agenda. Under new business H, council quality referendum question, could you move that up to behind 5E point of the same name, council equality referendum question, so they're back to back? And also, sure. I would like to challenge uh, the adding of the two uh, Hirsch's two fee levy referendum questions for CGLO and the link since they were submitted late. They actually weren't submitted late. There was confusion. I thought that Hirsch's first question was his other question, so then I didn't put them on the agenda, but they actually were submitted to me on time. Okay. <clears throat> Does that help clarify things? Uh, Zach, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we will be able to move up um, secret ballots so that it's the first uh, point on returning business. Uh, yeah, sorry if I'm just taking a second. I'm just uh, scrolling like to pose that. the agenda. A second to move it up. Um, is there a lot of opposition for moving it up? There's opposition here. <laughs> um, okay, can Sorry, we just take Zach, a, What was it that you wanted to move up? To move up 7E to before 7A. <laughs> so secret ballot before freedom of speech, external committee minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can we just take a quick vote on that? Um, just so that we can deal with this quick, quick. Um, can you just say why you want to uh, move it up, Zach? Um, yeah, because uh, I, I feel like, um, I mean, in, in my view, I don't think it should take very long. And uh, I feel like, um, you know, with, um, uh, I feel like it's something that just needs to, to be addressed uh, as soon as possible because a lot of these secret ballots are just end up being waste of time for, for meetings. So I'd like to get it out of the way as soon as possible. Great, thank you. And Hirsch, what was the opposition? Uh, well, first off, um, it is a fairly contentious motion. It was defeated the last time it came to council. Uh, it will have quite a bit of discussion for it. And uh, considering the large amount of items on the agenda that have been pushed off from meeting to meeting, I feel like it would not make sense to move that earlier up. All right, thank you. Okay, can we take a quick vote on this then? Um, so first, uh, well, obviously there's opposition. Um, so I'll just go through the list quick, quick. Uh, Diana, how do you vote? Uh, yes, for moving it up. Okay, yeah, yes is to move it up, no is to not. Uh, Harrison, how do you vote? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Chelsea, how do you vote? I vote yes. Yes. Um, Lauren? Yes. Yes. Zachary? Yes. Yes. Uh, Arie? No answer. Uh, Sarah? Yes. Yes. Um, Shivani. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Yasmin. Not here, Marlena. Yeah. Yes, uh, Chris. Uh, I'll abstain. Abstain, Matthew. No. No, um, Roman's not here, Sean. Uh, no. No, Anais. Yes. Yes, uh, James. No. No, Desiree. Yep. Yes, and Hirsch. No. No, uh, did I miss anyone? Don't I vote no. Oh, sorry, that was Ari. Thank you. 
All right, um, so that is uh, nine yes, five no, and two abstention. Uh, so we will move it up to the top of the agenda, or the top of returning business anyways. Um, Hirsch, go ahead. I'd like to ask that the motion to reduce effective tuition by reducing our, what do you call it, fee? Operating oh, fees sure. be moved earlier on as it is a uh, referendum question and therefore um, ought to be dealt with before or at least in the, within the same meeting that we call the referendum. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I can move it to, since it is a referendum, it should, I guess, be under presentations because you're presenting a referendum question. So I'll just move it to the end of presentations. And that is that. Is there anything else to amend? All right, um, so I just need a motion to approve the agenda and all items under consent. Motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Seconded. Second. Second. I think that was James. Uh, is there any opposition to approving? All right, so that carries and we will move forward with our presentations. Um, we do have a lot on the agenda today just because it's the meeting before, um, before by-elections and it's the last day for referendum questions. So. <laughs> Um, external presenters, if you could just keep your presentations to um, around 10 minutes, that would be great just because we want to be able to fit everybody in. Um, so the first one we have is uh, the student care referendum question. And who will be presenting this one? Uh, Alex right here. Hi, Caitlin. Oh. Hi. Hey folks, uh, my name is Alex Golovko. Uh, I'll be talking to you folks about uh, CSU's uh, telemedicine services today. Just give me a second to share my screen. I, uh, I can definitely appreciate that, uh, that you folks have quite a bit on the agenda. Uh, Caitlin, I'll use you as a reference point if you don't mind. Can you see my sure. presentation? Yeah, not a problem. You want me to give you a time signal or something? Uh, look, um, I'm sure you folks can appreciate that usually I take a good hour to, to do a presentation like this. That being said, uh, keeping in mind your your time constraints, I'll do my best to keep it uh, at 10 or possibly even under 10 minutes so that we can use <laughs> time more flexibly for questions. Uh, that being said, I will uh, share my contact information through Isaiah uh, at the end. And if folks have any questions that you'd like to follow up on uh, after the fact, feel free. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to touch base uh, offline on any follow up questions that you may have. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's get this show on the road. So uh, my name is uh, Alex Glovko. I am the Director of Partnerships and Development at Student Care. We are the uh, third party administrator of the CSU Health and Dental Plan. And we have been with the CSU since uh, uh, the very first day of your Health and Dental Plan 24 years ago. Uh, I personally uh, have worked with the CSU for the last six. Uh, so a quick agenda for today, a round of introductions, uh, a quick background, the overview of our virtual platform, uh, the implementation update from the last few months, uh, a draft referendum question that, uh, that we worked together on with the CSU, and naturally a discussion at the end. Uh, before we get started, I'm sure uh, quite a few of you folks uh, have uh, uh, been or are familiar with, uh, with student care and the work that we do for you. Uh, but in short, um, student care has been created by former student leaders. I myself served as president of the Carleton University Student Association uh, in uh, Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, our founder and CEO was the VP Finance over at SMU at McGill, and many other uh, others of my colleagues uh, have been uh, former student leaders. We like to say that uh, we are not insurance people who went into the student union world. We are student union leaders who went uh, into the insurance world. Uh, today, we are based in Montreal and have over 140 dedicated staff working on the CSU Health and Dental Plan, but also with over a million students across the country uh, and uh, 100 student associations plus at, uh, at 60 uh, plus institutions uh, across, uh, across Canada, including naturally both the CSU and the GSA uh, at Concordia. Uh, a few quick facts about your health and dental plan, just for reference points. Uh, it was established by referendum, similar to what we're looking to do today, uh, back in 1996 and 1997 for your health and dental plan. Uh, today, it's by far one of the largest CSU services, uh, offering uh, services uh, used by close to 20,000 students uh, in any particular year. Uh, ultimately, the plan is fully overseen by the CSU and uh, the conversation that we will be having today uh, relates very much to a decision that you folks get to make about the uh, next step uh, of what we like to call the Student Union Health and Dental Plan 2.0. Um, 
about a year ago, we started with the why. We recognized that uh, the role of virtual platforms will only be uh, gaining traction in, uh, uh, in our world. And uh, uh, the reality of the pandemic has only accelerated the fact. Uh, after consulting, researching, uh, and investigating some of the issues and challenging, ch challenges that campuses have, uh, that health services on individual campuses have, we've, uh, we've noticed a few common threads. Uh, and uh, among, um, among those, uh, we've, uh, we've seen that uh, from year to year, there's substantial increase uh, in demand from students seeking uh, all sorts of uh, health services support from uh, on-campus clinics. Uh, naturally, campus clinics are limited uh, in space and in funding. There are physical challenges. Uh, when it pertains to Concordia, which was close to 40,000 students, uh, naturally it becomes rather difficult for uh, on-campus uh, services to accommodate the big traffic. Uh, so it's not scalable. Uh, there are staffing issues. So what happens after hours on weekends, uh, during holidays, uh, and naturally for ever rising administration costs. Uh, Hey what is happening to services in this uh, this winter was a question that came up uh, actually in the summer when we were thinking about the fall. Now we know that both the fall and the winter have gone online. <laughs> when looking at the realities of Canadian uh, primary care, uh, our research has shown that 61% of uh, uh, family GPs cannot accommodate uh, urgent visits. At the same time, for folks who faced an urgent uh, situation and decided to go uh, uh, to the ER, uh, the percentage of patients that say that uh, their ER visit could have been resolved by their GP uh, nears 40% in Canada. A quick explanation of, uh, of our model. What we were looking to do is kind of uh, mold three different areas, aspect of a service, and that is uh, giving students uh, a more fast-tracked access to doctors, assisting them to navigate the health system, and ultimately avoid emergency rooms uh, when it's possible and uh, avoid wasting resources that could otherwise go to uh, instances and cases that, uh, well, that are more urgent. Uh, the idea behind it is to both decrease pressure on campus health services while improving the student experience. And I'm kind of going over this uh, top of the iceberg um, uh, a, a little quicker, but again, happy to, to go into more detail in questions as needed. Uh, our virtual health services uh, was created through a partnership with Dialog. Uh, Dialog today works with on-campus health services to bolster access to students in a number of different ways. Uh, for those of you who may have used the service through the current offering or heard about the service in the newspaper, uh, today Dialog, which is actually also a Montreal-based company, uh, manages over a thousand daily visits and has done over half a million consultations to date. Uh, they have hundreds of medical professionals fully trained in virtual care. It is 24-7, 365 and available across all 10 provinces uh, for, uh, for your students who are not just in Montreal, but also uh, spread across the country, both now during the pandemic and beyond. Uh, the solution summarized with the Dialogue Virtual Clinic through Student Care offers is essentially a fast access to medical, to me to medical professionals. Uh, as a very blunt and simple example, I wake up one morning, I have a rush on my arm. Uh, I have the option of uh, going out there and going to the hospital and waiting through the lineups uh, to uh, see a therapist and then, and, and then get, uh, get a referral to go to the lab to check on what is this rush about, is about. Or alternatively, I can, using my cell phone, both Android or iOS or my laptop, uh, I can uh, dial in and have access to a medical professional within uh, an hour during business hours or within two hours on weekends or after hours that will assist me and walk me through the, uh, through the situation that I have, so the rush on, on my arm. Uh, they are able to either uh, prescribe me a medication if they're comfortable in, that, in the diagnosis of, uh, of my particular situation, or they would, will defer me uh, to uh, a concierge who will assist me in going to a place uh, uh, nearby, depending on my personal location, where I would be able to get immediate, immediate assistance uh, based on my personal preferences and schedule. Uh, so navigation and concierge. Uh, the onboarding is done uh, through student care, similar to the way we do it for your health and dental plans. 
Uh, in Canada, we help patients find the best in-person resource for individuals who seek that assistance going beyond the telemedicine component of things. Uh, internationally, for those uh, of your members who will find themselves overseas during an exchange uh, or a term abroad uh, or an internship, uh, or your international students, we find emergency rooms, clinics, and pharmacies for those individuals as well. Again, all through, uh, through the application. Offer technical and admin support, uh, book appointments, update health files, and coordinate with doctors, nurses, and psychologists for any of your students' needs. Uh, just a couple slides to go. Uh, so in terms of what students would get access to, uh, from July 1st, uh, kind of when we got into the high swing of the first wave of the pandemic, to December 31st, the CSU was able to sponsor this service for plan members uh, using its reserve funds. Uh, naturally, the reserve funds that the CSU has accumulated from the health and dental plan of, and for the health and dental plan uh, are not infinite. And so today, uh, working with the CSU and the CSU executives, we have decided to bring this question forward to referendum for students to decide whether it's a service that could be useful for, uh, for the population uh, across, uh, across as a whole. Uh, to summarize, students get access to 24-7 bilingual care available across 10 provinces, fast access to medical, to, to medical professionals, I'll skip over a couple, free delivery of prescriptions covered by the, health, the CSU Health and Dental Plan, uh, care navigation and concierge service, proactive follow-ups, uh, and ultimately a more productive and friendly experience for individuals who are often for a first time are dealing with uh, the Canadian medical system uh, and beyond. Uh, in the realities of COVID-19, when social distancing has been directed, natural virtual access uh, is becoming uh, mainstream and we do foresee it being the, the future of uh, uh, student health and dental plans and actually uh, medical systems as a whole. Uh, the draft referendum question that again we worked on uh, looks like this. I believe it has been shared ahead of time uh, prior to this meeting, but uh, I would be happy to at this point uh, bring it back to the referendum question and uh, take uh, any questions that I guess Caitlin will coordinate for us. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you very much. Um, so at this point, I will take a speaker's list. Uh, Hirsch, I saw your hand up. Um, I'm not really sure if there's a motion on the table. Um, someone has to read it. Can I modify it before it's read? Um, as long as it doesn't uh, go against the spirit of the motion. All right. Um, I'd like to just add to this thing. Um, well, after the words of a 4.88 fee per month, um, comma, which, which comes out to, and then the dollar month per semester, per semester, or, and then the dollar amount per year, per year. Okay, um, is, is that acceptable, Alex, since you're the, the promoter of the petition? Uh, uh, I, I guess if I get to, uh, I guess if I get to give feedback on this, uh, I'm absolutely open to any feedback that we get from the team. I will use this opportunity, by the way, to say and to underline, it is said in the question that the fee would be opt-outable, so students who don't want to use the service don't have to. That being said, I think that the decision is absolutely up to uh, up to the council and the executive to uh, uh, to bring forward a question that will be uh, will be put on the ballot. But yes, I, it is it is amenable. Thank you. Um, okay, so Hirsch, you want to keep that uh, amendment? Um, can we get some numbers though, just so that's not an extra? Oh, yeah, he's printing it. Uh, um, yes, of course, Caitlin. Yes, oh, I, I, can, I can forward those to, to Isaiah, but I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward math, but we, we can assist for sure. Yeah, sorry, that'd be great. Um, do we have a second for that amendment? Or for so, that motion? Can, can I just wait? So if I understand correctly, you just want the, do you want the semesterly fee or the yearly fee? Like, what do you so like? I I want the breakdown of, um, it's X amount per month, which, which turns out to n amount per uh, a semester, which turns out to y amount per year. So I want all the numbers well explained in the question. All right, thank you. Um, do we have a second for the motion? Can, can I suggest, should it be in the question or in the preamble? Uh, again, I'm agnostic, but just want to make sure that, uh, of, of course, you, you folks know your policies better than I do. 
Uh, whatever needs to, to be presented in the question, I'm happy to work with it, but uh, I'll be providing those numbers. I'm just wondering whether a lot of numbers in one question could uh, take away from the attention of the question. Just thoughts out loud. Uh, I mean, it's up to, it's, it's up to council. Um, but yeah, once we have the numbers, it'll be um, a lot easier to vote on, I guess. Um, do we have a second for the motion or move it along? Is this a second to Hirsch's motion or a second to this referendum question? Uh, to Hirsch's motion. Okay. Um, it's not, or was that a second, Lauren? I'll second it. Okay. Um, so currently on the floor, we have the motion um, with the promise, I guess, of getting some numbers for the semester, for the monthly fee and the semester fee, I think you said, Hirsch? Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing the math right. Mm -hmm. the, I miss the, it would turn out to per semester $19.52 and $58.56 per year. In le I mean, this is actually a question uh, to the presenter. Sorry, I don't recall your name offhand, even though it's written on the screen, which isn't a good sign. Anyway, um, question, is this also for over the summer? Uh, yes, definitely. It mimics your uh, CSU health and dental plan, which is available September 1 to August 31. So in a similar, in a similar fashion, it would work the same way. So it's $58.56 cents per year. What was that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. $58.56 cents by taking 4.88 and multiplying by 12. Okay, so currently the motion on the table um, that has a second would be do you support the implementation of student care's integrated virtual telemedicine service for all Concordia University undergraduate students and implementation of a $4.88 fee per month uh, starting January 2021 or a $19.52 fee per semester or a $58.56 fee per semester and then students will be able to opt out of the service. Per year. Per year, sorry, sorry, per year, my mistake. And then students will be able to opt out of the service and fee during a designated opt-out period independent of the main plan in the fall and winter. So that is uh, that. And Hirsch, go ahead. Your motivation? Uh, my motivation is I just want um, all questions that have to do with um, charges and whatnot should include explicit um, mention of how much it'll cost uh, per year, the average student per year or per semester. All right, thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Okay, so I have some questions. Um, first of them is just uh, clarification. All students are automatically signed up for this healthcare plan and in order to get signed out of them, we have to opt out through where? Uh, sim Hi, Lauren, Alex here. Uh, same as for your CSU health and dental plan, uh, the opt-out periods take place in September and in January through studentcare.ca. Uh, it's a 90-second process, usually speaking about your health and dental plan. Uh, should this go forward, students will have during that opt-out period one more option to also opt out of this particular fee. So it's all taken care of uh, online through our site with the refund going directly to your student account. Or not being okay. charged at all. And then that leads to my second question is how exactly does your policy mesh with the current um, healthcare plans provided to international students? Because I'm an international student. I've never heard of this healthcare like plan before, and I already am covered through the university. So am I paying double for healthcare then? Uh, Lauren, this is a great question and actually a very big discussion that uh, the CSU is actively engaged in. I, I came to Canada as an international student as well. Um, based on uh, Concordia, the university, Concordia University's decision, uh, international students are covered by a separate uh, health and dental plan through uh, Blue Cross. It's about a thousand dollar fee that you see on your account. We have absolutely nothing to do with it. I'm quite familiar with the system because I was part of it as well as a student. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, uh, this is not something that is being offered by your um, uh, international plan. Uh, and once again, uh, should you choose not to use it, you could uh, opt out altogether. Wait, I'm confused. Like, so international students don't qualify for this, but we're automatically charged for it? Like, 
you well we're mixing a few things here uh, i'll take i'll try to take 30 seconds to uh to explain uh international students are covered through concordia the university uh, blue cross the insurance company for an international health and dental plan that is costing you yes. about a thousand dollars yeah i know that the csu is offering its members uh with a health and dental plan for canadian citizens and permanent residents <laughs> anywhere across the country, a CSU health and dental plan valued at about $200, 206, I believe is the exact figure. Okay. Uh, international students are not covered in that from the get-go. Now, what we're talking about today uh, is Dialogue, which is virtual health services offered under the CSU uh, health and dental plan, which uh, should this question pass, would be available for international students who want to use it. That being said, if they don't want to use it, they could opt out and get their fee back, which is not the case with your international plan provided by um, Concordia University. Did that answer your question, Lauren? No, I'm still very confused. Like, are like are international students, or are they not automatically signed up for this service? Uh, this service right now, uh, should the question pass, you will be automatically signed up, yes. So we're going to be automatically signed up for a service we're not eligible for? No. You would be eligible for it, yes. Um, Isaiah, you're next on the speaker's list. Do you want to clarify? I, um, what's it called? This is something new, something that nobody, like that has been trial run in terms of like, um, there's an echo, but anywho, there's been, um, this is a new service, meaning that international students and regular like domestic students can use it. The health and dental plan, the university has their own. International students aren't covered because there's some hoopla or some regulation or whatever that they claim that is there. So y'all don't even opt into that, into our health and dental plan. You can opt in for the dental for extra coverage because I hear that like it's, ours is better than what's offered at Blue Cross, but there are two separate ones. This referendum question is asking students if they want to pay for this additional service, given, co um, given the nature of COVID, it allows you to access like medical services from the comfort of your own home. Completely new revolution, uh, um, what is it called? Telemedicine, it's new. Nobody, like we've had it for these past couple of months because we are trying it at no extra cost to students, but that free trial is up. So now this is the chance to know if students want to pay for it or not. It's optional. And then even if it passes, students who don't want it, they just opt out of it the same way that you opt out of the, um, the health and dental. And the opt out, the, the difference between this and other ones is you can permanently opt out. So like if you're first year and you're like, nah, my parents got health and dental, I don't need it. I opt out permanently. I'm never opted back in. Great, thank you. Uh, was that all Isaiah since it was your speaker turn? No, that was just to answer Lauren's question, but oh, I yeah, go ahead. is it answered? Yeah, I think so. All right, so I'm just like, for simplicity purposes, I'm not sure, it might be a larger discussion, but I think like one fee denomination, whether it's yearly, semesterly, um, what's it called, or monthly, would be appropriate so that people don't get confused and think that like, or what it is, because I'm like, if it's per month, then the students know it's per month. If it's per semester, they know per semester. If it's yearly, then they know it's yearly. I just think one would be enough. But that, that yeah, that's for the, the, mo the amendment on the table. All right, thank you. Oh, the, the, uh, the amendment, like the, we're, we're just like on the whole motion that has the amendment right now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's going to be a vote about that. So that was me saying that, like, I like I don't care what the denomination is, but not all three, just one type of thing. So, like, instead of four, like, right now we have it per month. If somebody wants to amend it to yearly, that's fine. If somebody wants to amend it to semesterly, that's fine. But just one denomination type of thing. Thank you. Our Harrison, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, my so my question was originally, um, basically, uh, you know, I, I was under the assumption that this was currently being offered, which Isaiah confirmed that it is under the trial period. So now that I'm aware of that, I just wanted to, to speak uh, in favor of it, because um, 
I have not personally tried it. However, um, multiple um, people that I know, friends of mine and, and students, I think across the board have used the services and it's really, really proven to be beneficial. So that's all I just wanted to say. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to confirm that you can uh, basically opt out this once and never be bothered about it again. Isaiah actually answered most of my questions. That's the only thing I'm a little unsure about. You can. Uh, Alex, do you have an answer? You can. So if so, you're covering your parents' plan, you don't need to uh, or, uh, opt out the second time? If Oh, we're mixing two, two things again. For your health and dental plan, um, look, from, a, um, from an insurance perspective, we do like for folks to opt out on a yearly basis because, of course, um, family situations change and uh, a, a student in first year that could have been covered by a parent in year one may no longer be covered uh, in year four. So we do encourage students to opt out uh, on a yearly basis as opposed to just once. That being said, for, uh, for dialogue, for virtual health services, we are able to manage a one-time, so the question on, on the table, we are able to manage uh, a one-time opt-out where students no longer have to go through it again. That being said, we can discuss this during the setup of logistics. If you are very uh, keen on opting out one time from the CSU Health and Dental Plan, uh, we are able to accommodate that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Arie, go ahead. No, I just wanted, I just wanted to, to say that uh, the company I work for, we have this service, more, uh, it's, it's uh, almost a year, I have used it at least twice, and it's a very good service, Dialogue. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so at this point, uh, there's nothing else, uh, there's no, uh, no one else on the speakers list. Um, so I just want to uh, make sure that we're all okay with the motion on the table currently, so it's the one that you see in front of you, um, and then the uh, semester fee of $19.52, and the yearly fee of $58.56, and are we all okay with adding um, be it resolved that this be sent to referendum because I think that was missing. So uh, I think it's just... in my document. Like, I think I have a be it resolved in the actual motion document, but it's just not in front. Uh... Oh yeah, you might indeed. Point of information. Yep. With the charge, is it charged to the student account, a monthly, semesterly, or once a year? Alex, I presume you can answer that. Uh, good question. Yeah, it would either be, well, with the January 1 implementation, because the start of the year is September, I think we may, definitely not monthly, uh, we will either be starting, it, it, this will come down to the logistics with the university because um, uh, you get charged through your university student account. Uh, at the beginning, it may start off as a uh, semester fee on January 1 uh, and semester again on May 1 and then shift to uh, per year September 1, which would be uh, easier to manage in general. Thank you. Uh, Isaiah, did you have anything to add? So, is it possible to amend an amendment? I can't. Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I'm then, using my dad all the time, is it? I, I, can I, I'm gonna motion to amend that. Um, yeah, the daycare, it's getting cuter and cuter. Oh, um, I think someone's not on mute. I'm trying to find them. Oh, there you go, yeah, go ahead, Isaiah. Yeah, I motion to amend it to be a semesterly fee rather than a monthly fee and a yearly fee type of for now. And then um, a caveat could be that, I don't know who is gonna be executives by then, but the executives announce that when it transitions via newsletter or by email statement that the charge is on a yearly basis so that people aren't confused. So instead of having 4.88 and the other numbers, you just want $19.52 semester fee? Yeah, because for the next two semesters, it's going to appear as a semester fee, and then the new executives, when they're deciding the new insurance prices or whatnot, will that it will be decided then if it's going to be a yearly fee or a semesterly fee by then. Um, do you have any wording for that? Like, so for now, can I make a suggestion? Uh, well, Isaiah, what what was it you were trying to say? And then Hirsch, go ahead. For now, it would just be. The simple amendment is that um, that we just literally change four nine four eight eight to the nineteen number, like nineteen whatever the semester okay. fee, a semester, and then you can add a be it resolve for 
council purposes and not in the actual referendum question. Yeah. That we resolve that the 2020, 2021, 2022 executives notify students of the future, like at what, at like how often they will be charged for this when it comes up next year. Because we, every, I think it is June or July, we have to set the insurance fees anyway and inform students what the fee is. So it can be done there and they can be told that like your dialogue will now be charged yearly or if it like starting fall or semesterly, depending on what it, whatever it is is decided. Okay, do we have a second for that? Mm -hmm. Sorry? I think a bunch of people spoke at once. Do we have a second? Uh, 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 Alex here, sorry, I cannot second things, but can, okay. can, can I make a quick suggestion? If yeah, sure. Uh, what we could also do is uh, make it annual from the get-go, uh, except that in January, students will be uh, charged a prorated fee. So the annual divided by 12 multiplied by eight. So prorated two thirds of the annual, and then it just keeps it consistent across the board. And then it'll be a regular annual come September 1 if of any help, up to you folks. All right, um, can I yeah, Hirsch, declare half of Isaiah's amendment to be friendly? <laughs> um, yeah, I well, can we get a second first for the amendment? Sure, I'll second it. Okay, second it, I think that was Sean. Um, or yeah, sorry, that was me. Oh, that Hirsch. was first, sorry, my mistake. <laughs> Go ahead, Hirsch, your second. All right, um, um, yeah. the part about just replacing the 499 per month to, I Isaiah, did you say per semester or per year? Per semester. Okay, yeah, so replace that with the per semester. Um, I would call that a friendly amendment. The part about the execs notifying students, I think that'll just end up in the how your fees are billed section of the Concordia website anyway. So I guess it'd be cool if the execs actually sent out a newsletter explaining how to opt out of the, what do you call it, of the medical fees and what they are. But I don't really see that as creating an, I don't see the utility in creating the additional mandate at this point. All right, thank you. Um, Alex, do you mind if I just share my screen with the full motion for a minute? Right. Uh, yes, of course, I'm all done on my end. Oh, perfect. The presentation, yeah. Uh, let me just find, okay, so what we have currently, um, wait a minute, uh, there's, is it 4.89 4 or 4.88? Yeah, can you confirm the number, Alex? 4.88, we're playing okay. with the rounding, yeah. Perfect, so four point, so currently we have 4.8, per 58.56 per year, but then we had decided to just go with 19.52 per semester. Yep. Okay, so that is good. There was no opposition to that. And then we had, where did my Zoom go? Sorry, I'm just trying to find something. Uh, then we had that other be it resolved said, The 2021-2022 executive, how was it worded? It was notify, I know I'd written it in the chat, I just can't find the chat right now. Did we have anyone sponsor this motion? Yeah, uh, yeah Hirsch did at the beginning. Um, okay, thank you. Well, because it was me who sponsored, but Hirsch amended. Yeah, it was a bit complicated because the first person who spoke was technically the, the, the sponsor of the motion, so it was like, a bit weird uh, in that sense, but um, yeah, I just need the wording of, um, ah, where's the chat? So it's like, be it resolved that the 2021-2022 executive inform the student body of the workings of the plan, the insurance plan and its opt-out procedures via dedicated email to students. Uh, is that, uh, I think it was something about 
Okay, does this make sense? Be it resolved that the 2021-2022 executive inform the student body of the workings of the insurance plan and its opt-out procedures and timelines in a dedicated email, and then be it further resolved that the budgetary impact of the motion is nil. Were there any oppositions to these uh, amendments? Okay, um, so in that case, uh, we can move to a vote. Um, so first of all, is there any opposition to this motion as a whole? All right, then that carries unanimously. Um, so this question will be sent to referendum um, in the by-elections. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say, Alex? No, thank you so much for your time. And uh, for any of you folks that may have follow-up questions on anything to do with telemedicine or your CSU health and dental plan, you can get my contact from Isaiah. But uh, thank you so much for everyone. You're doing very important work and I'm sure that your members are appreciative of it. So thanks. All right, thanks so much, Alex. Um, so if there's nothing further on uh, this agenda point, then we can move on to, uh, where did my agenda go? We can move on to, I believe CJLO is next. Mm, sorry, just finding my agenda. Okay, yeah, then we can move on to, oh, fee levy opt-out period. And Emily, this one's yours. Hello. Okay, hold on. Um, I've got a PowerPoint, so maybe I'll just share my screen. Yeah, go ahead. If I may. Okay. My name is Emily. Um, I come to council meetings every so often, um, and I know a lot of you already. I work for um, Sustainable Concordia, which is a fee levy group on campus. Um, and I've been working with Eduardo for quite a while now as one of the fee levy representatives uh, involved in creating and implementing the online opt-outs. Um, so based on a presentation that he gave back in September um, about the proposed uh, system that's been worked on by the university, um, I said that I, I gave a statement on that meeting saying that I would like to kind of share our perspective. Um, so I'm here to talk about the fall opt out, fall 2020 opt out period uh, and how it went. Um, so, yeah, so a bit of context for folks that ha haven't been around through all of this. So, since all university and student services went online in the spring, uh, Concordia Fee Levy groups have run two opt out periods, um, the most recent of which ended on September 26th. Uh, this happened in the fall because uh, on Oct August 17th, Eduardo told me that the administration would not be able to complete their uh, proposed system um, by the fall semester. So that's when we found out that we would again be running the opt-out um, period. So between uh, August 17th and the middle of September, uh, the field groups got together. We looked at the system that we'd used in the summer um, and then looked at how we could change and improve that based on feedback that we got from community members um, and field levy groups and students. So uh, changes from the summer opt-out period. This time we used a single form that students could fill out uh, and then on that form they could indicate which groups they wanted to opt out of um, and then they could upload their information and enter um, their basic um, info as students uh, into that and then that was as opposed to the summer semester when students had to email different groups um, to request refunds. Then um, we had a reunified reimbursement process directly into student accounts, which is what we did in the summer as well, but it was much more streamlined at this point. Um, and we also ensured reimbursements from all the organizations. Um, but some transactions are still being processed by um, online bank accounts and through the Concordia financial system because, um, yeah, it's the school, so we have to receive the requests from students. Um, those requests are passed on to fee levy groups PLV groups go to their online banks, um, use their online banking system to refund students into their student accounts. The, um, those processes take time to be processed by the banks, and then it takes time for it to be received by Concordia and processed on the administrative side. Um, it's just how online banking works. So uh, the wheels are in motion for that, and all the refunds will be finished shortly. Um, so yeah, I'm going to show you a bit of what the form looked like, just for folks that uh, didn't get a chance to see it or didn't participate and the opt-out period this time around. So it was very simple. Um, it was a drop form. 
there was a series of questions uh, like your name and your student number and how many credits you're taking. Um, there was a space to upload a picture of your student card and your transcript just to confirm um, the information that was entered if needed. Um, and then for each field of group, um, 23 in total, there would be a page like this. This is just, um, I took CUTV because it was easy to fit on one screen um, that has information about the field of group and information about what the fee is. So here's 34 cents per credit. Um, many of the groups had links to their websites uh, or in the case of groups like the Concordia Nightline, um, a link to their contact information and their services. Uh, and then for each group, students can select yes or no on whether they'd like to opt out of that group and then move forward to the next screen. Um, at the end, there's a place to sign just with your mouse. Um, and then you can review everything that you've entered and submit it. And there's one confirmation email sent to the student um, and all the information gets sent to each of the groups that have participated in the process, which is all the groups. So that's, that's a bit of the form. Um, we're looking at moving forward in the future. It could be more interactive and have um, videos. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really up to us um, about, and we were looking at for student feedback in terms of what kind of information they'd like to see on there and what, what groups um, want to share as well. So um, I've got some statistics uh, about this forum. Uh, there were 7,000 visits to the forum in the opt-out period from September 22nd to 26th. Uh, of those 7,000 visits, uh, just over 1,000 people actually completed the opt-out process. Um, an average of 13 minutes was spent on the form, and 30% of people who opted out picked specific groups, uh, and 70% of people who opted out selected all the groups. Um, so it's it's great to have this kind of information, um, and what it what it means to me is that uh, the educational system and component that we're working on is really effective, and the fact that people are taking that much time to read all the information, um, and the fact that more than 5,000 people looked at the form and read the information, and then after they had a better understanding of the system, decided not to opt out um, is really promising because that's what we're hoping is to build a relationship with students where people understand what we do and um, are able to make choices that benefit their community um, or make decisions that balance their own financial viability with um, the needs of students. So, um, so that's really reassuring. Um, let me see. Yeah, so that's, that's the statistics. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm here, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm here to sort of uh, compare and contrast with the potential system that Eduardo presented um, kind of third hand from the Concordia administration and the IT department back in September. Um, so this system, the community run system, uh, it meets all the recommendations that were put together by the previous CSU executive in collaboration with the council and the fee levy groups. Um, this is a document with that was like close to a 30 page document of recommendations um, that was put together through the consultation process that was started by Christopher last year and continued um, by Eduardo uh, this year. Uh, and that was approved by council um, and came up with a list of recommendations that everyone agreed were very necessary for an opt out system that would um, be effective for students uh, and fee levy groups. And the uh, this system that I'm presenting uh, meets all those recommendations, um, whereas the school system that Eduardo showed us uh, last time um, only meets, I think, one or two of them. There's some, there's some big uh, conflicts there. Um, this system is collaborative and we respond to student concerns as soon as possible. There's an email address on the Concordia Community website that's checked regularly. Um, we're accessible on Facebook. Uh, we've got contact info for each of the groups involved, um, and we're always happy to listen to concerns and address things um, as quickly as possible. Um, the system allows field groups to stay up to date on our own finances, budget effectively and transparently, and maintain strong relationships with students and other members, which has been the, been the goal of the field system for the past 20 years. We exist uh, to support and listen to students, not to the university IT department. So I'm something that I'm, I feel very passionately is that it's important that um, students are able to reach out to us uh, specifically and start conversations, and that if there is an issue, um, I or Abdullah or one of the other folks working on this is the one that hears about it and not the IT department who doesn't really understand what's happening um, and couldn't name the groups and doesn't know what's, what the system is going on or what the history of that is. Uh, so this community run system will only improve and become more efficient and effective. Uh, I take any concerns very seriously um, and I'm here today to also answer questions from council. So um, 
my, that's almost the end, but my, so I wanted to read this little statement. So, uh, I'm here on behalf of the Filavi community because this process has drawn out for almost a year and has been a drain on Filavi and CSU energy and resources. This has spanned over two executive teams, two councils, and four semesters. Council has the power today to finish this process and commit to the system that is already in place, ready to go for the winter semester, and will improve with student and community input. Based on the past 11 months of work between the CSU and the Filavi community, the 30-page recommendation document that was approved by Council in the spring, and the community concerns about the system presented by the Concordia administration strongly believe the best course of action is for Council to end this period of uncertainty and approve the Concordia community system for the winter semester and beyond. I and the Filavi community are more than willing to continue working with Eduardo, the Dean of Students Office, and anyone from Council who wants to make sure the system is institutionalized in a way that meets everyone's needs. Um, okay, so I'm happy to take questions. I can't make a motion, but I'm amenable to somebody making a motion. Thank you. Uh, Shivani, go ahead. Hi. Um, well, thank you, Emily, for this presentation. And to, I have lost the Zoom page. Oh, no. Yeah, thank you to Emily for the presentation and for all the Fila Viva representatives for the labor that you've put into this. My question is to Eduardo. In the past, in the last meeting, you said that you'd go back to renegotiate with the admin, and I just wanted to know the update on that. Did you want to answer that, Eduardo? Uh, yeah, I got mo uh, there's still a little part that the admin hasn't answered me back on, uh, but for the four main things. Well, let me find the page in my notes and I'll stick them down. Okay, so for the first thing that we talked about on the last time was that the opt-out button would be in the finance center, uh, the finance all account center section. Uh, the admin says that that's no longer possible with the new way Moodle exists. Uh, not Moodle, sorry, the student center exists now. They outsource that to a third party. So the button is going to have to be on the actual student center page. So it's going to be right next to the button that says basically like pay tuition is going to be there. It's going to be that button there. Um, the other thing that the admin said is that the legal agreements. So I remember in our thing, we said that there has to be 30 legal agreements, one for each, well, not 30 legal agreements, uh, one legal agreement for each group. And there's 23 groups. Uh, the admin said that that is possible, though they would not like to do that because uh, they're not, it would not make the system uh, compatible with their mobile devices. So they're not willing to do that, but they are, they did say it was possible. The other thing though, is that they also backtracked a bit before they said that they would write the legal agreement. Now they said that they don't want to be involved in that part because they think that this is a thing between the CSU and the fee levy groups. So they stated that we would have to write all the legal agreements for all the groups. So I would go and, well, that's not, now we just basically have to go with every group and write a legal agreement ourselves. Um, the last thing is the, the links on the pages. So the links on the pages, the groups, like I, I spoke to them, I believe Councillor Hirsch brought up that we could route them all through uh, the Concordia, the Concordia domain, but they are adamant that it doesn't matter that even if you could out route it through the Concordia domain, they do not want to be going to an external site because they say that no matter what happens is they don't want to be liable for anything on an external site. Uh, not saying that any of the FILA sites are virus infested or anything, but the school has a policy. They're saying we're not going to go there. So basically when it comes to renegotiating with the admin, I would say out of the four things, they're willing to give us one of them. Yeah, they're basically willing to give us one of them. Uh, regretfully, they're willing to give us one of them because they don't want to. But the other three uh, things are still not confirmed as per our recommendations. Thank you. Uh, was that all, Shabani? Yeah, that was all. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. All right, well, I'll start off by, observe, by uh, observing that the fact that the university has refused to give in to us on demand number four, which is that we give a list of people who opted out, and the university said, no, we're only going to give a list of people who opted in, uh, is a good thing and makes a lot of sense in terms of student concern of potential retribution or whatnot. Some people have, um, some people are mildly paranoid, and that's okay. Um, now, I actually have a few questions for Emily. 
over the summer, um, there was, well, I tried opting out out of almost all the groups. Uh, four of them did not, I got no response from, uh, but one of them stuck out in particular where I did get a response, which was Lorgan. Uh, I got a response saying, yeah, we got your request. We're going to process it. Then about a little under a month later, I got a, another response going, yeah, never mind. We decided to just completely renegade on all of our commitments. Um, and then a little afterwards, Eduardo went to speak to them and they uh, sent another email saying, yeah, actually, we will give you your opt out. So my question is, you mentioned that <coughs> there is a requirement uh, or that you have steps in place to ensure that the opt outs are actually processed. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. So I can't speak on behalf of different organizations that aren't present. Like I don't work with uh, or for Lorgan, but um, but I have had meetings with them and I, I understand that everything they do is with the best of intention. But I think, so, I mean, to be clear, fee levy groups, part of the fee levy system is that fee levy groups legally have to provide opt outs for students and no one's trying to get away around that. Like every fee levy group, when we register with the Dean of Students, when we collect our fees, um, when we go to referendum, all of this is with the understanding that any student can come to us and ask for their money back. And that's absolutely acceptable. And we will, I, I will defend anyone's right to do that. Like that's, the goal is not to avoid that at all. I think there were some issues in the summer um, because things went online so quickly. Um, a lot of groups have never had to do um, their own online banking before. For example, like Lorgan is a very small arts magazine. Their, their fee levy is like three or four cents a credit. Um, and that's not a lot of, money to work with in terms of having a staff that, or a finance coordinator, this kind of thing. A lot of groups um, were still operating by check, which was difficult. Um, obviously you can't send checks for $3 here or there. So um, the summer was really a, a trial period in terms of um, groups came to each other and tried to support each other and groups that had more capacity to do online banking um, helped out groups that weren't yet set up to do that. So I think Lorgan was kind of dropped into the middle of that. Um, they had less capacity over the summer to begin with. Um, so it wasn't a matter of them trying to avoid payments. It was just a, a miscommunication and in terms of needing more support to make that happen. So um, this time we just had that communication up and running faster. Um, we had a lot of conversations with different groups. I'm saying we, like me and Abdullah, who really ran the form aspect of it um, to make sure that everyone had the online banking uh, technology that they needed. And so moving forward, if this system can be implemented permanently, um, we've got ideas in place to have a more central banking system where instead of many, many different transactions, we'd have like a few simple transactions um, so that all of the behind the scenes stuff about accountability doesn't have to impact whether or not students get their money because students should get their money back and they will. Um, Does that answer your question? question. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's my understanding that uh, Concordia community, um, which I'm assuming is who you, the umbrella you're speaking on behalf of, um, Okay, that is the correct assumption. Good. So I'm assuming that you're speaking on behalf of them. And it's uh, my understanding that they are not a um, legal corporation and do not actually have enforcement power over the various uh, fee levy groups. Is that correct? I mean, we're, we're a coalition. Like we, we have enforcement power over each other the same way that counselors have enforcement power over each other. Like we work together towards common goals. So we, um, but we are, we have had a lot of conversations about accountability processes, um, how to work with groups that are less than, less responsive than, than is ideal. Um, I mean, in the end, it is the Dean of Students Office that can hold groups accountable because uh, they're the ones that um, we sign contracts with. Like, fee levy groups are nonprofits um, that operate under the laws that govern nonprofit organizations. Uh, and we have to sign agreements with the Dean of Students Office. Um, to to allow us to have that relationship with the school like there's legal uh, binding stuff there so um it's true that fee levy groups don't have a legal mechanism to hold each other accountable but we are a tight-knit community um and my goal isn't to to hold groups accountable it's to create a system where we can support each other um so that we can solve problems instead of punishing groups for not having access to the online banking for example. Uh, the, the the question isn't about punishment it's about the fact that uh, several groups, um, I've heard, I wasn't the only one I've heard from others that, for example, the Concordian has not responded to any emails over the summer. Uh, my question is, they don't respond, now what? Uh, I mean, with, now, I could go to the Dean of uh, Students and 
they will give me um, a roundabout. Uh, they'll basically, they will go out of their way, way to basically say, make it not our problem. Uh, that's just the way the Dana students work. They are, um, I mean, they are, do have an active interest in having the least amount of work possible. Uh, so from my experiences with them, if they're not the ones running the online opt-out, they are certainly not the ones keeping people accountable for it. So when a group doesn't uh, respond to their emails, what now? Well, I mean, like uh, I said, sorry. Oh, yeah, Kate, go ahead. Would, you, would it be possible for me to answer that? Because I think I know the answer slightly better than Emily. Go for um, it. I, I don't, I don't want to be rude, but I just had this conversation yesterday with Andrew, actually. Uh, so Hirsch, what will happen in that case is because I spoke to Andrew and the Dean of Students Austin specifically about that. And what he stated was, uh, we as the CSU, as representative of those students, bring up those concerns when a fee levy group, uh, let's say for lack of better words, delinquent on something. Uh, and it's not simply like missing an email, but let's say they don't file their opt-outs. Uh, so we go up to them and we're gonna say, X group was not responding. They're not, we don't believe they're fulfilling their duties. And then the talk comes between us and the Dean of Students office. It's not for, uh, it's not for let's say sustainable Concordia to go rat on the Concordian or for the Concordian to go tell like the Dean of Students office. It's really for the Concordia Student Union to take up that role on behalf of the students. So whenever something does happen like that, that's how like we, we operate. So I would go to Andrew and address the answer to us, and then we move forward with whatever process is possible. So I know we spoke about specifically your thing of people not answering emails, and we were like, what happens if someone doesn't answer emails? And uh, what we spoke about is like, okay, like the first, like let's say they get one time where they're not answering emails. Uh, second time we send them another email like to du double check, like it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't like a spam folder. Uh, we do try and search for them. But if eventually we don't get contact with them or if eventually the, they prove that they're not actually uh, functioning or anything, then we could take some extra steps to the to its office has like explained to me and I'm not gonna go through all the procedure of all the different uh, repercussion measures right now, but there are different steps to take, but it really has to come from us as the Concordia Student Union and not like an individual student complaining directly to them. All right, thank you. Uh, Harrison, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank you guys, actually, because the feedback that I've received from this system, I know that my colleague um, Hirsch was talking a lot about the summer system, but what we're talking about right now in this moment is the system that we had in the fall. And um, I will tell you that the feedback that I received um, from that system was was incredible, much better than, uh, than the feedback that I received from the summer semester. So um, overall, I think it was a very good system. It was streamlined. It was seamless. And um, so I just want to thank you guys for, you know, putting in the work, taking the feedback that was given and, um, and coming up with, I think, um, is, is a great system in a really short period of time. And you guys did a fantastic job. Um, when it comes to, like you mentioned, continuing uh, with this in the future, I think there's definitely a possibility for it. I think that things that originate from the students and student groups are often better and prove to be better. Um, and uh, that being said, I think there's also room to maybe negotiate with the administration in terms of somehow putting the link on, um, you know, on my Concordia. There's many things we can, we can discuss about, but uh, that's basically all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, James, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. All right, so <clears throat> just to get going, uh, I'm actually quite uh, happy with the work that's been done. Like, especially it's a massive improvement over the absolute chaos that was the summer. Um, like, it's kind of very unified page. It gets most of the, uh, oh, I should have started with a motion. Sorry. Yeah, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm gonna tell the next person to do a motion. Um, <laughs> I should have started with a motion, my bad. Um, 
but uh but yeah no like a lot of the concerns that i had like my my position has always been you know like i want an online opt-out system that works uh i don't care if it comes from the admin or from the student groups i just want one that's streamlined it works as everything in the, in the same spot and that you don't have like this this mishmash of some groups uh, are doing it some groups aren't doing it or some groups are doing it badly etc 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 which is what was happening in the summer uh when we voted to send uh, and mandated the administration do it because it was such a um such a mess uh but i'm happy to see that a lot of those problems have been corrected um you know especially uh having gone through the system uh, I, I'm enjoying it's, uh, you know, the fact that everything's kind of in one place. Everything's very simple. Uh, you get the list of people that opted out because obviously in, in, in most, if not all the student groups, uh, I think all the student groups, if you don't, uh, pay, you don't get to vote. So it's a very important detail of information that they need. Uh, it's streamlined. It's, it's simple. People get their money back, uh, like in one lump sum payment, but honestly, I don't think people care all that much if it's in one lump sum or if it's in like a bajillion different payments uh you know at the end of the day they just they just want the sum of of uh, of the opt out back and don't really care if it's like two groups together or like 10 or or just one uh so yeah like ultimately i think it's uh you know congratulations to you uh i'd like to encourage the next person that speaks uh you know but there is a proviso right i want like i you know there's some legitimate worries about um keeping the system in future years so that like the community doesn't just stop using it and revert back to the old system. So I'd like to approve this with the proviso that the CSU uh, basically draws up a binding agreement with the Concordia community, uh, like a binding legal agreement that, that this type of online system will continue to be used in the future. There's always different types of like workarounds that we can do, like for example, putting links in more visible places, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, good job, guys. You you did well, and uh, you know, get a thumbs up from me. All right, thank you, uh, Matthew. Go ahead. I first want to agree with Harrison on the that there should be a button on the uh, Mike and Cordia, but but I, and I would like to encourage Eduardo to keep fighting for that. But besides that, my I want to first of oh wait, I forgot to do the motion that James wanted. <laughs> Can we just do that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So James, what do you want your motion to be? So the motion was to uh, approve using the uh, the current system that exists with the proviso that the CSU drafts up a legal agreement with the Concordia community to basically ensure to institutionalize the, the system. So whatever James just said, that's my motion. <laughs> so I have be resolved that the current, I presume that's opt out system and can i add one thing to it continue yeah to exist and then uh there was just one more be it further resolved that a legal agreement be drawn up with the concordia community to institutionalize the system and yeah go ahead matthew so i just want to add also that in the event that uh, hirsch's worry comes up where a group decides they just don't want to pay there be a that the executives come up with a a system to take their uh, to take their fee off the next semester until they pay the the opt-outs that were requested so like uh, sorry, this, what was the last part? The, that they remove the fee until the opt-outs are paid. Just so you pay it or there's consequences. Um, not remove. Um, yeah. Because the CSU like cannot require a, oh. Yeah, the CSU can't do that. That that yeah. that's has a s oh. several problems. Then, that's then an admin this, thing. Uh, then we okay, ask so. the, uh, the executives to find a solution to this. So just council requests the uh, the executives to work on this issue. It gives me mandated to find a solution when... Point of, point of information, yeah. though, quickly. Um, this is not an email system, though. This is a uh, integrated kind of more of a, a Google Drive system. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, here, let me just show you what I have. Uh, oops, not preamble. Be resolved that the current opt-out system continue to exist. Be resolved that illegal, or be it further resolved that a legal agreement be drawn up with the Concordia community to institutionalize system. Be it further resolved that the executives be mandated to find a solution when the levy groups. What was it when they? When they? When when they don't do the 
allow opt out. Yeah, the opt outs when when I don't participate in opt outs or, or fail to pay back opt outs. Perhaps fail to uphold their obligations regarding opt outs. Uh, online opt outs. Uh, okay, uh, do we have a second for this motion? Anyone? I mean, would I be the second? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you're the second and um, Matthew, your motivation? I think it's a good system. I just think that we need to fill some of the holes in it where it's just like, where it make sure it's obligatory. So I, I want the system to continue, but I also want there to be a standardized way of doing things. All right, thank you. Um, let me just stop screen sharing for a sec. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. I'll start off by noting that I do believe um, that this motion is a violation of our bylaws that is, uh, and a violation of the, um, what do you call it? The referendum question that was passed by our members. Although from past experience, I know that that particular um, conversation isn't gonna go very far. So I guess I'll jump into the um, technical uh, based uh, details. On what? Based, based mm -hmm. on what? Like you're saying it's a violation based of the bylaws. On, based on the bylaw, which requires that we conform with our uh, referendum questions and ignoring the preamble, the actual question was, do we support having the online opt-out system to be implemented by the administration in my Concordia? Uh, so that is a kind of important technicality. But you know what, I, from past experience, I know that that particular line of questioning isn't gonna go particularly far with the current crowd. So let's jump into the other question, um, which is the requirement of, op of uploading a screenshot of one's- uh, um, Point of information? Point of personal privilege. Uh, yeah, go ahead. The referendum question did not say my concord. Do you? I, I was just trying to find it. I don't think it did. Yeah, yeah that, 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 was my, that was my point of information. I want to bring up the referendum question to see if there's well, a problem. I'll use, I'll, well, I'll use um, the, to tell you guys, it was, do you support Concordia University bringing online opt-out? It wasn't as specific as my Concordia. And then the question is, is the CSU technically part of Concordia University? So I don't um, think that legally, it Legally, no. Yeah, legally, no, we're a separate entity. <laughs> I don't no, no, no. But the prince, like the, the that that's multiple interpretations of that. Like, if you really want to go that route, uh, you, like that that's several, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of lawyers' fees. If you really like, if you really, really want, you know, to to make the university do it instead of a you know a working system that exists. Um, the fact that like, it, it means the Concord University, the CSU, it, it, the people get the point they, that they want online opt-out at Concordia, you know, like there's no legal distinction between the entities. Like it, like it's a very reasonable interpretation to interpret that as the Concordia community, like the Concordia University environment. Which the yeah, I don't think really we need to go too far down this rabbit hole, but- mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, can I get back to the question? Yeah, go actually ahead, go ahead. No, because like the previous point was just like, uh, I'd like it noted that I do believe that to be a issue. But the actual question that I want to get at is about the requirement to upload a copy of one's schedule, um, which courses one's taking to the system uh, for both undergraduate and graduate students. Now, graduate students are charged on a per semester rather than per credit basis, as um, thesis students are, are towards the end of their thesis not actually enrolled in any courses. So my question is about that particular um, aspect for the graduate students, which is what happens to the graduate students who don't have any courses that they're taking? Point to personal privilege. Yeah, go ahead, Isaiah. I believe that if I'm not mistaken, like this opt out mm -hmm. is for the undergraduate population because of our jurisdiction. I can, I can answer that actually. The, yeah, well, ahead. I mean, graduate students can opt out um, and graduate students did participate in this opt out period. Uh, and because of the change in the way that their uh, classes are structured, there is a set fee for graduate students that doesn't happen per credit. Like we first in Concordia, I think it's 25 cents 
for no matter how many classes or not classes graduate students are taking. It's just a flat amount of money. All right, thank you for clarifying. Right. So my question was about the requirement to upload a picture of their schedule. If you're not if you're not taking any classes, what like what exactly is being uploaded? I mean, the the question is, can do thesis students get somehow m messed over with the current system? No, I mean it's I mean it, like then in that case, what needs to be uploaded is just proof that you're registered at Concordia. Oh. All right, thank you, um, Arya. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have three questions. First, I would like to know if, for example, for winter, CSU is going to send an email to all the students, giving them the link so they can opt out or not. Um, Emily? So you meant from the, the CSU, you wondering if the CSU would send a link? Yeah, because it has not been sent this time, so how are the students supposed to know it? Because yes, they have to have a friend to send them. It's not very transparent. That's why yeah, I, have yeah, I mean, we have, oh, sorry, sorry can I respond? Real quick. Yeah, of course, but I just go ahead, but I will just want to continue on that so you don't have to respond twice. Uh, I do agree with what he said. I don't know who just spoke, but um, I didn't, like, I keep checking my emails now. I keep checking on Facebook, whatnot. I can't find anywhere where that Google Doc, Google Doc must have been. And I could have saved like twenty dollars and during COVID, like that's a lot of money. And I just feel like the link wasn't out there enough. And uh, maybe other students have no idea this exists. And I'm sitting here, and of course, because of the confusion this summer, I got confused myself. But then, yeah, just to go on to his question, where was I able to access this link, and how was I supposed to know as a student this was out there? Like just, I just, just make it, make, uh, wait for your turn on the speakers list next time, please. Um, but Emily, could you answer both questions? Yeah, for sure. So, so um, newsletter is a logic place where it has to be. I mean, this is, yeah, this is kind of a separate conversation from the system itself, but I mean, discussion of how students find out about the opt-out process or about field groups in general has been an ongoing thing. Like we, we're hoping that students will um, have more chances to learn about the work that we do as well because just outside of financial stuff there's like the Concordia Food Coalition has been sending free food baskets to students during the pandemic to help them feed themselves. So there are, aside from just like the, the amount of money that students can get back from opting out of fee levies, there's also resources that we can give students to make their lives easier in this time. Um, no, and that's that's the dream. No, I know and I'm, I'm, I'm continuing that I um, I mean, um, we have a, a website at concordiacommunity.org that always has information about, uh, has a page about the opt-out period that's always updating um, whenever there's accurate information and updated information about the next opt-out period. Um, we have a Facebook page as well, which is the Concordia Community Facebook page where you can find that information. Um, each group will have information about the opt-out period on their website uh, as well when, that, when that's finalized. Um, I mean, we can have conversations with the CSU um, that's been a long time conversation is like how to best uh, educate students. But the, the thing is we want to educate students in the context of what our groups do as a whole, not just what money they could get back from us by not supporting us. So it's a long complicated, but so yes, we're, we're definitely open to new kinds of... I don't understand, what the, I don't understand the relation. I mean, when they go to, the, to the, this website, you know, they, they can opt out and they have the information on every group. So I agree with you, but they have that, that's what I said in the last meeting, like they have, the, the, the ideal situation is that students would uh, have information about the different group before the, the opt-out period. That's, of course, I agree with that, but it has nothing to do with the fact that, okay, this is the opt-out period, so why can't SSU send a link in a, the most transparent way to students so they know that this is the period where they can opt out? And, and if they want, they can, in, in the, the in the, same, in, the, in the email, they can send all the information they want about the, the of every um, Philippi group. That, that's not the problem. But I, what I don't like is the, the lack of transparency. Like, why hide the, the, the information? You understand what I mean? Sorry, yeah. Phelan, I, can I answer that real quick? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. And then we can uh, move on. Yeah. So the ter in terms of advertising it, because that's one of the issues, Aria, is that the previous year's general coroner, Christopher Kalafatidis, agreed to certain conditions. And one of the conditions he agreed to in the report that, that 
council approved on the first day of semester, our first mandate ever was that we would not advertise it. So we are limited in terms of how we could advertise the opt-out period due to what Christopher Kalftidis ag agreed to and what um, and what council approved basically. So we could talk about how we could try and get the word out, but we can't blatantly advertise this system. Did you say that Christopher agreed to not advertise it? Yes, Christopher agreed to not advertise it. It's in the, it's 0. 0.6, I believe, or 0. 0.5. You know what was the reason? I do not know. I was not part of those conversations. All right, thank you. Um, no, me. I have two more questions. There, well, there. at this point, we have to move on just because there's uh, there's other people on the speakers list, so I can put you back on it, though. Um, yeah. you, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, oh, I can put you back on the speakers list. It's just um, you you've had like a lot of time so far, so I just have to move on to others to to be fair. But I can put you on back on the speakers list. Okay. Uh, James, go ahead. Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, hello. Um, so, yeah. how would the uh, room be amenable then to a uh, a motion at, uh, to like increase the like advertisement or whatever, so that students know that opt out period is like happening? I mean, I don't know. I mean, seven thousand people used it, so like obviously some people know that what's going on. But like, is is that document still like binding in that way? Do we need to do that? Eduardo, it, is, you it is kind of binding. Uh, I'm sure that honestly, like maybe I'm wrong, but I think I've built up a good rapport with Emily on how we've been working. Uh, I'm sure that we could come to some sort of agreement over okay. us maybe putting up the link somewhere. Okay. Um, but yeah, right. that's a conversation I think we should have out of council and then. Okay. All, all right. Then, uh, then uh, basically let's just approve it. And then like you can come back to council with that proposal. All right, thank you. Um, Eduardo, go ahead. Oh, it was literally to answer the questions I was answering just now. Oh, okay, that's good. Uh, Desiree, go ahead. I wanted to speak in favor of the report essentially and I'd like to call the question. All right, um, do we have a second for calling the question? Second, second please. Second by Shivani. Is there any opposition to calling the question? Yes, I, I, had, I, want, I had a question. Okay. Um, well, there, there's still people on the speakers list. That's the thing. So we're just kind of cutting the speakers list. So um, in that case, we'll move to a vote on calling the question. Um, so I'll just go quick, quick. So if you vote yes, it means you want to call the question. If you vote no, it means you do not. And if you abstain, it means you abstain. Uh, Diana, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Harrison? Yes. Thank you. Chelsea? Yes. Thank you. Howard? Uh, sorry, I came in a bit late. What exactly are we voting on? Oh, just to call the question on whether we want to vote. Oh, no, I mean, I know. Call the question on voting on what exactly? On um, the, the motion on the table is, um, a, if you scroll here, I'll just be posted in the, the chat. Okay. Uh, yes, I would okay. like us to vote on this. Thank you. Uh, Jeremiah? Yes. Thank you. Lauren? Yes. Thank you. Zachary? Yes. Thank you. Arie? No. Thank you. Sarah? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Shivani? Yes. Thank you. Yasmin? No. No. Thank you. Uh, Marlena? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Matthew. Abstain. Thank you. Um, Roman's not here. Sean. I think you, you skipped Chris. Oh, I did. Sorry, Chris. How do you vote? Uh, I vote yes. Thank you. Um, Sean, how do you vote? Not here. Anais, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. James. James. Go back to you. Uh, Desiree, how do you vote? Yeah. Yes, and Hirsch. No. No. All right. Uh, James, you there? <laughs> okay. If not, um, we'll call the vote. So that's 13 yes, three no, and one abstention. So the calling the question carries. Um, so we will now move to a vote on the uh, motion that is currently in the group. Uh, so if there's nothing further, 
we will start voting on that. So if you're voting yes, it means you're voting in favor of it. If you're voting no, it means you are not. And if you're abstaining, it means you are abstaining. Uh, Diana, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Harrison, how do you vote? Yes, and noted, please. Thank you. Um, Chelsea, how do you vote? Uh, can you come back to me, please? Sure. Uh, Howard. Um, can you come back to me, please, uh, too, please? Sure. Uh, Jeremiah? We're voting on the motion now, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with the motion. All right. Thank you. Uh, Lauren? Yes, and noted, please. Thank you. Zachary? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Arie? I abstain, and you can note me. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Uh, yes. Yes, Margot's on here. Shivani? Yes. Yes, Yasmin? No, I abstain. Abstain, Marlena? Yeah. Yes, Chris? Uh, yes, and noted, please. Yes, and noted, Matthew? Yes. Yes, uh, Sean? It's not here, and yes. Yes. Yes, James? Uh, to confirm this is for the motion? Yes. 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 Uh, Desiree? Yes. Yes. Hirsch? No, and I would like to have that noted in the minute. All right. No and noted. Uh, Chelsea, how do you vote? Oh, yes. Yes. Howard? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so by a tally of 15 yes, one no, and two abstention, the motion carries. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention, Emily? No, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'll be back after. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Um, so if there's nothing further, we can move on to CJLO referendum question. And Eduardo, this one is yours. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, just a, I guess, more of a simple technicality. Uh, CJLO submitted documents to have their fee levy increased as per our, bio, our standing regulations. Uh, they did reach all the criteria of the regulations on what they needed to provide. It was all in order. Um, since it's all in order, we as the, our minutes have been pulled uh, by Hirsch, but everything was in order. So we, in the meeting, we had passed them, we approved them for referendum saying that they had everything good. Now it just comes to the council to send that over. I believe that uh, perhaps one of the CGLO members, Patrice, said he would say a few words about it. But other than that, this is really, it should be just a technicality. Uh, they've gotten all their paperwork right. Uh, it should be up to the students to decide if they agree or disagree with CGLO's proposal at this point. So yeah, if Patrice wants to say a few words, if he's not here, then I guess just discussion. Um, well, I'm here. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, nice uh, meeting uh, CHP Council. It's been uh, it's been a couple of years that uh, I haven't been attending a a CSU Council meeting. I've been involved with the CSU about uh, 18, 19 years ago. So it's good to see that it's still. Uh, it's still working and doing fine. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here tonight uh, in my capacity as a board member of uh, basically of CJLO. I'm a, I'm a faculty representative. Um, I'm also a graduate student at uh, Concordia. I'm pursuing an MBA. Um, if, uh, you know, in case you people wonder uh, why is a fee levy groups having professors uh, basically around or a different composition. CJLO is a bit of a different structure because, because we're radio stations and we broadcast on the public airwaves. We have to abide by rules of the uh, federal government and the basically the CRTC. So our board is a composition of uh, students, faculty, volunteers, and community at large to represent our campus community station. Um, so, and if um, I mean, some some of you might also have been in my classroom. I teach in political science and in the John Molson School of Business, the uh, the law courses as well. Um, so, uh, basically, CJLO is uh, is here 
uh, to request an increase to a fee levy. The last time we came to the CSU was about nine years ago, and our fee levy is not indexed to the CPI. So it means that we lost inflation uh, year after year, whereas the dynamic, uh, you know, the, the, the dynamism of the station has increased basically years after years uh, and the projects. So we are looking at uh, many new projects that we would like basically to fund and to invest with and that uh, we're obviously hoping to get the student support, which is why we are proposing this um, basically this fee levy increase, which is going to cover obviously many new projects that we have, not only the whole inflation thing. And then obviously if uh, there's anything um, that, uh, any questions that you guys have, I'm going to be happy to uh, answer them. And I know that I have some of my colleagues from CGLO who are also here present that, uh, that can answer questions as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. All right, so I'll start off by noting that there are various mechanisms by which uh, fee levy corporations are held accountable to the students that pay into them. Um, although Chris's favorite one was referendum, there are there is supposed to be other means as well, uh, noted, most notably participating in the AGM, which is the annual general meeting uh, in which under normal circumstances, anyone who wants, if you're a paying member, you roll in and you can vote one vote per person, as makes sense. Now, reading CGLO's bylaws, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you do not allow random students to roll in and vote, even if they are paying members. Question to any member of CGLO. So is this, um, you want me to answer this one right away, or are there other questions that I should be answering as well? Uh, I don't this one right away. This is chair. You can let me know, but I'm I'm happy to answer this one. Uh, this is a uh, this is a major misconception. In fact, it's it's came around uh, many times, you know, in the years because those uh, those bylaws were, in fact, ironically, uh, when I was the CSU president in 2001 2002, uh, and we helped CGLO to become an independent fee levy group. We work with the CSU lawyer to came up with the bylaws of CJLO. And uh, because CJLO, first of all, it's a federal corporation, so it's different than a provincial corporation, so it follows different rules. And one of the requirements that you have under federal law is that you need to have a list of members, which became obviously problematic with the situation that uh, you're proposing where anybody can just walk in and vote, which is obviously what we had originally intended as well um, you know, to, you know, you know, to be happening. So we looked at the various possibilities with the university and as well with the CSU. And then we came into some basically basic problems with privacy legislation and the fact that we don't have individual student consent to basically get a list in order to verify them. So uh, what we did is with the lawyers at the time, um, see I was not a lawyer at the time, I became one since, is we looked at the solution and we came up with the wording in our bylaws that we have, which is that if you read it, basically uh, any student can apply and basically become a member. It's a formality. All that they have to do is to basically, uh, you know, have student status and uh, we facilitated the process as much as possible in order that there's a simple form that people have to fill in. And basically it's been ratified. I can tell you that I've been on this board now in various capacities for many years. We've basically never refused anyone. The only reason that we would refuse somebody would be in theory if someone would have opted out of the fee either in person previously or now in person, and then would like to basically be a member because that wouldn't make any sense, but that has never happened either. But uh, otherwise it's been just a uh, basically very, uh, you know, easy ratification process and uh, nobody has ever complained about it in the past. And that's the best, I guess, uh, corporate solution in order to comply with the Canada Not-for-Profit Act that, uh, basically, uh, you know, that, that, that's that been found. Thank you. Uh, Hirsch, did you have another question? Can the board 
refuse a application of membership uh, for a paying member, a paying student, not member. Uh, Patrice, did you want to answer? Can the board uh, refuse? I mean, I guess if you want to, uh, you know, ask me uh, in theory, uh, yes. I mean, I'll give you a, maybe I'll give you a parallel from my uh, being a teacher in political science. Can the governor general refuse to sign a law? In theory, yes. Tell me the last time it has happened since uh, 1848. So yes, in theory and practice never happened and never will. Thank you. Um, Harrison, go ahead. I rescind. Thank you. Uh, Anais, go ahead. Uh, so I move that the CAGLO uh, referendum question be on the ballot this semester. All right, thank you. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Harrison. Um, so if there's nothing further on the speakers list, we can move directly to a vote. Um, so is there any opposition to putting the CJLO question on the ballot for referendum? Opposition going once? Yes. Oh, okay. In that case, we will do our vote count. Um, so in that case, I will go by roll call since it's not unanimous. Um, so if you're voting yes, it means you want the CJLO question on the ballot. If you're voting no, it means you do not. And if you are abstaining, it means you are abstaining. Uh, Diana, go ahead. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, Harrison. Yes. Yes. Chelsea. Yes. Yes. Howard. In terms of voting, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I would like just to vote now. Thank you. Oh, no, no, sorry. Not, not for voting. We are voting whether or not to put the question on the ballot. So it's a yes, no, or an abstain. Oh, oh, can you get back to me, please? Okay, never mind. I misinterpreted the question. Hold on. I just passed me. I'll go back to me after. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Come back to you, Lauren. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Zachary. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ari. Come to me, please. Sure. Uh, Sarah. Uh, can you come back to me, please? Sure. Uh, Margo uh, is not here. Uh, Shivani. Yes. Yes. Uh, Yasmin. Yasmin? Yeah, sorry, I'm here. Uh, can you just re like, I don't mind if you just re recall what are we voting on, please? Yeah, so it's whether or not um, we want to send the uh, CJLO referendum question to referendum. Um, so the uh, referendum question in a nutshell is um, whether or not to uh, increase the fee levy due to uh, from 0 0.34 cents per credit to 0 0.43 cent, uh, 0 0.34 dollars per credit to 0 0.43 dollars per credit. So it's, it's just whether or not um, we want to send that to referendum. So how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Uh, Marlena? Yes. Yes. Chris? Chris? Pass. Matthew? No. No. Um, Sean? Here, Anais? Uh, yes, as this will allow students to choose if they want this increase. Thank you. Uh, James? Uh, Yes. Thank you. Uh, Desiree. Yes. Yes. Hirsch. No. No. And then I have some um, people who passed. Howard, how do you vote? Mm. Can you go back to me again, please? I'm just uh, going to think it over a bit. Sure. Jeremiah? I'm going to abstain. Abstain. Arie? Abstain. Abstain. Sarah? Yes. Yes. Chris? Might not be here. Chris? Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Just um, going to vote yes then. Sure. And Howard? No, I'll abstain, actually. Abstain. All right. So, a vote now. Um, oh. can, I, uh, can I switch to a yes? Sure. So, you were in abstain. Um, so the final tally is 
14 yes, two no, and two abstentions. Um, so the motion carries, and this will go to referendum at the by-election. Uh, was there anything else, Eduardo or Patis, you wanted to say? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I'd like to thank the council for uh, obviously the, the approval of that referendum question. We, uh, we obviously look forward uh, as being, uh, you know, CGLO to continue to provide uh, an important service for, for students. I, I can say on a, on a personal level, when I was at the, you know, at the CSU, the CGLO was a club under the CSU back in 2001 and was receiving a $12,000 budget. Now it's a, an independent fee levy group that has grown and that has, uh, you know, is broadcasting on the public airwaves and it's giving lots of opportunities for obviously for students. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy for obviously the, you know, the support and, and we'll let the students decide. Um, a little bit is that obviously we were coming forward tonight to talk about this and uh, perhaps it came to our attention. So obviously I, I just need to mention it that uh, there was a certainly a, a counselor, the one who actually asked me lots of questions about the bylaws, which I hope that I answered to his satisfaction, but uh, that, uh, you know, is actual is actually going around to defund uh, the CGLO and the link as well for that matter, because of, uh, you know, I guess a mise en demeure that we sent to the former administration. So I would like to say that this was only done to uh, respect what we really felt at the time was a right. And we found that the current CSU was very collaborative. There's no issues, there's gonna be no lawsuit. And in fact, we're working very, very collaboratively with the current CSU. And I think this is known, but just to put it formally on the record, I wanted to state that as well. So uh, don't worry about that. And uh, I wish you all a good night. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, so if there is nothing further on this question, then we can move on to 5D, which is mental health service referendum question. And Eduardo, you had a presentation for this? Uh, I, I did at a point, but it somehow seems to misplaced it. Uh, and you incredibly. Talk. Yeah. So uh, basically, I'm just going to speak to it. Sure. Um, I really don't know where it went. Uh, okay, so uh, during COVID started, right? And uh, well, actually the story begins even before COVID. Last year, we were thinking as the CSU executives that mental health was a very big priority. Uh, this was primarily done by, uh, was chaired by Marin, who at the time wanted to do a lot of initiatives for mental health on campus. Uh, it did not end up panning out the last year. Uh, but one of the ideas that we tossed about was about a service dedicated to mental health. Uh, this never went anywhere, but the research I did last year was always kind of in the back of my mind. And this year, obviously, COVID happened and we started moving forward with that. And uh, it became apparent the limitations and the lack of mental health support we give students uh, at Concordia University. The, for those of you who don't know, Concordia University offers 10 free uh, counseling sessions. Uh, they offer Zen Dens, which are little locations where you are to unwind. Uh, naturally, with COVID, the counseling sessions became phone calls instead of real counseling sessions. Uh, and the Zen Dens are inaccessible. Uh, there's no real other well-known service they provide for mental health. Uh, and then amongst the executives and talking to the faculty associations, uh, it's things that they were all doing. So I know some faculty associations were holding workshops. Uh, FASA and CASA are both holding workshops for mental health of their students, uh, as well as many other uh, things that people are doing. But the issue with that and that we even at CSU realize is that they're not consistent and it's not something that students could turn to all the time for help. If there is no uh, workshop, there is nothing for the students in this time. Furthermore, continuing on that line is it, that it falls a lot on executives who may not be experts on these workshops or may not be excellent at organizing them. So one year might have a lot of workshops and next year might have no workshops. And uh, it really sparked a lot more, uh, a lot of questions. So if you looked in the documents that they sent, 
you will see that there is a CSU uh, annual survey report where it speaks about mental health. Uh, that's from 2019. There is no annual survey from last year because the, ad the academic and advocacy coordinator last year never completed uh, his duty with it. So we don't have any data from last year. Uh, and it basically says the survey, like nothing that we don't expect. It says that students are suffering from mental health, uh, where uh, then there's also the drug and alcohol thing that this uh, drug and alcohol report that the CSU did in 2019. This one here just says that the basically summarizing it, it's a pretty good report. It basically says that the rates for alcoholism and drug use at Concordia is higher than average. Uh, one of the reasons people turn to this is when they're in mental distress and they cannot do their, they can't do what they're doing as well. Uh, so they turn to these sources, these sources for relief. Uh, then there's also a bunch of academic articles I sent out. Uh, those are just academic articles that people could read. Uh, they span from a variety of topics from what a university should do for the mental health of its students to how mental health of the students have uh, decreased over time because school is getting tougher, more competitive and the mental health of the students is uh, suffering as a result of it. And uh, it's predicted only at worse, according to the reports. Uh, there's a few more just showing all the various things I've consulted regarding this. Uh, and in the end, we were thinking maybe this mental health service is something that we should seriously look at. So I re spoke to all the faculty associations more formally with my colleague Victoria. Uh, and we just spoke about it very nothing concrete. We we're just like, is this something that you think the Concordia Student Union should support for its students and should offer? Uh, like we offer advocacy, like we offer LIC, like we offer Hojo and even the daycare, should we offer mental health support service? And uh, to varying degrees, all the faculty associations agreed and said yes. They said that uh, it is something they want to look at. So now, what is the process for this moving forward? is basically what came to us next. So the process for this is the first question is, is this something that students are interested in? It means nothing if I want it, it means nothing if some faculty associations want it, but it does mean something if all the students want it. So the first part is what we're all dealing with here is a referendum question saying, hello everyone, does, is this something you want us to investigate further and see if it's something we can create? Uh, following up from then, and this is the way I personally am planning to go about it, is I am going to call back all the faculty associations. We're gonna send out surveys of what you would like to see in this service. Is this service something, this is pending of an affirmative response from the student body, but we'd send back surveys, we'd say, what are certain uh, services you would wanna see from our service that we'd offer you? Do you want therapy? Do you want counseling? Do you want meditation? Do you want uh, wellness, do you want mindfulness, do you want uh, drug and rehab, do you want all these different services that we could offer, the list goes on and on, um, and do you offer, and to varying degrees with students are going to answer yes, no, not really, I don't think applicable, I think applicable, and we're going to take all that data in, and then we're going to start associating a cost to each thing that the students want. So with all the faculty associations, and we're going to look at it, we're going to say, okay, if we want a service as has been described through the surveys and the student responses, it will cost X amount per fee levy. We might look at that and say, that's a little high. Maybe we have to scale it back. We could look at it and say, that's actually a little low. Maybe we could even scale it up. Uh, that's for them to be decided. And then once we all feel that this is a well-developed well survey, a uh, uh, well-developed service, something that we could really do, we'd have to also check in with obviously our union, the QP4512 union. Uh, we'd have to see who the employees for it, who would staff it, the costs. After all that, we get our final value. If it's something at that point where we think it's still reasonable and it's something that we can do, we obviously send it to referendum again in the general elections and say, uh, from the investigations that we have done, we believe that this service, uh, would you support a service at this cost uh, per, fee, per credit? For, uh, for the student union to run. And we move forward from there and actually implement it. So that is basically the long-term how this normally develops. Uh, there's a ton of work into it. And when I say a ton of work, I mean a ton of work. This is no small feat. There's a reason why in the 50 plus years of the CSU, we only have four services and nothing more. It's because that is a lot of work, but I personally think it's work that should be done 
the faculty associations agree that we should be investigating this. So now I am presenting that to council saying this council agree to send this question to referendum so that we could get the student's opinion on it. Uh, that's pretty much it uh, from me. So yeah, I don't know if anyone has questions regarding it anymore, but this is really just a question to get the student's opinion prior to myself and my executive, the rest of the executives taking on all this work. Great, um, so I'll open the floor to questions, comments. Uh, Harrison, go ahead. I wanna start off by saying, I think this is a fantastic idea. Um, it's definitely something that should be looked into. Um, I just have a quick question. So the student nightline, which is currently um, a fee levy, um, I just want clarification. What is their kind of purpose? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they also provide um, like at home, at home counseling, if I'm not mistaken. So the student nightline uh, provides uh, crisis uh, I don't know what the wording for it would be the best, but it's basically if you're in a moment where you're you're struggling, you really need someone to speak out to, you could call their number, they'll answer the phone, they'll talk to you. Uh, I haven't checked in on them recently, but from my knowledge, they are not trained professionals, they're just volunteers, uh, okay. a voice to be there to speak to you in your moment of need. Uh, nothing further on how to uh, deal with stress or anxiety, depression, or anything long term. It's really just for that moment of need, you need someone, you call them. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Um, just wanted to say, first of all, um, I 110% support this, and I really hope that it goes through, uh, especially with COVID and how we're like isolated and at home, and winter is coming, of course, so that does lead to a lot more issues. Um, I know it's a lot of work, but do you think this will be up by winter semester, uh, hopefully, or? It's, well, realistically, it's impossible for it to be up by winter semester. Uh, I think a proper timeline would be fall. If, if everything goes perfectly according to plan, it should be a fall 2021 uh, launch. Uh, but that's if everything goes according to plan, because we obviously need to send a second referendum question for the general elections to actually approve a fee for this, because there is money that's going to have to eventually come towards this. And uh, without that money, we can't actually run anything. All right. Thank you. Uh, Anais. Uh, Caitlin, I have a question. Uh, can I motivate if I move it now? Yeah, uh, yeah. Do I motivate first or do I motivate after? I know, just read the uh, the question first, please, and then you can motivate, or we'll okay. get a second and then motivate. Okay. Uh, I move that the question, do you support the CSU working towards the creation of a new service dedicated to supporting the mental health of students uh, be added to the uh, referendum questions on this semester? Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, seconded by, I think that was Howard, um, and then your motivation. Uh, so no, it wasn't me, it was someone oh. else who seconded. Oh, sorry, who was the second? Uh, it, it was, was me. Christopher. Chris, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Anais. Uh, so, uh, as some of you may know, uh, the services uh, offered at Concordia are kind of abysmal for mental health. Uh, it's um, like extremely long to be there. You're on a waiting list. You have to have like special, uh, like you have to have special needs and like it's it's like a, a minefield to get services. So it, it would be amazing if the CSU would uh, offered this uh, to students. Uh, it's something that uh, like plagues the student population. Like so many of my friends talk about it. Uh, like it, it's something that we all have to deal with and with COVID it's uh, probably not going to get better. And uh, I just really hope that everyone's going to vote to push this through to a referendum question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, James, go ahead. James? Yes, yes. <clears throat> I was just struggling with the mute button. Um, but yeah, no, great, great idea. I remember, I think a few councils ago, there was a proposal for uh, uh, mental health services. And I said then that this is a task better suited to a fee levy than just a CSU unit. And uh, here we are. So uh, support. Uh, actually, just a question to the room. Is there any opposition? Or is everybody just going to be speaking in support of this? Because otherwise, we can just move to a vote. 
Well, Hirsch is next, so. I have a I few we'll... questions for Ed. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Eduardo, uh, two questions. You can order them and uh, you can answer them in whichever order you'd like. Um, the first is, well, one of them is what is, has Robert Henry commented on it? Um, and the second is how does this fit in with the mindfulness project? Uh, so, okay, so the first part is Robert Henry is our general manager. He normally handles the finances. Uh, when I spoke to him about it, he said uh, he would help. Well, he obviously said it's a, he, he kind of says the same for everything. He's like, it's a great initiative. But then he said that he will specifically be helping with associating costs to this uh, project. So he's like, when you have like a firm idea, uh, which would come after the surveying stage of what this survey, this service should include, at that point, uh, contact me and we're going to go through line by line all the costs associated with it and see where we could save and where we don't, where we have to spend money because it's necessary. So that's where uh, Robert, I guess, is going to fit into it eventually. Uh, but in terms of the service itself, great idea, great initiative. It's kind of all the same. I, I like Robert for that. He's always down to do different things. Uh, as far as the mindfulness, um, that is a good question. The mindfulness project uh, indicated that they also want to be a fee levy. They generally stick to just one aspect, which is the mindfulness as they have said in the past is generally their thing. Uh, they still haven't just on like kind of off, not off record, but like they haven't gotten back to me yet regarding uh, what their plans are moving forward. Uh, but they would basically be only a subsection of what this service would then include. All right, thank you. Um, follow up on that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Wait, so are you saying they would be part of this or are they, would they be a independent, um, for lack of a better term, redundant service compared to this? Oh, I would never say they're redundant. I think, uh, I, I would never say that, but they would be a similar service to this if to an well even to an extent because this is a little uh, more expansive than their uh, I would say their mission statement and their goals I think this is a little more expansive uh, but yeah we'd be working sort of in the same vein thank you uh, Victoria go ahead um, I just wanted to take a minute to kind of say like there are different um, like initiatives on campus regarding mental health and different things on campus that are for students to, in order to help and um, you know get their mental health quote unquote on the right track. Obviously each service is different but the thing that we have to kind of remember in this is that each service has a cap and we have 35,000 students so what we want to do is offer another service but a service that is obviously different than the other ones. And each of them is kind of specialized in their own way, right? And by having these different specializations, it's allowing different students to get the access to the required services that they need, depending on their mental state. So obviously there's a, a lot of different mental illnesses. There's a, a lot of different like extents to which you need um, help and what kind of help that you need. So I just think um, it's something important kind of to consider when we're talking about all the other services that are here. You're like, yeah, we do have other services. There are other things that are being offered and that will be working alongside us, obviously. But we want to do something obviously different and something that would be more accessible to students. So one of the biggest things, if you guys are aware or not, um, the health service Concordia offers, like the health center, they like, I don't know if I think someone mentioned it, but they only take people when it's an emergency. Um, that's great, but we have 35,000 students and especially with the pandemic, as people were saying, like mental health is not necessarily at a rise right now and it's consistently getting worse and worse for people. So I think um, for the future and to make sure that we have this, if a pandemic ever does happen again, at least we'll be set up with the tools for the students to have, um, to be successful in it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so at this point, there's nobody else on the speakers list, so we can move to a vote. Um, so the question on the table is to send the question, do you support the CSU working towards the creation of a new service dedicated to supporting the mental health of students to referendum? Um, so is there any opposition to, to this? Opposition going once, twice. All right, so that carries unanimously. Um, is there anything else you had to add, Eduardo? Nope, but uh, if anyone, like I always offer, if anyone wants to 
uh, work with me on any projects. I have all my documents on my council uh, SharePoint for people to view. And if anyone ever has an, an idea on something I'm working on, you could always email me uh, because these are big projects and it's not something I should be tackling alone ever. So <laughs> I'm, uh, you always have me supervised by someone. Isaiah does a good job at that generally, but uh, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so the next point on the agenda is the Space Concordia Endowment Fund motion. Um, it was pointed out to me right before the meeting by Eduardo that we had actually passed a motion, um, I, don't even, I don't think it was this year, maybe last year, um, to suspend the endowment fund, uh, but Space Concordia is still here to present. So uh, Milius, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, and yeah, um, even though if we're not necessarily able to uh, get the funds today, we still uh, worked really hard on this and we have a lot of our members here. So we wanted to make sure that we could still present. So I'm just going to go ahead and okay. start sharing Personal my slides. privilege? Yes. Um, can I? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, I just wanted to make a suggestion. Uh, revoking that vote from previously requires a two-thirds vote, correct? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, Are we talking uh, about you know the what? previous vote? Never mind, thought better of it. Um, I was going to say first look into whether we can do that, but you know what, first give the presentation, then decide if we want to do that. Okay. I love that idea. I'll go ahead with it. Also, um, we didn't know that there was a 10 minute restriction. Uh, so we have a lot of slides, but we're going to try to power through as much as possible because as I know, these things uh, are not five minutes. So I will try my best to make sure that I'm not contributing to that. So hello, I'm Elise, as you may know. I am uh, the president of Space Concordia and we are going to be presenting to you today our endowment and presentation. Um, so we're just going to be going through these six points. And yeah, uh, so welcome to Space Concordia. Um, as you may or may not know, we are an interdisciplinary aerospace engineering society here on campus, um, currently under the ECA. Uh, we have over 200 students in our ranks and uh, yeah, many of them are here today to support us. Um, here's our CSU Council, I'm one of them. We were also gonna be having a Timothy Clochard um, from Council also be presenting alongside for all of the division leads. Oops. So the activities that we do here in Space Concordia are projects, outreach, um, community building, and learning, um, which we will all delve very much into the depths of later. Um, our team uh, consists of spacecraft, rocketry, robotics, space health, which is our newest division, and special projects, and along with our outreach, uh, marketing, and finance team. So the history of Space Concordia is uh, an interesting one. Uh, I'm not going to make it too long, but essentially uh, we started 10 years ago, um, initially as um, a project underneath um, a faculty member in engineering who just wanted to um, enter a satellite into a competition. And um, we entered into that competition, the Canadian um, Satellite Design Competition, and we got first place on our first go. And with that, uh, that's how Space Concordia was born. In 2012, um, we, no, sorry. Yeah, in 2014, <laughs> we got uh, rocketry, uh, robotics, and uh, we also got council at that time. And um, in 2018, sorry, in 2020, we were able to introduce uh, Space Health. But along um, those ways, we were able to accumulate over um, 10 awards for our society, and all of them are um, very near and dear to our hearts. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Daniel. Daniel, let me know when you want me to go to the next slide, um, and I will meet myself in the meantime. All right, sounds good. I'll try and keep it short. Hi, I'm Daniel Berry. I'm Division Leader of Robotics. I'll be presenting. Next slide. So to give a bit of background on our team, we have about 40 students, mostly engineers, but they're ranging from first year to PhD students. And we do have students in business, marketing, film study, and even fine arts. Next slide. Um, we are competition based. We compete at two competitions. One competition is the University Rover Challenge or URC. The other one is the European Rover Challenge or ERC. URC happens in Utah, ERC happens in Poland. We travel there to compete. Next slide. Um, we do uh, really well at these competitions, given the fact that we are a very young team. Uh, 90 teams from around the world apply to these competitions, and we uh, only about 35 of them actually qualify to go to competition. Every time we've applied for competition, we've qualified and got in, and we've performed very well at these competitions. Next slide. 
uh, these competitions are designing a Mars rover or a Mars themed rover in order to um, be able to complete the challenges or the tasks that an actual Mars rover sent to Mars would have to do. Uh, next slide. Um, these uh, tasks, they're actually taken from previous Mars Martian missions uh, done by NASA and ESA. The first task is searching for signs of life in a soil sample. So we have a custom designed Raman spectrometer with the help of Space Help. That's a very fancy way of saying we shoot very powerful lasers at dirt. And from that, we can tell whether there are signs of life or whether they have ever been signs of life in the soil. Next slide. The second one is developing the rover to be an astronaut support. When we actually get to the chance of sending an astronaut to Mars, we don't want to waste the astronauts time with making them fix the plumbing, fetching tools, or fixing faulty equipment. That would be the job of the rover. So our rover is designed to traverse over harsh terrain and deliver heavy objects, as well as have the dexterity in the arm to push buttons, flip switches, uh, type on a keyboard, and plug in USB sticks into the computer. Next slide. The, one of the more difficult challenges in the competitions are developing the rover to be fully autonomous. This is something that is super critical to rovers sent to other planets because the delay between whatever you try to do to control the rover can be up to 22 minutes for Mars specifically. And it's not efficient if it takes 22 minutes for the rover to go forward when you push it and tell it to go forward. So having the rover be able to operate completely autonomously and make the, the decisions on its own is super effective. So that's another thing that's in the competitions that we design a rover to be able to do. Next slide. These competitions happen on a yearly basis. This is a general timeline for the year that happens every year. We, uh, our year starts around mid-September where we start designing the rover for the upcoming year. In November, we have a design freeze and then we invite members from, or we invite people from industry, from MDA, the CSA, past alumni, professors to give us criticism on our designs, give us advice, feedback, we have until March to implement the feedback. Then we have some testing. We do a, a systems tests, full dry runs. Then we compete in competition in May. Then we do the same thing all over again before we compete in competition in September. And then the year repeats. Next slide. I've talked a bit about our team and I've talked a bit about what we actually do. But the reason why we do this is not to get first place at competition. It's because we want to inspire the community around Concordia and even outside of Concordia to do more than just the bare minimum in class. It's to inspire these students to learn practical skills that classes just can't seem to teach. And it's to train them in things that are very useful in career, whether it's practical skills like I'll show in the next slide or soft skills like communication, leadership and presenting. Next slide. Um, one of these skills is manufacturing. And um, I was going to get into a whole long thing about all the different skills we teach, but for the sake of time, I'll skip it. But we teach manufacturing, soldering, we give safety training, uh, hazardous waste materials and all of that. We do a lot, you name it, we teach it. And we encourage people to learn, even if it doesn't really relate to them. It does relate to them. We encourage them to learn it anyway. Next slide. How do we do this? Some we have a management team made up of all the leads on in robotics. These people are some of the most passionate people that you will ever see at Concordia. And these people are the best role models that we, can, that we have come across. And these people dedicate hours of their time to train these members and pass on the wisdom and experience that they have. And it's really amazing to see how much effort they put in to just helping other people develop. Thank you. I'll pass it off to Kim now to present Spacecraft. Hello, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so hello everyone. My name is Kimberly Rutherford. I'm one of the spacecraft co-lead and I'll be doing the portion for the spacecraft division. So the spacecraft division comprises around 40 members which are in different programs, but mainly from engineering. Now, really quickly, like some questions that I always get is what exactly does the spacecraft division do? Well, we actually build satellites. And another question that I often get is, why do we do this? Well, people don't know, but satellites are actually an important, um, an important aspect of our life. We use them and we don't even realize them. So there's satellites that we use for communication, for GPS, 
for weather for Earth observation. Earth observation, which has been really good for climate change, so it's been helping us quite a lot. <coughs> and also, fun fact: <laughs> so a while ago, like a while ago, um, some scientists were trying to study the greenhouse effect, and actually they sent a satellite to space. And by sending a satellite to space, they were able to find that there was a depletion in the ozone layer. So satellites are quite important. So that's why we do this. Um, next slide, please, Melise. I, OK, so perfect. So like Melise said, in 2010, we entered this competition called the Canadian Satellite Design Challenge, or we call it CSCC for short. So basically, this competition is a two-year competition where we have to uh, design, we have to build and test a cubat, which is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters, something quite small. And at the end of this competition, the CubeSat should technically be ready to be launched. So we have participated in four of these competitions since 2010, and every time Space Concordia has always been in the top three. We are quite good at building satellites, that's what we can say from all this. Um, so Consat won the first satellite that we built was first place, then Consat two second place, Alexander one first place, and Alexander two third place, which was really good. Um, the only thing though, so these satellites, unfortunately, we have not been able to launch them, not because they're not ready to be launched, but actually launching a satellite is quite expensive. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but to launch one kilogram, so a little kilogram, it costs around $50,000. And these little CubeSats, tiny satellites cost, um, or they weight four kilograms, which means that they cost $200,000 to launch. So that's been our main issue be, uh, to be able to launch them. But so after 2018, after finishing with Alexander the second, I would say. Um, next slide, please, Millie. So we, we started this project, the Canadian CubeSat Project, or CCP. So basically, the CSA decided to give grants to 15 universities to build a CubeSat and launch it. And we were one of the universities selected by the Canadian Space Agency. So we're in collaboration with the China School of Engineering and Computer Science to build design and uh, design sorry build and um launch a cubesat so we are going to space <laughs> it's like a dream come true after 12 years we're going to be able to finally finally send one of our little cubesats to space and just to point out we're one of the two universities in quebec to have been selected we have been selected with the university of sherbrooke so we are will be sending se odin the little cubesat that you see right there and again just a little reminder we are going to space guys in 2022 so that's quite cool. Next slide, please. Okay, so the CCP mission, the one that we are working on right now has two aspects. So there's the educational mission and there's also the technical mission. But the educational mission is actually the main and the most important part of our project, let's say. Why is that? Because the CCP program, it's really to learn. We, we really want to understand how to design, how to build, how to test, what goes on in a space mission. So we want to expose all the students, um, all the aspects of a real space mission. We also want to introduce them to concepts of satellite engineering, climate sciences, group dynamics, and obviously we also want to do outreach to promote STEM education and space literacy. Next slide, please. Okay. So for the technical mission, we actually have two missions on our CubeSat. So every time something goes to space, it's for a reason. You can't just send something randomly. Well, except for SpaceX, but you know. <laughs> but um, you, you have to send something to space for a reason. And for us, it's a little camera that's going to be taking pictures of two specific regions. So we're going to be taking re uh, pictures of the Namibian coastal regions and Lake Colhuehuapi in Argentina, because we're going to take pictures and capture specific data that we're going to give to a climate scientist at the University of Montreal to help with climate change, study climate change. And then for the secondary mission, we're going to have this really tiny chip on our CubeSat that's going to be monitoring the doses of radiation, just because radiation can actually be quite harmful for satellites. So it's important to know how much radiation we're getting on the CubeSat. Next slide, please. Now for the timeline. So we have started since 2004. Now we have completed our design. We're building some models and prototyping because in March we have our critical design review with the Canadian Space Agency. So this review is actually quite important because it's going to be deciding if we are ready or not to move forward with the project. And this is also going to be done in front of NanoRacks, which is the, um, the industry that's going to be sending our CubeSat to space. Then we're going to be testing and we're going to be launching in early 2022. Next slide, please. 
So our impact, so like I said before, we want to learn, we want to, to understand how to do this properly. Um, and by doing that, we want to expose students to all the aspects of real estate mission, space mission, sorry about that. We also wanna help students get experience in space engineering. And we have actually gained so much experience that we've been able to get internships from so many different places in the space industry, which is really great. So a lot of our students have been going to the Canadian Space Agency, to the European Space Agency. Now people are working in the States, in the space in industry. So we've really made a great impact for the students. Uh, we're also creating a permanent ground station at Loyola, or we are in the process of um, trying to do that. So that's going to be also something quite amazing for Concordia University to have its own ground station. Um, and we're also constructing a thermal vacuum chamber, which is really like this little oven where we put things to be tested. And um, once you, you can test basically, um, it's very similar to pr the production of like the space environment. Um, and not a lot of universities have this. So this is also something quite cool that we're trying to get done for Concordia University. So yeah, that's pretty much it for my part of the presentation. I'll leave it to Oleg for rocketry. Uh, thank you, Kim. Hey, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you're good. All right, sweet. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to keep this quick. All right, so uh, I'm uh, next slide, please. So now on to rocketry. My name is Oleg Kilimanov. I'm the team captain of the rocketry team and the chief rocket designer. Next slide, please. All right, to just give you guys a little bit of backstory. So we have been launching rockets since 2015. All right, our first rocket we ever launched to, uh, in 2015 was to 10,000 feet at IREC, the Intercollegiate Rocketry Challenge. It's the largest rocket competition in the world, where currently over 150 universities from across the, the seven continents congregate to launch rockets or try to, to 10,000 feet for the basic category or 30,000 feet for the advanced category. So with the first year we entered, we had a lot to learn and we won second place in the payload challenge. The next year we came back and we took a lot of what we learned and we applied it and we got second place in the basic category, beating schools like McGill, MIT, Stanford. It was awesome. All right, then in uh, the following year, where the team graduated, right? But the, a lot of members from the current team, they joined for the first time in two, two, 2017. And, uh, and we again tried to learn a lot from the past and tried to enter again. And this time we didn't do so well. We didn't, we didn't get uh, second place worldwide out of like 100. But, uh, but we did come first in Quebec, you know, compared to, uh, compared to like ETS, Polytechnique, uh, McGill, you know, Université Laval, a whole bunch of other really well-known, really well-regarded rocket schools, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we, were, we, were, we were pissed, you know, we wanted to win. We, went, we, we came in saying that we, were, we had won second place before, we're going to do better. So we got together and we, were, we decided that next year was going to be different. So this year's the, the, the following year in 2018, we entered not just in the basic category, but in the advanced category. You can send over to the next slide, please. We launched Concordia University's first supersonic aircraft, all right? We made a rocket that can go 2,000 kilometers per hour in less than three seconds. And not only did we launch that rocket and recover successfully, one of the only few teams that was able to launch it. <laughs> Pardon me, pardon me. Sorry, Arie, do you mind uh, muting yourself? Anyway, perfect. So not only did we launch that rocket and recover it successfully, but we came in first place worldwide. And not just the advanced category, but also the scientific payload challenge, right? This is the first time that any university in the 20 years of this competition has ever brought home two first place trophies, but also... Uh, yeah, it was, it was the first time that Concordia University has dominated at an international rocketry challenge or engineering challenge for that matter in, in a way such as this against such a competition. You know who got second place? It doesn't matter because we got first. <laughs> but, you know, if you do care, Stanford uh, was, was the second place prize winner. So we were very proud of that. So what does this mean? Where do we go from this? So we won in this challenge. Well, we won at a very convenient time. We had built a team. This was two years of experience where we had learned a lot. And there was just on the horizon, a new competition. It's not even a competition more like, it's like a challenge. There was a bunch of, a bunch of companies you might've heard of like SpaceX or Blue Origin. Um, they're, 
they're unfortunately their uh, their employees are all from like the NASA era, and they're starting to retire. These are the guys that built the space shuttle, and uh, they want to hire students. But all the students that they're hiring say, "Oh, you know what? They all they've ever done is build a rocket that goes to ten thousand feet, and you can hold it in your two hands." You know, we need people that can build rockets that go to Mars. So they got together and they said, "You know, we need people who can build a rocket that goes to space." We're going to put together a one-time challenge that it's been sent out to the world, all right? First students who can send a rocket to space win a million dollars. Next slide, please. So we decided to enter the Base 11 Space Challenge, where we are actually trying to, we've been working for two and a half years nonstop on this project, trying to build the largest rocket ever built by students, the most powerful rocket engine in student history by a factor of 10. All right, this is an insane project. At the very beginning, people said it wasn't even possible for the most well-funded and well-developed schools. When this project started, there has only been three universities worldwide that has ever been able to fire a liquid rocket engine. All right, we aim to be, put Concordia on the map and be one of them. So uh, next slide, please. So we built the largest test stand in any university history and we named it Trailer Tom. So there you can see, here's during, in one of our tests earlier, the, earlier last year before the lockdown, that is our test stand behind Reggie's. Next slide, please. When we finished the construction of this test stand in November, 2019, we st first started testing it with water downstairs. Next slide, please. We later, we, we la later developed our, uh, our, our, uh, our, our test stand to be able to handle cryogenic liquids at minus 200 degrees Celsius. So, so cold that it evaporates the moment it hits the air. Here's one of our tests in uh, December, 2019. Next slide, please. Then we started rehearsing for the actual launch date where we were doing full systems tests. That's us wearing all our PPE out in the freezing cold <laughs> of Montreal in the winter. Canadian winters are not fun, especially, and it's not fun when you're operating rocket engines in them otherwise. Uh, next slide, please. And we've even gotten to the point where we've been developing our ignition system, valve timing. And this is an insanely complex uh, machine. I don't even know how well to describe it. I mean, like, I, uh, I hate to say that it's just rocket science, but it kind of is. And it, a lot of things need to go right. So it's all just testing, 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 testing. Here's one of our, most, uh, one of our tests right before we, uh, we did our hot fire. This was in uh, February 2020. Uh, and next slide, please. All of this culminated together, two and a half years of work for our first ever engine test in uh, February of uh, 2020. It was amazing. It, 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 the thing that I can't even describe the sound of this thing, right? Like I've been, to, I've, been to, I've been to punk shows, I've been to rock concerts. That was nothing by comparison. I've been next to planes as they start to go off. This thing, we were behind three feet of, uh, of concrete over 150 feet away and I could, and I could still feel it in my chest. Uh, next slide, please. And then lockdown. That's what happened. Everything was shut down literally two weeks after we first tested the engine. We Engine tests, are, I don't know if you guys follow SpaceX at all, but you got to test engines all the time, a lot, for months. And right when we started was the lockdown. So you know what we did? We didn't give up. We've already been working on this for two years, all right? And we were not about to give up the chance to win this, to be the first university in space. Next slide, please. So what we did was we said, okay, we can't test. We can't do anything physical. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to focus on the fundamentals. What can we do? We're going to finish all the math. We're going to finish all the design. We had a design review with members from SpaceX, with members from Boeing, with members from Bo uh, Virgin Galactic, the Canadian Space Agency, uh, MDA, you name it. We got them all over to check our design and say, yeah, this is good. No, this could use some work. And we took their feedback. We implemented it. And then we, and then we finalized our design. But then came something new. We needed, we, okay, we finished our design. What are we gonna do, sit on our asses? No, we decided to execute Operation Unstoppable Force. Next slide, please. So what we did is we, after months and months of pleading and begging and going through all the hoops for access, we finally got one day, two hours to get everything out of the school. And we did, we got the trailer, we got the rocket, we got all the tools, all the equipment, every single nut, bolt, fastener, drill, you name it everything loaded up into a u-haul and went to the rock house next slide please one of the members of the team just inherited a house in sherbrooke the place had been abandoned for 15 years and you know what we showed up with a buttload of stuff and we fixed it up all right this is the rocket house we completely we got hot water electricity internet everything running again and now we live in here building the rocket for the past few months next slide please 
and I present to you, this is our flagship product, Project Star Sailor. This is the English translation of the word astronaut because it's the first time in 10 years that Space Concordia can finally send something to space, as was always our dream. With Project Star, uh, next slide, please. By the way, that's this, uh, we're also building a launch tower. There's a lot of infrastructure goes into this. Not only do we have to build a test stand that's the most powerful in the country, we have to build a 40 foot tall rocket that goes five times the speed of sound and a test and a, and a launch tower over 70 feet tall that can be brought down to Spaceport America in New Mexico where we launch to outer space. Next slide, please. And that brings us to our final point, is that we are aiming, the, there's only two windows left to launch. This challenge is extremely aggressive, all right? They, they didn't extend any deadlines and it's still ongoing. The first students to launch win the, win the prize. Anyone else launches before us, it's over, we're done. There's only two launch windows left. The first is in May, 2020, and that's when we're planning on doing it. Everyone, any, ev anyone who's heard of this project has said it's impossible even for students to do. This is like a, this, a project of this scale is on millions of dollars and dozens of years of, we're literally trying to do what countries were trying to do 10 years ago. And, uh, and that's what the tagline of this mission is, doing the impossible. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. I will now pass the mic over to Sp Space Health. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Amanda. I'm the lead on the Space Health Division, newest division that has been added to Space Concordia as a special project in 2019 and then we officially became a division in May of 20. Next. So, oh, cool. It's health anyways. So, I mean, this is kind of like an arbitrary topic because you think of space medicine, space health, you're probably thinking of astronauts, but really what is it? is the development of the new biotechnologies that are being uh, sent along with astronauts and basically make their health mon uh, mon monitoring more autonomous, a little bit more feasible, and also facilitates travel to places like Mars. So just as an example, I mean, it, what can you even think about as space health? Well, it really comes down to design. So what is really any of the inventions that came out of it? Well, things that we see in everyday life. Um, think of LASIK, LASIK eye surgery. Think of the MRI machine and the different image processing algorithms that came out of it. And even Nike Air Max. So um, now, I mean, it's a different world. What we're looking at is investing in different technologies that are gonna be making the space travel more accessible, more easy. And you can see that in the last three years, Canada has invested $9.6 million in the development of different health technologies, uh, primarily which are three of the topics that we are covering in our space health division. Next slide. So who are we? So we are space health. We believe in developing diagnostics, remote healthcare, and biotechnology and innovation. We conceptualize, design, manufacture, and test different technologies that we're developing. And also at the same time, uh, we're not doing it just for space, but we are actually doing it to develop different diagnostic methods that are gonna be used in rural medicine. Meaning that let's say you have a community that is located either Africa or Northern Canada that doesn't have access to healthcare or doesn't have money to uh, invest in different, very um, uh, different, let's say fancy techniques. Well, basically you have these diagnostic methods that are portable, accessible and low, to manu low cost to manufacture. Next slide. So just to show you our team, so we are 25 strong. This is some of our team. Uh, we are made up, so next slide. We are made up of five subdivisions. We have one uh, control systems and payload team, which really focuses on developing the payload that is actually going into the base 11 rocket. Setting up our, uh, <laughs> yes, Oleg is cheering. Uh, by law, the payload test uh, by exposing it to hypergravity and microgravity. Um, next is the microfluidics, which I will cover, which is made up primarily of our uh, science students. And uh, they focus primarily on uh, both microbiology, biology, chemistry, and also some chemical engineering. We have a data team. And then we also have a newly added business development team because, next slide. 
All right, so in the payload. So what is going up in the rocket? Something that's going to help people long term and something that's going to help astronauts. So really, we're fluidic platform. And what this is, is a silicone chip that has different channels in it, King Yi cells, because they're very similar to basically doing something. Next slide. We're doing a process called CRISPR, which is basically certain uh, splitting apart the, uh, the yeast cell, tagging a certain gene, then closing it back up. And next slide. Sending it up in this chip, we are doing two different tests, which are going to be airborne and one which is going to be a control on Earth. So basically, one is going up in a payload. We want to see what happens when these cells are exposed to microgravity and hypergravity. Next, we're also looking which you've probably seen uh, in different movies when you're looking at fighter jet pilots flying these planes that are going up and down, up and down. So you're simulating microgravity. And five of us from our team are actually going to go in order to set up the experiment. Uh, and then finally, our earthbound experiment, which is our control. So basically doing a prolonged exposure uh, of microgravity, which can last from a couple of weeks to a couple of uh, months, actually. Next slide. Next, we're in a second project at the same time. So Space Health, the physics department, and has been acknowledged uh, as uh, an official thesis topic. So you can now register into um, Physics 498, 497, and get it and take Space Health as an accredited course. So our student has been working on um, the simulation of what happens in, in the cardiovascular system. So really what happens to the heart when it goes into space for a prolonged amount of time. So what you see on the right, uh, right hand side over here is uh, our collaboration with a master's student in the mechanical engineering department. We will be printing out um, the uh, aorta and also the ventricle, putting it into a body cavity. And we were, go we we're going to play with the dimensions according to what happens to the heart when it's in outer space for a long amount of time. So what we can find out is that it's going to be very similar to some of the pathologies that are uh, present here on Earth. Next slide. So this is the um, brief timeline of uh, where we see ourselves heading in the next uh, year and a half. Uh, by the end, we are finalizing our microfluidic chip design, including the payload, and we plan to fly our payload on the Base 11 rocket uh, in May 2021. Also, for our second project, uh, we have continued our uh, R&D through our research thesis. This is going to be taking place for the next three months. And then by the end of 2021, we are going to be uh, finalizing our, um, our design uh, for our superficial, our, um, our synthetic uh, cardiovascular system. And we are going to see how exactly our body pumps blood through our body uh, in outer space. So next slide. So our impact, what we want to bring to you is new sustainable health technologies that are going to be available to people not only in space, but also in rural communities. Uh, we want to create portable devices and accessible healthcare at low manufacturing costs. And then also, since we do not have a medical department, we do want to put Concordia on the map for different biotechnology and astronautic research, which is only available in one other school in Alberta, in Canada, which makes us second and we want to beat them. Thank you. And now it's back to me. So what is our impact overall um, as an entire society? Well, we give our students several opportunities to go ahead and make a name for themselves within the space industry. One of the ways that we do that is via um, conferences. At our conferences, we are, uh, we are invited to the most prestigious conferences in the entire aeronautics um, industry. And several of our members every year go ahead and uh, present at this Aeros um, International Aeronautical Congress every year. Um, and I had the pleasure of going last year. And uh, this is really a great opportunity for people to make a name, find a job, network, and this is an opportunity that you only get as a member of Space Concordia. And I'm going to pass it to Tim to talk to you a little bit about outreach. So, uh, hi. Thank you. Um, the presentation is really interesting, but if you guys could just wrap it up. Uh, we're, yeah, we're super close to being done. Oh, that'd be great.
Yeah, I'll just I'll just state the goal. My name is Timothy Clochard. I'm the VP External of Space Concordia. Our main goal for outreach is that uh, we distribute the ever-ending knowledge of STEM and more specifically space-oriented science to those who seek it. Whether it be children in elementary school or the general public, we strive to make space as accessible as possible, either in the shape of a hobby or as a lifelong career. Next slide, please. So our stats as of now, we have over 20 associations that we've worked with, over 100 volunteers, a total of 24 events, 650 hours of volunteering, and especially the most important stat is that we have tens of thousands of people that we, uh, we, we inspire every day to spend their time and focus on space. So next slide, please. And yeah, due to the pandemic, we've been really required to move to a new platform. So just posting videos on Zoom, uh, no, on YouTube, and then doing workshops or, or conferences on Zoom. And uh, yeah, we're really hoping that we can uh, have the same stats as of last year, uh, especially with all the, uh, the problems that we had. So yeah, thanks for listening. Perfect. And I will be mostly uh, wrapping it up um, for everybody that had to do your impact slide. I'll let you do yours, but make it really short. Okay. So what do we offer to our students as well? We also let them do technical training, which makes them very, very equipped for the workforce. Once again, an opportunity that you can only get in Space Concordia, and it ends up rearing its head in amazing ways such as this. Uh, I look around and did the stats. 100% of our students that graduate from Space Concordia as a long-term member end up getting a job within three months of graduating, and most of them end up being in their fields. A bunch of them end up going into the ECA, CSA, and a lot of them also go end up in the aerospace industry. And that is something that, uh, especially in um, right now's time, I didn't do the stats for 2020 because it would have been probably miserable. <laughs> for 2019, we were able to give all of our students really amazing jobs and something that they believe in. And then this ends up rearing its head in a very interesting way. Um, our team um, has a 30% uh, non-male ratio, which is comparison to the 14.6% within the entire country. Also, we are basically 50-50 split in terms of POC and non-POC, which happens to be only 33.5% in the country when it comes to these engineering fields. We are making sure that we're bringing more diversity into the, um, into the industry by allowing our students, and especially our different <laughs> students, um, to be as equipped as possible for when they graduate to make sure that we can make a change within the world. Um, and what do we need? Money. Wow. Uh, I, as much as I enjoy speaking to you guys, to hear on a, today on a Wednesday, we're here obviously for money. All of these um, things that we're doing are amazing, as you can see, and all of them require money. And it's not like we haven't been trying. Um, right now, these are uh, what our total costs are looking like for uh, the rest the finished the rest of our projects. As I'm aware, um, this number is not completely feasible. I know the Student Endowment Fund doesn't hold this, but we really do want you to consider this. And what is the impact that you would make as a result of helping us? Well, I'm going to let Daniel very quickly talk about the impact of robotics, then rocketry, and then it will be me and I'll be done with two minutes. <laughs> yeah, for the sake of keeping it short, imagine everything that I've already said in my presentation, but done to a new level. And that's it. Yeah, that's, I'll keep it short. Oh, Kim, it's yours. Well, I mean, for us, the biggest impact would be to helping construct things that Concordia University doesn't have right now, like the thermal vacuum chamber, the ground station, and also a testing room for their satellites. Right, that's quite short. Next slide. <laughs> you will be helping us make history. They will be talking in textbooks about how Concordia University was the first university to send a rocket to space. And um, on my end, in terms of what I know that everybody wants, they want to make sure that they're actually getting credit for what they're helping us with. Our impact is quite large on social media. Across all of our platforms, we, over, we have over 10,000 followers. We would be able to make sure that people within engineering always have access to the information. Uh, that always have access to the CSU and will always be able to get the information that you want to relate to them. As you know, engineering has a pretty low turnout in terms of um, having uh, people vote, but you know what, with you giving money, we are voting. <laughs> so, um, and also um, wrap up, um, as you know, Space Concordia has four different divisions. How are we all related? It seems a little bit unrelated right now. We are one of the few societies that have all the different types of aeronautical engineering in the same place. And our dream is to make sure that one day we can all come together. We're slowly getting there with um, rocketry being able to have space health inside of their rocket. But one day we hope to make sure that we can build some type of space vehicle that will be able to encompass everything and create one true Space Concordia. And 
thank you to all of our sponsors. Just so you know, in terms of stats, because I know it used to come up, um, these are our sponsors that we've had, but over the course of um, the last two years, we have collectively as a whole ended up reaching out to over 300 different organizations for money. We are really trying to get this money. We are not coming with you, to you as a first resort, we're coming to you as a serious resort. And with all that said, I would like to thank you so much. I understand it went over time, but yes, thank you for listening to our presentation. And everybody that's in space, go hi. <laughs> all right, thank you very much for uh, coming here to present. Um, Desiree, you wanted to say something? Yes, thanks, Caitlin. Um, essentially, I wanted to say that I spoke with Eduardo and essentially the student endowment fund is not frozen anymore. Um, I was the one that wrote the motion to freeze it last year in November 2019 and it was frozen until a new policy would be passed in council and that new policy passed in May 2020. Um, so that de facto like unfroze the student endowment fund, but that new policy also requires um, the financial committee to review applications to the endowment fund. So uh, I can't move to send it right away to the, uh, to the finance committee right now because I, I already started speaking. Um, and it's kind of a side, like it was a wonderful presentation to, to Space Concordia. It was absolutely great. I mean, everyone was really uh, enthusiastic in our council chat too, of just like how energetic it was. But regardless of that, right now, our policy has it that uh, the financial committee is are the people that are supposed to review any applications to the endowment fund before it's even presented to council. So that council has a additional stamp of approval before making a decision on uh, these expenses. Um, so yeah, I'll encourage the next people to speak to send this to financial committee so that it um, follows our current finance policy. But yeah, that's it, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Isaiah, go ahead. Isaiah? So, um, what's it called? N never mind. Oh, I motion. No, no, no. I motion to send this to FinCon. All right. Do we have a second? second. I'll second it. Oh, well. <laughs> Who is that? Sorry, that's a second. Uh, it was me. Oh. Oh, that's Shivani. Fine. Oh. Shivani can second it. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, your motivation, Isaiah? As Desiree just eloquently said, um, the new policy says that they have to go to FinCon. So I would. Yeah, send them the thing call. All right, um, James, go ahead. Ah, amazing. So I want to say something before I speak and whoever's live tweeting this better live tweet, but based on this presentation and every time that I've ever worked with something regarding Space Concordia, I got to say that simping for space is king shit. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> that's just it. Like, I'd love to just give you all the fucking money in the world. Uh, decorum, please. Sorry. But, but we don't have $120,000 in the fund. <laughs> but yeah, no, so send it to FinCom and let them, like, just give them as much money as humanly possible. All right. That is you. all. Um, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that someone else will have to be the voice of reason on this issue because my grandfather worked for us uh, for us uh, the on the space shuttle, and basically it's just like I cannot be objective on this issue. So I'm going to like pass the voice of reason to literally everyone else, and I can only apologize for not giving you all the money. All right, thank you, um, Isaiah. Go ahead. I call the question. All right, um, Shivani, are you okay with that? You're the only person on the speaker's list. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to echo the simping for space sentiments. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so if there is no one on the speaker's list, no need to do an official call for the question. Um, so we will move straight to a vote. So if you're voting yes, um, it means that you are voting in favor of sending this to FinCom as per the policy. If you're voting no, it means you're not. And if you're abstaining, it means you're abstaining. Um, but first of all, is there any opposition to sending this to FinCom? Opposition going once, twice. All right, so the um, presentation and um, request has been uh, deferred to FinCom. So um, the finance coordinator should be in touch with um, one of the members of Space Concordia to inform them of date and time of their meeting. 
So just a quick question. Do we yes. need to do anything additional on our end or just wait until we're reached out to? Um, Holly, maybe you can clarify. I'll send you an email and uh, when to meet so that we can all like figure a time. Amazing. Awesome. Okay, I can be reached at president at spaceconcordia.ca. And other than that, I would like to bid you all adieu and the space team will be leaving. So you'll have a very empty <laughs> Zoom call after that. And yeah, thank you so much for giving us a chance. All right, thank you so much folks. And that was a great presentation, very enthusiastic. Thank you guys, you guys are the best. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Um, All right, so if there is nothing further on the uh, Space Concordia point, we can move on to the policy on council and standing committees. And Sarah, this one is yours. Hi, sorry, just give me a second. Um, yeah, no problem. All right, hi guys. Um, good evening. Um, essentially, I hope you all read the, the policy that I sent this. I'm just going to leave this on. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no worries. So essentially, it's just to, um, you know, made some edits from last year's um, policy on um, setting order in council. Um, essentially, uh, we removed the steering committee that was provided. We allowed other people to, as well um, as chairs, be able to just, you know, um, what is it called? I am losing my train of thought, um, but you know, uh, chairs just won't be allowed to vote in that essence um, for the policy committee. Chairs will be allowed to pick their own times um, for when to schedule things. There were very minor details that were just changed um, in that sense. And also, yeah, so I just wanted to motivate for this. The policy committee uh, worked on this all together, so it has our approval. Um, so I would like to, you know, be able to have this done. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so I'll open the floor to questions, comments. Um, actually, Sarah, since there's no one on the speakers list, um, could you just make an official motion to approve the document? A motion to approve the policy on signing council, uh, sorry, signing orders and policy. Oh my God, sorry, the name is so long. Hang on. It's, what is it called again? <laughs> uh, policy yeah. on council and committees. Thank you. Yeah, so I motion to approve that policy. All right, do we have a second for approval? Second. Second by, ah, I'm getting almost good at recognizing your voices. Harrison. Harrison. Harrison thank you. Um, Sarah, you already kind of motivated. Uh, so since it is approving uh, standing regulations, it does require a two thirds. Uh, just one last chance. Does anyone want to speak or question? Okay, so if not, we can move to a vote. Um, so first of all, is there any opposition to approving the policy on council and committees? Going once, opposition, twice. All right, that is approved unanimously. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming I'm talking again. <laughs> yes, you are. So, okay, so this one is on the policy on um, elections and referenda. Um, so what was actually really changed was mainly, um, you know, um, the process for online elections now, um, since we are all in this new digital era. Um, <laughs> collecting signatures, we also spoke previously, Isaiah and I, to the lawyer about how that would happen, um, I guess, in legal sense. Um, so, you know, this also has, like, the legality involved of, like, how to do online elections. Um, and so, you know, um, the signatures just were reduced for the online factor of 20 signatures um, for this. Um, and, you know, um, it'd be great to pass this so that we have some concrete rules for what's happening on um, elections, which are coming up pretty soon. Um, so, yes, um, that's the, uh, the policy on elections. So, okay. Motion um, uh, to approve, like, um, yeah, there's no one on the speaker's list. Okay, cool. Uh, can oh, uh, Vic is Actually, yeah, here, Vic, uh, go first, and then I'll uh, hand it back to Sarah. Well, I guess my question is just does this <laughs> count, sorry, for um, external committee as well. Or are we gonna count this for every single committee except for external for now? Because, like, yeah, I just, yeah, I guess my concern is is external committee gonna have to change the chair right away, or like, is this only effective after? Oh, that was to the previous, uh, the previous one that we, um, Oh, we already just passed that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, well, okay. Well, I, okay. We can I, talk about it in external and make a recommendation or something. Yeah. We need to talk about that. So we'll, we'll deal with it, I guess, after. Okay. 
Um, all right, so Sarah, I guess uh, we just need a motion to approve the policy on elections and referenda. Motion uh, to approve the policy of elections. Oh, okay, Matthew got there first, I guess seconded by Sarah. Um, so uh, is there any more discussion on it? Okay, so in that case, we'll move to a vote. Um, so is there any opposition to approving the new policy on elections and referenda? Opposition going once, twice. Okay, if not, that carries unanimously as well. So our two policies um, that were proposed have been carried. Uh, was there anything else to mention on this, Sarah? If not, we can move on to HR firm proposal. On to that one. Thank you guys for approving that one. I'm loving the quickness today. Um, so <laughs> the next one um, is going to be um, about the human resource consultant proposal that uh, that was done with um, policy committee. So essentially, as we know, um, a lot of the cases do go to judicial board when it does pertain to the code of conduct. Um, however, you know, it doesn't really solve the interpersonal conflicts that do arise um, in the process of, you know, submitting a complaint or, you know, some things can really be um, fixed by just having um, merely a mediation process and a discussion. So this is where it really came about. Um, the proposal was also encouraged by Robert Henry, who's also our general manager, who helped find this particular HR consultant, which you will see in the seven page proposal. It's pretty short, but of how they could help us pertaining to our own policies with the code of conduct and the safer space and sexual violence policy. Um, in that nature, because also under the sexual violence policy, there requires to be a third party investigator, which the human resource consultant can also be um, in that sense. And they do have a lot of experience in the sense of working with student unions on um, this particular HR firm. Um, so they've worked with um, SMU, which is McGill Student Union. Um, so they really do have a lot of experience with that. And I think this would be pretty vital in that sense for our own student union to really have this type of, you know, conflict resolution and mediation when needed um, and I think it's just absolutely important because you know it doesn't solve what happens you know um, with things that happen behind closed doors and I think that this would be ultimately very important and a very dire need for our own union to essentially have um, I think it would help ease a lot of the troubles that are really present um, just by having a discussion. So you can see the processes that they would do in helping in that seven page report um, for how to do this. We've also consulted the judicial board um, who are also in favor of this as well, um, especially with the court, the caseload that they do have, um, they can't really help in the sense of interpersonal, as you know, they only rule on, you know, the codes and the bylaws that we do have. We're not trying to here eliminate judicial board's job. Obviously, they will always still be there pertaining to the code of conduct procedures. However, I think that like, and a lot of people thought that, you know, mediation first would be a good process prior to, you know, going to the judicial board. If you absolutely cannot resolve your issues, then we could, um, go to judicial board for this. So uh, yes, that's the end of my speech. Um, and I would like to, to motion to have this approved for the HR consultant to be a part of the union. Uh, we'll just take Hirsch's question first and then I'll give it back to you since it kind of went a little backwards. Um, Hirsch, go ahead. Um, just looking at the document in front of us, it doesn't seem to be a policy, it's more of a so some sort of proposal. Um, can you mm -hmm. elaborate on what the policy actually is? Well, the policy we can work with once we have the HR consultant to speak about how we need them in what realm and what capacity. This is for how they can help us obviously with this. This is just a proposal. I can't approve um, the policy for it yet. Um, without consulting the HR firm with what role they would be having with us. So that's a discussion that needs to be had. This is honestly only on a need be basis. This is, some, this is not something that's going to be used all the time per se, but this is just a need be basis. So this is how they can just help us. Caitlin, you're on mute also. Oh, sorry, thank you. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, just to clarify actually, um, 
yeah, if you make your motion, I think it'll clarify a bit more of what, um, what the, the goal here is. Mm -hmm. So I just motion, um, you know, um, to, oof, sorry, I'm just lagging today. Um, I guess I just motion to, I guess, approve this, I guess, proposal to have the HR consultant work with the union to figure out a policy for how they can fit into our union and how we can utilize this as specifically also it's mandated in the sexual, uh, sorry, and the safer space and sexual violence policy that a third party investigator must be present to help that committee. So I think specifically with the code of conduct, um, it could help with this uh, process of facilitation and mediation. Does um, the wording I put into the chat uh, make sense? So motion to approve the proposal to have the HR consultant firm work with the CSU to create policy in accordance with sexual violence and safer spaces policy. Can you also add the, um, what is it, the, the code of conduct as well? Sure. And, um, um, in that sense for um, mediation and conflict resolution. Uh, so it would be, um, be a result that council approves a proposal to have the HR consultant firm work with the CSU to create policy in accordance with the sexual violence and safer spaces policy and the code of conduct. And you said one more thing? Um, um, in resolving um, for like mediation and conflict okay. resolution. Uh, there, we go. there we go. So be resolved that council approves the proposal to have the HR consultant firm work with the CSU to create policy and conduct mediation in accordance with the sexual violence and safer spaces policy and the code of conduct. Does that capture everything? Yeah, that captures. Perfect. Um, do we have a second for the motion? Second. Second by Harrison. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say, Sarah? Uh, no, that I just think that this is like important and I think it's a good next step for us to have. Um, yeah, and that's it. Okay. Um, so there's nothing further. Uh, we can move to a vote. Um, so first of all, is there any opposition to adopting this motion? Opposition going once. Twice. Okay. Information. Oh, sorry. Yes. Budgetary impact. Sorry. Budgetary impact. Oh, yes. Be it. Do, do, do. We'll just add that on. Be it further resolved that. Um, what is the budgetary impact? I mean, it was stated that it would just be on a need be basis and they do charge $175 an hour, but that could be discussed with FinCom to think about like the allocation for the budget. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's hard to say because it's on an as needed basis. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just put like to be decided by FinCom? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. FinCom is the reason that we have that clause. Be it further resolved that the budgetary impact is to be decided by the fin Finance Committee. Thank you, Hirsch, for catching that. Um, so going back to approval, is there any opposition to this motion? Opposition going once, twice. Okay, so that carries unanimously as well. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say, Sarah? No, thank you. All right, um, so before we moved on, I received a request for excusal from Jared, uh, which we have to um, dispose of before other matters. Uh, so if anyone wants to move to um, excuse him. Uh, I motion to forgive Jared for not continuing to grace us with his presence. All right, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Harrison. Is there any opposition to excusing Jared? Okay, if there is no opposition, I will mark him as excused. Thank you very much. And we can move on to a council equality referendum question. And Eduardo, this one's yours. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Yada, yada. let's do the presentation. Everyone see presentation? Yeah, yeah you're good. All right, so 
the the real name for this motion is council reform uh council equality was more of a joke that uh, we went along with but officially it's going to be listed down as council reform the first thing i want to say out of uh, before going forward is that this is an opinion question uh, there's several different types of referendum questions you could send uh, this one here is an opinion question that means that this question does it not in any way shape or form change how council currently looks or will look by itself this question is just an opinion to see if the students agree with the idea presented in this question so once this question is through all we have is saying this is what the students want us to do we will start working towards that it doesn't mean anything is set in stone it doesn't mean tomorrow people are going to be kicked off of council it doesn't mean tomorrow there's going to be people added to council it's just an opinion i want to make that very clear before moving forward uh, this is not a change to council. That would require a bylaw referendum question. Uh, now, why are we sending this question if it does nothing or only gives us an opinion? The reason is because these are pretty major issues. These are not things that we should be deciding upon ourselves, just saying, yeah, I think this is a good idea. Let's go for it. Uh, when you're talking about structure of the union, it is a little bigger than that. So. Uh, we ask the student body, do you think this is a good idea? Is this something you support? Uh, and that's pretty much it. So uh, something else I want to make clear is that some people might not support this. Some people might support this. There is no right or wrong. Uh, but the problem is that we should always give the students the right to say their choice on this rather than make the choice for the students. We should always give them the ability to voice their concerns and not just say, I don't think this is an issue and deal with it ourselves. That's why we send these questions off because we do want to listen to the students. So why this question? After discussing with faculty associations, a common concern was that the CSU Council is both not representative of the student body and there exists poor communication between the CSU and the faculty associations. So I spend a lot of time talking to faculty associations uh, on different projects. Uh, orientation was a big one, so obviously I ended up speaking to all of them about it to varying degrees. We had collaborations and we often like talk and say what what we could do better, how to improve. This is something where it's a known problem. It's a problem I knew when I first ran for CSU uh, last year with Cut the Crap. It is a problem that still exists today and the problem is very common it's existed all the time it's that we don't represent the student body very well we're often going to get say that we only represent a small sample of them uh, that only certain types of students are uh, represented uh, i know that last year the previous general coordinator christopher talcitis would say that poly high students represent almost all the seats and that doesn't make sense uh, so in the end it was a thing of com representing the students and lack. So like uh, another thing was we only had one science student last year. Uh, many different issues showed up, but we're not always the most representative of our body. The other thing is that uh, there's a little communication between the CSU and the faculty associations. A lot of the associations said, well, you know, the CSU, it's interesting. We want to get involved, but we don't know how. We don't know our representatives. We don't really talk to you about our stuff. We kind of deal on our own. So they're like, is there a way that we could somehow change that and make it ingrained into our structure that we could actually communicate with each other and work together on issues? That was a very, uh, a very pressing concern out of the faculties that I've spoken to. And I think that's something that we should be working towards. Now that is one half of the why they were saying this question. The other thing is minority seats. Uh, a lot of schools actually have minority seats. Uh, if you see, seen some of the documents I've sent, uh, or well, I sent, I gave to Caitlin, Caitlin sent them to you. They were bylaws of a couple different schools. They all have different minority seats on their boards. Uh, this is something that happens quite frequently. I've noticed outside of Quebec, uh, throughout Canada, it's a very, uh, like it's something that's, I've seen quite a bit. I've looked at a lot of student bylaws. I have a document on my, I have a document on the SharePoint with all the student bylaws I found. I found 20 of them. Uh, just for reference, we have four, five, six maybe universities in Quebec. I have 20 universities across Canada that I found that had different uh, minority seats on them. So there's quite a bit of them, proportionally speaking, that have these minority seats. These minority seats are um, for diversity, for different views. I know that um, 
this is obviously a touchy subject we've touched about in the past in the CSU, but I think that considering the atmosphere we're in, where we've had some rather high profile resignations recently, people stating that uh, discrimination and insensitivity were issues that led to that. I think having those voices on council will add to uh, the way we run to be more inclusive and diverse and to be more respectful of each other. So I think it would be a good idea to that too. Uh, I also checked with the lawyer, is this legal to have a seat reserved for a minority on your board of directors? This is perfectly legal. Uh, many schools do it as well as there's actually ways you could ask, you could ask the Quebec Human Rights Commission for different models on how to do it. So it's actually very uh, legal. There's no issue there. Last thing I wanted to say is that this is a question that has the support of the faculty associations who want to talk about this. This is a question they want to have brought up. This is a discussion they want to have with the CSU. This is something they want to improve. Uh, ECA, CASA, FASA, and ASFA all have said they want to have these discussions. <laughs> for those of you who haven't spent as much time in the CSU as me, for whenever you get all the faculty associations to agree on something, it is pretty wild. We normally disagree on almost everything. Uh, last year, we didn't even agree on one, all four of us, all five of us didn't agree on one thing once. This year, we've already agreed on the same, on this twice at least, <laughs> which I'm very proud of. So we're rolling when it comes to agreeing on stuff now, uh, which is amazing because that means link, uh, we're bo building bonds and getting closer with each other. And that means that it's just gonna be a better university experience for everyone. So this is something they wanna see. Uh, the students wanna see it. I think it's very important that this referendum question does go out for that reason, because if we were not to send it out, it would kind of be a slap in the face to all the faculty associations who have much better representative representatives of their members to say that, no, we're not doing it. So looking around, like I alluded to before, we have bylaws uh, from across Canada. I've looked at a bunch of them, uh, 20 of them I picked specifically because I found that they were uh, well, I also found that they, they were like, well, not only well written, like some bylaws, like you'll notice ours, I think is 19 pages. Caitlin, am I wrong on that? It's not, no. Uh, we'll figure out after, but it's not long, our bylaws. Uh, I've seen bylaws stretching up to 90 pages in length. I've seen professionally written ones. I've seen very cheap written ones. The smallest I seen was one that was written on nine pages of paper, which was incredible. That was not a good one. But yeah, there is basically a lot of different formats. You could have to council, there's a lot of different structures. Uh, just to show you the smallest council size I seen was eight, while the largest one was, I believe, 56 seats. Uh, the 56 seats one was huge and it actually is considered one of the best ones. I don't know if that's means it would work here, but it was definitely interesting to see how different uh, councils all work together and what their formats are. So I just wanna show you really quickly like a, some of the different types I've come across. I've seen somewhere it's an electoral college where every faculty would get at least one representative plus an extra representative for every so many students. I've seen some, some of them that had proportionality. So it was just directly proportional. Uh, I've seen campus based. So I've seen some being like, we're splitting our council over the different faculties. I've seen minorities of all different types. I've seen uh, first year student reps, I've seen uh, GSA reps on undergraduate boards. I've seen um, indigenous, uh, LGBT, black. Uh, I've seen, uh, what else off the top of my head that I've seen? I've seen international students. I've seen uh, resident students. I've seen, there's all kinds of different minorities. You could break them up into like just tons and tons of them. So I've seen different, of uh, many of these. Uh, they're in all shapes and sizes. I've even seen some with admin. So some people even invite administration to sit on their boards or employees. Uh, I've seen departmental breakdowns also, which is like every department gets a rep. Uh, and literally I've seen so many more. It is impossible to name them all. Uh, it's really clever to see what people do. Uh, these are the ones, the ones I listed here, are the ones that are normally done for stuff our size. When I'm talking our size, the CSU is anywhere between 30,000 and 36,000 students. Uh, that is a large amount and we can't compare to schools of, let's say 8,000 students. It just doesn't scale up properly. We don't really get represented the same way. So, uh, it's just interesting to look at them all. I have taken some of the bylaws of those smaller schools also, just because I found they were very well written. 
uh, already had unique ideas in it because this is a brainstorming activity at the end of the day. So some of you that uh, have mentioned to me the vagueness of the question, uh, I've gotten a few calls about it already. So I just wanted to explain why I left it vague. Uh, it's purposely done so that we could in turn see these different, uh, these different uh, systems and try them out. So we're not uh, going to get stuck into one where we accidentally put something that's too constrained and then we can't move forward from it because that's what we voted the first time. So the intentional vagueness of the question gives us good mover maneuverability and saying and adapting to it and saying, okay, you know what? We thought this was a good idea. We went to discuss, look at it and research it more and we realized it doesn't work really for the CSU. Um, and the other thing I want to make very clear when presenting this question is I don't know what the perfect council format for the CSU is. Uh, I remember a time where I was mistaken. Uh, I ran on cut the crap and I really believed that faculty equality was the way to go forward with it. And then as I took over the role throughout all the last year and seeing how it developed in different nooks and crannies of this position, it became apparent to me that that wasn't, at least for me, it was not the way forward anymore. Uh, so that's why when I'm saying this question and I don't want to get stuck into something, uh, it's with that in mind. It's also with that in mind keeping it uh, where uh, where we keep it, sorry, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, with that in mind also, I don't know what the new perfect is. Uh, there's a lot of research that has to go. There's a lot of people to talk to. I think one of the things is if we focus just on ourselves, we're gonna come up with a council that may work for the CSU well, but might not work well with the faculty association. So it, this is really a very big group project. I'm presenting this question, but it's really a question for executives, counselors, faculty associations, and students for all of us to work on this together because in the end, we do serve everyone. And if we only think of ourselves in this table when we're discussing it, we're ultimately not gonna make this the structure that's the best for the students. So I don't know what is possible. Right now I have ideas of what I do like and what I don't like, but really we're only gonna see that more so when we actually get uh, the research going and when we when this question would be passed and we call in all the faculties and we talk with them and we speak to them and we say, listen, what do you need to see? What would help yours the best? What would help ours the best? And what's enough work? Like we, don't, we can't overwork people either. So only then will we find out what the ideal council format is for the CSU. So there's a little preamble we added to the question. Uh, the CSU is investigating ways to reorganize the Council of Representatives for various reasons, such as increasing diversity, involvement, communication, and better representative of the student body and their concerns, among others. For this, we ask the student body for permission to investigate the following changes and adjust, adjust, oh, that would, adjust, uh, typo, but adjust as our research continues. So this is basically saying we have a question. We're still looking at how we're doing it. This basically says like, let's see the question. What we end up coming up with is not exactly 100% on the question. It's maybe 90% of the question, but it's not 100%. Well, it's because we researched it. We did our due diligence and we have good reason to believe that there has to be a slight modification and we don't want to be shoehorned into saying, oh, well, now we have to send another referendum question or this doesn't work because of that referendum question. This is, we adjusted our, we are adjusting our question based on what are you looking for? The question in the end is really a question saying, do you support us looking at different formats for council to do the best job for the students? And the question itself is, do you support the CSU adopting an undergraduate representative council distributed proportionally among the faculties with specified seats allocated for minority groups? Just to break down this question very quickly, undergraduate representative council, because quite frankly, um, I don't want non-undergrads sitting on this council. I don't think uh, having administration or uh, graduate students or random community members, which is another thing I've seen, community members, I don't think that's the idea for the CSU. So undergraduate representative council, uh, distributed proportionally so that everyone has a fair amount, no matter what, uh, no matter what we're talking about. And with the faculties being specified seats allocated for minority groups, the minority groups, again, I'm not specifying what minority groups. Uh, I know there could probably, there will most likely be a push for, let's say a black uh, representative, uh, probably an indigenous one, but I don't know where to draw the line. Again, this is something we have to research going forward. So we're just talking, we wanna add minority groups. We could specify which ones later amongst ourselves and talk about it. I don't wanna say, 
I don't want to list like two, three non-honorary groups and then be like someone brings up after the question passes a really good one and it's like, oh, well, we forgot about that one. So now we're stuck. So again, very open-ended. We could change anything with it as we're going forward. This is to be an open discussion with the faculties about this question, uh, with the question about the question of what to do with council. Uh, it's a long time coming this. We have a very, um, I want to say, I want to say a very uh, prehistoric council on our side here where we haven't changed for a really long time and it's very, very simple. Uh, but sometimes simple is good, who knows. Maybe at the end of the day, we realize that this is actually the best format for the CSU. We don't know, but this is just a question asking the students, do you agree with us looking at our council? And that's pretty much it. So. I guess the motion would be, do you send this question to uh, the question listed in my presentation to referendum? And I suppose if we have a second for that. Second. Second. Caitlin, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, all right, seconded by Shivani um, and Harrison, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to speak in favor of this. Um, it's like Eduardo said, this is an opinion referendum question. So the logistics of it, you know, how many seats we have, what type of seats we have, it's all um, going to be decided. And we're really asking the students here, do you support this? So to my colleagues that may say that, that, that do not support this, they will have the opportunity uh, to vote no and express themselves in the referendum but I believe that all students should have the right to um, to vote on this I think very important topic um, that will that will drastically change our council representation in my opinion for the better thank you thank you uh, Shivani go ahead hi uh, yeah first of all thanks to Eduardo for sending us all those different bylaws even just kind of skimming through it really put into perspective how limited the CSU's current scale of uh, representation by faculty is in relation. Um, yeah, yeah, there are multiple issues with CSU to student disconnect and this could very well be a good way of overcoming that um, to help different conversations move along. So I'm in support of this and having more research done. Uh, one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is I, I was going to ask if there was a preamble, and there is. So I'm just wondering if there's any merit in specifying what representation means. So specifying religious minorities, racialized minorities, accessibility, indigenous, black, LGBT groups, or whatever. But yeah, that's just a comment. And the question is, for those specific seats, who usually, what's the voter population for them? So if it's a like a um, seat for indigenous folks, who votes for that? Is it the entire student body? Or... So that's a very, you see, that's one of the very interesting questions that we've run into when I was researching it is uh, some, based on some, uh, some bylaws, it's an appointed seat. So uh, an indigenous group on campus is going to appoint the indigenous student on campus to the board, uh, which brings up the interesting question of how do you, let's say, impeach a student that's been appointed and not elected. Uh, so this is like, when I say it's a big question, I mean, it's a big question. Uh, other things I've seen are that everyone votes on that. So even if you're not Indigenous, you may vote for the Indigenous student on campus, which is an interesting perspective also to go through it. But really, there's very, like, there's a lot of ways uh, on how it could work and how that voter pool could work. Uh, I've not seen any where they limit the voter pool yet. It's generally one of those two options. Uh, I think limiting the voter pool of, let's say, like, and only Indigenous students can vote for an Indigenous uh, representative brings up an interesting uh, question of who's eligible, who's eligible, are you Indigenous enough to be a, considered a voting member of that? So it gets a little messy there, which is why I think that was, uh, why that's omitted from most of the bylaws and most of the ways going about it. Uh, but yeah, there's again, no real good answer right now. It's about seeing, I guess, when we, let's say we're looking into an indigenous seat, we'd have to look at what indigenous groups on council, um, on Concordia there are. We'd have to see if they are comfortable and capable of appointing someone, if they believe that's the fairest way of doing it. 
Uh, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, or if we just keep it as an election for that anyone could vote in, uh, is that also the way that we just keep it simpler like that? What if there's no indigenous group on campus that wishes to take up the role of appointments? So it's, again, questions to be talked about numerous times over, not once, not twice, not three times, but a lot of times to see what's the, the proper solution to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, James, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so uh, can you bring up the motion, please, again, uh, Eduardo? Yeah. Uh, just a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to propose a, an amendment to kind of harmonize the wording of the preamble and the question mm -hmm. uh, to add the word investigate um, because it kind of harmonizes both sections. So you're talking about the question right now? Or yeah, just... so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you support the issue uh, investigating the adoption, for example, because uh, it harmonizes both sections. Like this. Yeah, the adoption would be the... Oh, sorry. Forgot my verb conjugation. The adoption the of... Of, of the adoption of... I think the adoption of... Yeah. Harmonizing the two sections. Um, is there a second for that amendment? Can I... Can I just say it's friendly? Yeah, so, yeah it friendly means to the, the room, not just to you, though. Um, is there a second for it? Seconded. Second, I think that was Harrison. Um, is there any oh, NAS. oh, NAS, sorry, <laughs> my mistake. Is there any opposition to approving the amendment? Okay, it's approved. Uh, James, continue. Right, so uh, with that, like, I mean, I've been wanting to, like, uh, <laughs> jigger around uh, what council has been doing, like, the, the, the stuff of council. I have a lot of ideas of m myself on how we can, like, proceed. There's a bunch of ideas, like, for example, uh, you know, uh, making the seats department-based instead of faculty-based, for example, mucking around with, like, having, you know, bicameralism a bit uh, so that we can have, like, both uh, proportionally represented uh, and uh, equally represented and all these all these other stuff like investigating how we can like do all this council stuff and I think it's it's a really interesting procedure so I think like with you know it, it's a very good uh, investigation on how to basically update uh, what's a two decade old council system uh, so I think we should go ahead with uh, uh, you know invest like uh, going forward uh, looking into new ways to represent privilege? the students yes uh, it's eight years not 20 years technically. eight years but did did council change substantially Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Like, that's my point. <laughs> was that all, so, James? Yeah. yeah, that was all. All right. Thank you. Um, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah. So on, on the topic of the, uh, the minority seats, my fear is that what will happen is some minorities will just be thrown out the window the moment negotiations start. And I just want your word that say religious minorities and like especially like non-western religions like say uh like say we do have a lot of asian student bodies so like buddhist students like that will be taken into account along with uh with the uh, minority uh political opinions so like that will be taken into account in the uh in the discussions at least yeah so as far as uh again this is a discussion so uh, when you're asking me what my opinion is, is it ways on it? It doesn't really that matter that much because if the room and the committees outvote me, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm thinking I haven't seen as of right now any bylaws that have religious minorities associated on them yet. My personal opinion going forward with religious minorities, either it's an all or nothing thing. So it's like if you're going to add a few religious minorities, you have to add all of them. You can't start picking and choosing religious minorities, which ones to add and which ones not to add. Uh, but yeah, if that's the route where we think that religious minorities deserve a spot on our council, then I think that's the route we're going to take and we're going to have to add all of them in. I'm not sure if that answered your question uh, or your concern, Matthew. I guess but, there really is no reason, no way to really confirm it because it's such a vague question, to be honest. Yeah, so. which is the goal, right? Because like I said, we haven't seen no bylaws have I, have, that I've seen have had a religious minority on it yet. But maybe in the CSU, especially with our, our, uh, I want to say our history where religion has played a, a substantial role in it, especially with our formation and everything, maybe that might be something that the CSU to fit into our perfect count, our ideal council seat is going to have to be considered. 
can I actually like make a make it like not official amendment, but like propose like an idea for amendment? Yeah, go ahead. Which, which is basically we add like a list and we say not notwithstanding or like or not not notwithstanding. Yeah, basically, we, we add like a list of potential options in the preamble, not in the actual question, just like as an example. I wouldn't want to do that personally just because I think then it might like there's a few factors. Uh, the first factor being it might confuse voters. And then they might believe that those are things that we're, we're prioritizing over others. So like, assuming I put a list of uh, like, let's say four or five things, they might look at it and say, oh, well, they're missing the one I care about. So no. So that's something I would want to stay away from. I like the fact that it's vague enough that everyone who wants to have their voice, uh, wants to talk to us about their thing and say, hey, I think this is something you could add, is something that they could add. And uh, yeah, that's my personal opinion is I want to keep it as open-ended as possible when it comes to the minority groups that we're going to be talking about. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shivani, go ahead. Kind of more of a comment, I guess. I feel like uh, maybe to answer Matthew's question, I feel like the way this is going to go is we might look at the cultural groups that are on campus. So there's Kutam for the Tamil folks, there's Hillel for the Jewish folks, there's the Filipino Association as a starter base, maybe, and then also look at um, the different communities that you know have sizable populations across Quebec I feel like is where this will probably go yeah that's all I wanted to say all right thank you okay so if there is nothing further um we can move to a vote and Eduardo do you have the um oh you don't have it up anymore no I'll um, put it up again okay that way we can see the motion no problem <laughs> Right, so the motion um, as amended is on the screen. Um, so first of all, is there any opposition to adopting this motion? Opposition going once, twice. I oppose. Oh, okay. So if there is opposition, then we will move to a roll call vote. Um, so if you're voting yes, it means you're in favor of sending that question to referendum. If you're voting no, it means you are not in favor. And if you're abstaining, then you are abstaining. Uh, Diana, how do you vote? I vote yes. Yes. Uh, Harrison, how do you vote? Yes, and noted, please. Yes, and noted. Uh, Chelsea? Yes. Yes. Howard? Yes. Yes. Jeremiah? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Lauren. Yes. Yes. Zachary. Yes. Yes. Arie. We'll come back to him. Uh, Sarah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Shivani. Yes. Yes. Yasmin. Yasmin. Come back to you, uh, Marlena. It's not here, uh, Chris. Yes, and noted, please. Yes, and noted, <laughs> Matthew. Sorry, I can't support it in the current form. Okay, so no, uh, Sean. Yes. Yes, uh, Anais. Yes, and noted, please. Yes, and noted, uh, James. Uh, yes, and noted, please. Yes, and noted, Desiree. Yes, uh, Hirsch. Abstain. Abstain. Um, are either Arye or Yasmin here? Okay. Um, so if not, uh, the tally of the vote is 14 yes, one no, and one abstention. Um, so that carries. And <laughs> sorry, the question will be sent to a referendum. Is there anything else you wanted to mention, Eduardo? Uh, no, really. If if Matthew would want to just say why he, he felt that the question wasn't uh, fair, just so, because again, this is a big conversation with all of us. So uh, if Matthew feels comfortable just saying why he doesn't support it. Yeah, sure. Um, go honestly, ahead, Matthew, if you want. Honestly, it's just that I feel like the fact that it's too vague sort of leads it to like, especially since it might be a year or two down the line, it, like we have no control over where this goes. And it just, we can't even direct give it direction. And that's just my fear that it ends up going somewhere that no one wants it to go. All right, thank you, Matthew. All right, thank you. 
Um, so if there's nothing further, um, so in that case, um, Eduardo, the next uh, council equality referendum question, uh, that's null and void. Yeah, rescind it, please. Okay. Um, and so at this point we are on uh, K, which is referendum question regarding fee levies or two questions. And uh, Hirsch, this one is yours. Great. So I don't actually have them open in front of me, but the basic idea is that if I ever at some point in the future wish to collect signatures uh, for the removal of their fee levies, I have to present it to council first before collecting signatures per bylaw 9.6, if I recall correctly. So the two uh, questions, I don't have them open in front of me, but the basic idea is uh, removal. Do you support removing the links fee levy and do you support CJLOs? So um, those are the questions with quite a bit of preamble to them. Um, now, as far as CJLO, the original reason for presenting the question had to do with uh, a lawsuit regarding our, what do you call that thing? Um, online opt-out, yes, sorry. Brain working a little funny. Um, yeah, so in the event that they don't ever file the lawsuit, I will at no point um, go ahead and collect the 750 signatures uh, because that's a lot of work for nothing. Um, but in the event that they do file the lawsuit, uh, I feel like that's a useful tool to have available. As far as the links fee levy, I regret putting in the um, preamble that I did as those refer to ongoing litigation and I cannot comment on them. That is all. That was the entire presentation. All right, thank you. Um, we'll try to keep this relatively short since there's no action to be taken. Uh, Harrison, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to say quickly, um, we heard from CJLO, they had a representative that was here before, that clarified that they're, um, that they're having a good relationship with the executive team this year, and that they're, they are not in fact planning on suing us. Uh, so I understand that this may have been a thing of the past back in May or whenever, whenever that was the issue. And uh, obviously, if they do go ahead and do that, um, you know, we can deal with it at that point, but there's no point in opening a can of worms now. We're talking about removing fee levies of student groups that contribute deeply to, um, to, to, student, to the student community uh, at Concordia. So I don't understand why we're talking about opening, you know, <laughs> this topic, this can of worms right now, uh, when there's nothing really to talk about and, and nothing has really happened. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Desiree, go ahead. Well, because nothing is actually being voted on tonight, I'll yield my time. I think we're all tired, but I don't, uh, yeah, that's it. I'll, I won't get into it. Right, thank you. Uh, Eduardo, go ahead. Eduardo? I think he's yeah. good. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to speak to a little bit more just to Hirsch directly on this one because Obviously, the questions he submitted uh, are arguably uh, prejudicial, and that obviously does not lead to to a, a like a good thing. So I could see like those questions being sent to JB by certain people who might be upset with them uh, if you do go forward and collect them in the manner that you are seeing. Uh, the other thing I just want to bring up is like genuine, generally, when things like this occur and uh, people feel like sending in these questions uh just be aware of like <laughs> like as my job to talk to the fee levies quite often uh like last night i did not sleep very much because i got phone call after phone call after phone call then i end up speaking with isaiah for two hours and then i end up getting more phone calls after that and like until three in the morning just talking about fee levies because of these very out of the blue motions that kind of appear which are uh in reality like the nuclear option like there's way there's a lot of ways to get uh, even if you disagree with them there's a lot of ways of going about it before reaching this option um, which causes a lot of drama behind the scenes obviously that a lot of people don't see but obviously people get very upset uh, this is the livelihood of some people who have worked at fee levy groups these fee levy groups for a while uh, some people have been at these fee levy groups for years and years 
so yeah, I just think that whenever you're presenting these things in the future, or if you want to present something like this in the future, I think there has to be a little bit of a more uh, tact tactful way of doing it than what how it was presented. And just if you do collect signatures, I'd be very hesitant on collecting them the way with the question currently formulated as. I was initially going to ask you to reformulate these questions because of that, because I could foresee you collecting a certain amount of signatures, a complaint going to judicial board, and then having you have to restart that process because of the fact that the questions are, are arguably prejudicial uh, in the manner they are currently written. So that's all I would like to say. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Luca, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Hi there. Um, I just had a question to Hirsch. I saw in your um, questions here, question one, um, that there have been several allegations that the link has run smear campaigns against those who tried bringing the opt-out system online. I'm just wondering what exactly are those smear campaigns that you're talking about? Thank you. I've mentioned before that refers to ongoing litigation. I cannot comment. Right, but if they're, you know, smear campaigns are public things, right? Is there anything that, you know, just because as a member of the media and, you know, of course, my organization is implicated in the second one, trying to keep that out of this here. I'm just wondering, you know, what are the smear campaigns that you're referring to here? As I said, I cannot comment. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, so if there is nothing further on this agenda point, um, we can move on to the CSU operations budget question. And Hirsch, this one's yours again. Oh, wonderful. All right. So um, let me dig that up. Oh, yeah. So actually, the, the one that the wording that's in the um, documents that were sent out is a bit wrong. Um, I'll mention the changes that uh, need to be made when I get to them. So whereas there is a demand from the CSU's members for a net reduction in tuition, whereas the CSU ought to show some form of, of uh, sorry, whereas the CSU ought to show some form of solidarity with tuition decrease demands, whereas the finance committee has found that it is possible to reduce the operating fee to $2.06 and still maintain a surplus, where it is, it is prudent to leave some leeway Whereas bylaw 11.2 states that the Council of Representatives shall have the sole authority to propose the amount of a fee, be it resolved that the following question be sent to referendum. The CSU operating fee is a fee that all students registered in undergrad courses at Concordia must pay. In 2019-2020, in it was $2.21 per credit. Uh, the <laughs> per credit part is kind of important. Uh, do you support reducing the fee to $2.11 per credit effective winter 2021. Be it further resolved that the budgetary impact of this motion is an, ex an expected reduction of 15,000 of these yeah. budgetary surplus. Thank you. Do we have a second for this motion? Point of information? Yeah. Doesn't he have changes? Um, did you want to state what the changes were, Hirsch? Oh, yeah. The changes were the per words per credit. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Document yeah. Sent out. yeah, so instead it would be $2.21 per credit, $2.11 per credit, and $2.06 per credit, I presume? Uh, yeah. Well, okay. the whereas, it doesn't really matter. It matters in the referendum question. Yes. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, is there a second for this motion? Second going once. Second, going twice. Uh, which motion is this? The one um, that Hirsch just read, uh, the CSU operating fee. <laughs> yeah, so it just, it needs a second, anyone? If not, it dies. Okay, so if there's no second, then the motion, um, dies right away. Is there any discussion to be had? Uh, well, I guess um, it does bear stating the fact that we can afford to reduce the fee. Um, there is an obvious demand to reduce the fee. 
it will not affect, it will not make any changes to our budget. So a little disappointed that, well, anyway. Um, I mean, I can allow a couple of speakers if we want to. Well, if the, if there's no motion on the table, we can, we can, we can just go to the next point. That's fair. Like, does anyone have anything super relevant to say? If not, we can move on. Well, I just want to mention one thing um, in terms of the fact that we're not standing in solidarity with the terms of um, lowering tuition. I just want to clarify for, for counselors or for everyone who's here who wants to know maybe a bit about it, but there's work being done regarding lowering tuition. There's work being done with the other faculties in order to have the administration lower the tuition and find different ways to like actually take money away from things that don't necessarily need to be funded. So obviously the CSU is something that like for students, um, created for students by students. As Harrison was saying, most things that are very effective are for students by students. So I think taking money away from us and taking money from our budget and our impact is not necessarily the right move, but we need to continue to work together in order to make the right demands and have the right procedure to have the administration lower the cost where it deems necessary. And one of the big examples of that is they, they gave everybody back, I think it was $17 each. And that money was taken out from like the recreational, like a uh, student's athletic and rec 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 wow. <laughs> recreational, which is obviously dramatic because that's more money for the students. So yeah, so I just want to kind of emphasize and really like remind you guys that this is obviously something that as executives we're working on, we're not oblivious to. And it's something that is obviously extremely, extremely important in terms of where the money is going to be coming out of when we're taking that money away um, in our tuition. Um, and yeah, that's just kind of something I wanted to maybe just state. So we have I'm sorry, I hate to ask this type of question, but I'm just kind of lost because um, in terms of the agenda, um, why are, I thought we were doing like the returning business prior to the new business. And I am, if I'm not mistaken, also we had a vote on, we, we voted to put closed ballot after, um, I don't remember, but we voted first to, ask to put this up. So that yeah, there was there was phrase secret ballot as the first thing on returning business. Um, so we just I, I don't think appointments are going to take too long. Okay. Um, and then we'll be right to secret ballot. Got it. Thanks for clarifying. No problem. <laughs> um, so I guess if there's nothing further, I can lower everyone's um, hand. Just just point of information. Yeah, Did that motion not pass? Because it didn't that motion not pass? Because it required a. Yeah, it, 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 it died because it's not a second. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I'm talking about the um, the secret ballot. Do, 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 do. Uh, no, it wasn't three quarters to, it's three quarters to add anything on the agenda. This was just bumping okay. up, so it, it still passed. Mm. Um, okay, so at this point we are on appointments. Um, Usually, if I might make a recommendation when there's a lot of um, resignations right before um, by election, some of the seats are open for by election, but it's always up to council. Um, so I guess we can start out with the Loyola committee and Malcolm. Hey, um, so yeah, there's a seat open on the Loyola committee. Um, it's, um, uh, if anyone has, ex uh, has experience on Loyola campus, um, it's, it's helpful to know, I guess, being on campus to give suggestions on what we could do throughout the year to help these students. Um, but yeah, the community is pretty relaxed. Uh, obviously, there's no on-campus activities, so uh, we're just trying to figure out ways around that. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to nominate themselves or someone else to Loyola committee? going once guys it's one of the best committees i sat on it for two years i swear you guys are gonna have a good time um this is nice. for someone who like i don't have like loyola experience so like you can get loyola experience you can always learn i don't have loyola experience and i still joined the the, the committee because i think it it gives you like a great opportunity to just be a little bit unbiased about things and still like take good decisions because you're going to just listen to what students think without your personal opinion like uh your personal opinion conflicting with the student's opinion you know so maybe this is just an opportunity to work on your yeah whatever that's that's all i have to say yeah um, and once again, I think we've got seven counselors coming in in by-election, seven or nine. Um, so if these don't get filled, we can always fill them in, in a couple of weeks, months, in a month. Yeah, I think we should wait. 
for that if, if no one's interested now. Okay, so if there's no interest, we can move on to policy committee. Uh, Sarah, this one's yours. Hi right, guys, a policy committee, we pass policies pertaining to any important union issues like we did tonight. <laughs> um, so as you saw the policy on like standing order and council committees and all of that policy is really great. We meet every Monday at 6 p.m. once a week. Um, if you're interested, come and join. Uh, I'd like to nominate Sarah. All uh, right, is uh, Sarah's, oh yeah, she's here. Um, do you consent to the nomination? Uh, yes. Okay, <laughs> is there anyone else who wants to nominate themselves or someone else? Um, for policy committee? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll nominate myself. Okay, so Sarah and Jeremiah, is there anyone else? Okay, um, if not, we can just go to, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 second motivations. Uh, Sarah, why do you want to sit on policy committee? Uh, yeah, so I really just want to get more involved this year. Um, I'm currently only on one committee. Um, and I know I'm a little shy in these bigger council meetings, so you may not know me super well, but I thrive better in smaller committees. I have experience being a student at large on two committees. Um, I'm an executive for the Students Philosophy Association. I work for ASFA, so I have a pretty good grasp on policy in general. Um, and as a woman with a disability, I'm really passionate about accessibility, and I really want to bring that perspective to the policy committee. Um, that's something I'm really passionate about. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jeremiah? Um, considering that like Sarah has similar interests to what I have and like in terms of what she wants to do. And also I have a lot of committees that I'm already on. I'm going to withdraw my nomination. All right. Um, so that is okay. Uh, sh uh, Daniel, go ahead. I just want to motivate for Sarah's um, nomination on this committee. She's on the appointments committee and we don't really have much work to do anymore this uh, year, pretty much. So um, it'd be great for her to get a chance to be on other committees. Um, and I've seen, you know, she's been on Clubs in Space last year. So she definitely has relevant experience with policies. All right, thank you. And Shivani? Um, I'd like to appoint Sarah to policy. Okay, um, do we have a second to appoint? Here. Jeremiah, is there any opposition to appointing Sarah to the policy committee? Opposition. All right, so that carries unanimously. And Sarah, congratulations, you are on the policy committee. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so at this point, we are on the clubs and space committee. And Daniel, this one's yours. All right, hi, everyone. Um, so the Clubs and Space Committee, basically, we meet every second week. Um, I base it off everyone's availability. So once we get the two new people in, um, we'll see what day works best for everybody on a weekday. Um, the work that we do is we approve um, all of our clubs' constitutions, their budget proposals, um, any office space issues, and any other you know, admin concerns that we have with our clubs. Um, it's a very enriching experience, I think, at least for myself, because you get to see what all of these bright students are doing um, every day, especially now with COVID, like you'd think that not many are being as active, but they're just so creative. So it really is a great community to be on. Um, I personally think we have fun, but I also talk a lot during that committee. So maybe it's because I like to hear myself think probably. So I don't know. But I, if anyone does want to join this uh, committee, I think it would be really fun. Just know that you can't be um, an executive or like, like in, heavily involved like, in a club um, since it would be kind of a conflict of interest. But besides that, I really recommend anybody else to come. All right, thank you. Um, is there anyone who wants to nominate themselves or someone else to the Clubs and Space Committee? Nominations go in once. I wanted to nominate Sarah Bumenheimer. Is she still um, interested? Uh, do you consent to the nomination? I do, yes. Great. Um, so if there's no one else who wants to nominate themselves, uh, why do you want to sit on the Clubs and Space Committee? Um, so basically everything I said before, but also that I do have experience being on the uh, Clubs and Spaces Committee. And also I've been involved in clubs in the past. Um, so I do have a pretty good grasp on um, what clubs generally need or want. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, is there anyone else who wants to speak? Okay. Um, so if not, we just need a motion to approve Sarah as uh, to the Clubs and Space Committee. I'll move to approve Sarah to the Clubs and Space Committee. 
Motion to approve. Daniel, do we have a second? Second. Second. Second by Harrison. Is there any opposition? Okay, so that carries unanimously. Um, there's still one seat open, so that will show up again uh, next meeting like a ghost. Um, so now we are at Senate. Actually, about that one seat, can I nominate uh, Chris Saccarella? Sure. Do you Thanks. consent to the nomination? Uh, yeah, I consent. Okay. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wants to nominate anyone? Oh, right. Uh, Margo had to drop out because something came up, but she said she was interested, so I don't really know how that works now. Do you have her consent to nominate? I have the message she sent. Oh, okay. Okay, that's good then. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess in this case, now we have three nominees. Um, so Sarah's already approved. Um, so currently we have one seat open with uh, Chris and Margot nominating. Or being Sorry, nominated. what committee is this? Clubs in Space. Never mind. That, that was for Senate. Ah, my mistake. <laughs> All right. So Chris, why do you want to sit on the Clubs in Space committee? Uh, well, I, I just want like more experience when it comes to that domain at school, like how the whole process works. Um, Daniel also mentioned like when it comes to budgets and stuff and I'm doing that currently. So I have experience with that. And yeah, I just want to see all the operations and all that, get to know more people, help them out as much as possible. And uh, yeah, like make clubs do as many goals as possible as well. All right, thank you. Um, so if there's nobody else uh, who wants to speak, we just need a motion to approve Chris uh, to the Clubs and Space Committee. Motion to approve Chris to Clubs and Space Committee. Motion seconded. Daniel seconded. I think that was Shivani. Yeah. Um, is there any opposition to approving Daniel? Uh, to approving Daniel to approving Chris um, to the Clubs and Space Committee? I second Daniel. <laughs> okay. So if there is nothing, <laughs> there is uh, no opposition. Then uh, congratulations, Chris. You are on the Clubs and Space Committee, and we have filled our two seats. Um, so now, uh, following, I think it was. Page's resignation, but I'm blanking on who was on Senate. Um, nah, Natalia. Natalia, that was it. Um, Sarah, this one is yours. We have a seat open. Sarah? Isaiah, I think you sit on Senate. I Anyone do. want to talk about Senate? So for those of you who, oh, wait, where am I? For those of you who don't know, Senate is the highest academic body, um, governing body in Concordia. You will work with myself, the, AC the AA coordinator, Sarah, and in order to, and the other senators to kind of push the student agenda and kind of like um, hopefully like support students at the, um, in academic, through changing different policies. Um, creating different initiatives and working on several committees to kind of like just push the student agenda forward. Well, we're dealing with stuff like accessibility issues, trying to make sure that um, the quality of education is taken more into consideration given all the Zoom stuff. All right, thank you. Um, so Shivani, you'd said that Margot wanted to be nominated to Senate? Yes. Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to nominate themselves or someone else to Senate? Um, I'm going to nominate myself. Okay, so Jeremiah, um, is there anyone else? Okay, uh, so if there's no one else, we'll move to motivations. Uh, Jeremiah, why do you oh, want to- Oh, wait, wait, yes? one more contextual cue. Set it okay. every Friday, 2 p.m. Like not every Friday, <laughs> they meet once a month, like once a month, Friday, and academic caucus meetings are also set Friday at 2 p.m. So and they're- super obligatory right they're obligate like that's it's the role because like um the academic caucus is where the senators meet to kind of like um to kind of like strategize and like see what how we're going to do the work or what we're going to work on type of thing so you need to be available every friday like every friday that there's a senate and the actual like academic caucus meetings on the fridays 2 p.m all right thank you for clarifying um so jeremiah why do you want to sit on senate um, well, I think I ran for this like a few months back, uh, like when we were, when we were filling out the seats, like back in March or whatever, I ran for this. Um, I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to have a position on this. I wanted to have a different perspective coming from someone who, 
you know, sort of has a different perspective overall because I have Asperger's and I see that as something that's different, not as a disability as some other people might see it. Um, that being said, I do also have a disability, but uh, epilepsy. And so I feel like overall, this just gives me a different perspective and I want to bring that to the Senate. Um, that doesn't make me biased in any way, but I just want to bring a different perspective overall. And that's how I want to operate. But I assure you I will do a good job if I get the nominee. All right, thank you. Um, and Margo is not here. Shivani, do you have anything from Margo? I do not have any motivation, no. Um, but at least from talking and kind of working in parallel with Margo, uh, you know, she seems very kick-ass and very competent and <laughs> very adept at policy. And that is all I can say at the top of my head. Can I motivate you for her since I worked with her on council for a bit? Or Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we can motivate for other people too. Well, I'm just going to motivate for Margo given that she's not here and she is a really hard worker and she's someone who's cared about the Concordia Student Union for longer than I can even get into details about. She's very good with policy. She's very, very professional when it comes to talking to admin and, and really like getting her point across. Um, and I know it's something that would be really important to her and it's something that obviously she cares about given that she's been on the CSU as long as she has been. And she's someone who really does push um, first of all, she pushes her sexual violence agenda to ensure that students are safe on campus. She pushes to ensure that students are considered in all capabilities. So she's very, as we were saying before, accessibility is a huge thing on campus and she's always been the first person to kind of bring that up. Um, and yeah, I just overall very well-rounded, well very um, conscious of everybody's kind of struggles and stuff like that. So yeah, just kind of wanted to give a bit of motivation for her since she wasn't here. All right, thank you. Um, so, oh, uh, that's Victoria, your hands up again. Um, does anyone else want to say anything? Okay, so if not, uh, we can move to a vote. Um, so since there are two um, nominees for one seat, we'll go by secret ballot. So I will turn off the recording or pause the recording. No, thank you. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. I don't think we went too long without recording. Um, so yes, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so if no one has any questions about CEO appointment, um, then we can move on to our returning business um, to the secret ballot motion. And Desiree, this one's yours. Thank you. Uh, can you give me just a, a minute? Actually, Thank do you me. mind if we take like a one minute recess? I well, don't mind at all. <laughs> it was more like, do you mind if I run? More like five that? minutes. Yeah, yeah, five minutes is fine. Okay, if five minutes is, is amenable, we can do that. All right, see you all in five minutes.
All right, folks, are we ready to get started? <laughs> Desiree, are you all good to go? I'm good to go, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna read this two seconds. I feel a, I heard myself is, okay, sorry. My computer was on at the same time, that's why. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll read the motion. Yeah, go ahead. Whereas currently secret ballots can be enacted by any council member as soon as they ask, whereas no secret ballot policy can be found, whereas Robert Rules outlines the use of secret ballot is habitually used in connection with elections and trials, and sometimes for the selection of the next place for meeting of a convention, whereas Robert Rules requires a simple majority for all motions to pass, be it resolved that a secret ballot request needs a simple majority to be enacted. Be it further resolved that budgetary impact is no. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, do we have a second for the motion? Second. Second by Harrison. Uh, your motivation, Desiree? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, as was mentioned earlier, I've already spoken about this motion, uh, I forget when, I think earlier in the summer. Uh, currently, there's no policy, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but currently there's no policy that exists in our sending regulations and bylaws about secret ballot. It was voted on a few years ago and has stayed ever since. Um, as I've talked about in the past, I don't want secret ballots to disappear. That's really not the point. Secret ballot is a very important tool to, you know, um, well, first to, to vote committee members in and also for votes that are a bit more contentious and, and controversial and Last time when we spoke, there was a big fear about her being harassed and being bullied online. And, you know, I, I sympathize for pe to people who are afraid of the impact of their vote. Uh, to that, there's two things I want to say. First, um, secret ballot would still be possible. With this motion, you would simply need a majority to have it enacted. So if ever there's a vote on the bill <coughs> that... Um, the you voicing your opinion might result in you getting bullied online you can literally say that hey i feel i fear me voicing my opinion will get me bullied online and then people will decide take a decision with that uh, but at the same time secondly uh, we were all elected right we're all student representatives so i think we should reflect as to what types of votes we're trying to hide if it's a very, very controversial thing, okay, maybe it's worth enacting secret ballot. But if it's just something that you don't want your name attached to because you're ashamed of your vote, that's, I don't think council should stand for those types of, uh, of situations. So yeah, please vote for this motion. Essentially, again, this is not making it disappear. It's simply making sure that if ever someone wants secret ballot to be enacted, Council votes on it as we vote on literally everything else. I just don't want secret ballot to be thrown left and right every time someone wants to hide their vote. All right, thank you. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. I have three amendments to propose. Um, so I'll motion them and then motion to split them. Okay. Uh, motion, well, amendment number one is that secret ballots, uh, rather than having them automatically trigger a vote, um, just simply allow someone to call a vote to oppose them. Uh, amendment two is that the vote to oppose a secret ballot must be held in secret ballot um, for obvious reasons. Uh, if we're talking about situations where people are concerned with um, intimidation, then you would obviously need to have it the vote to occur in secret ballot. And the third clause is that a vote to block a secret ballot require uh, two thirds majority. So a vote for a secret ballot would be 50% and then a vote to block it would be two thirds? No, no, no. So let me go through that again. The first thing is that we don't have votes for secret ballot. If someone calls a secret ballot, the, there exists the possibility for someone else to call a vote to oppose it. So instead of automatically triggering a vote, it would trigger, you would allow, open the possibility, it doesn't necessarily trigger a vote, but it would open the possibility of someone calling a vote to oppose it. 
Uh, can I directly I, respond? Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out if that's in the spirit of the motion. I feel I feel it's just circling around to exactly the same thing. It's it's just if ever someone like calls for a secret ballot, I feel Hirsch solution has the <laughs> possibility of a counselor to say no, I don't want secret ballot, and then we vote instead of someone wants secret ballot and then council votes on it or council can just all be in favor of doing secret ballot. That's also a possibility, right? Like we've done that often or if everyone's on board, then we just do it. Um, could you, could you make some wording for it, Hirsch? Just so that there's a functional be it resolve clause. Sure. And then we can look at that. Oh, sorry, my dog's barking. Oh. I actually don't have uh, have the motion. Uh, give me a minute to write this up. I'll write the motion in the chat. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, that'd be good. <clears throat> Own dog. <laughs> okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, Caitlin, point of yeah. information. Yeah. Uh, it, this is a question for Hirsch. Uh, wouldn't like a double negative just be a positive in the end? <laughs> no. What's the question? Like, if you think of what you're proposing as in math, you're proposing the same thing as Desiree. Uh, well, okay. There's three components to what I'm proposing, but the first component is not the same because it requires, uh, what do you call it? It, it, give me a minute to, <laughs> okay, yeah. So what is currently being proposed is that a secret ballot request needs, uh, automatically needs a vote. Um, the, the thing, what I'm suggesting is to replace that with a secret ballot may be challenged by vote, or a vote may be called to challenge a secret ballot. Point of information? Yes, Isaiah. Okay. Like, well, I guess this is repeating what NIA said, but doesn't that in itself vote? Like, regardless, either way, you're initiating a vote. Uh, yes, but the question, no, no, <laughs> it doesn't, because in the event that the question is, does someone actually oppose it? But wouldn't that be the no when you vote? Hence, yes, yes. when abstain? Yeah, that's the thing. I feel, Hirsch, if ever, let's say I want to call a secret ballot and then automatically there's a vote, then if no one on council wants like, to vote Caitlin against secret ballot, like, then it's fine. Caitlin will literally say any opposition? Yeah. And well, then... the, the main question here is, uh, regardless of, well, depending on what numbering you have, either two thirds or simple majority, what happens in the event of, let's assume for argument's sake, simple majority, what happens if it's exactly a tie? Does the motion fail or pass? It fails because you need 50 plus one, not 50. Right. So that's where the part uh, about the difference between a vote to challenge a motion for secret ballot and a vote to have a motion for secret ballot is a massive difference. I don't, I don't think so. Like, I, get, I get it because you're trying to get the base to be like, oh, if it's a tie, then we automatically get a secret ballot. But I think the question, I think the normal issue is that the resting state, the resting state is that votes are done in open. So then <laughs> special case, if they need to be closed. All right. The, the, we want to try to protect. Secret ballot? Aria, uh, Aria, can you please mute yourself? No, but you are. Oh, I think he had a question. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I, I thought you were just unmuted. Sorry. Right. So if no. I can answer the question mentioned earlier, um, yes, we do. Like the goal here is that if you have exactly at the fifty-fifty threshold or the equivalent, uh, where some counselors are saying we don't we don't necessarily feel safe with this being an open, uh, um, an open ballot. And some are saying, nah, we're totally cool with it being an open ballot. We don't particularly, we kind of disagree with your assessment of this. Um, we would generally want to err, err on the side of protecting the people who are concerned. So 
that yes, is a that is the and, difference in the and guidance. then the people who want to be protected can say hey i feel uncomfortable can we bring a secret ballot and then you I, I think <laughs> i'm not sure how to say this nicely but okay maybe you should stop right how, there then. Um, so right now we have an amendment. Um, so is that all you wanted to add, Hirsch, via, for the result that a vote may be called to challenge a motion for secret ballot? Right. So that was the first amendment. The second okay. amendment uh, was that a, a vote for whether or not we have secret ballot must be in secret ballot. And the third was to switch the threshold for blocking a secret ballot from 50% to 33%. Uh, the threshold for blocking a secret ballot is what? Well, as it was presented by Desiree, the threshold for blocking would be 50. I'd like to lower that to 33. Okay, so do you want to vote on these individually? Uh, yeah, that would make sense. Okay, so we will start with um, the be it resolved that a vote may be called to challenge a motion for a secret ballot. So that's the one, the, the first one that's written. Um, so do we have a second? Do we have a second for uh, be it further resolved that a vote may be called to challenge a motion for a secret ballot? <clears throat> second, anyone? I'll do it. Okay, so seconded by James. Um, and I think, Kirsch, you explained it already. Is there anything else you want to add about it? Uh, no, not really. Okay, um, so first of all, um, is there any opposition to adding that a vote may be called to challenge a motion for secret ballot? Yes. Okay, um, so in that case, we will move to a vote. Um, so if you're voting yes, it means you want to add the clause about um, people being allowed to challenge the motion for secret ballot. If you're voting no, it means you do not want to add that. And if you're abstaining, it means you are abstaining. Um, Harrison, how do you vote? I vote no for the amendment. No, uh, Chelsea. I vote no. No, Howard. Mm. I think I'll abstain for the amendment. Abstain, Jeremiah. I vote no because I want the the uh, <laughs> block uh, threshold to be higher. Okay, uh, Lauren. No. No, Zachary. No. No, uh, Arie. No. No, Sarah. No. No, Shivani. No. No, uh, Marlena. I don't think he's here. Chris? No. No. Uh, Matthew? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Sean? No. No. Anais? No. No. Uh, James? James? We'll pass. Uh, Desiree? <laughs> James, how do you vote? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Desiree, how do you vote? No. No. And Hirsch? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the um, tally is one yes, 12 no, and three abstentions. Um, so the amendment fails, um, and we're on the second amendment, which was be it resolved that a secret ballot, a vote for a secret ballot must be in secret ballot. Hey, <laughs> second amendment. Second, uh, second, wait, James, you're seconding the amendment? No, no, I, I just, I just did a keck at second amendment. Uh, anyone want to second the amendment? Um, hey, uh, yes? Can you, mo can you procedurally motion three amendments in one go? Yeah, because he moved to split them. And oh, I second the uh, secret. So wait, 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 what's the amendment? What's the what's the amendment? It's be a resolved that a vote for secret ballot must be in secret ballot. Oh yes, yes, I second the amendment. Okay. Um, is there any opposition to this amendment? Um, yes. Okay. So we'll go through the list. Uh, Harrison, how do you vote? <laughs> so just a reminder, if you're voting yes, if you want secret ballot, 
the vote to do a secret ballot to be in secret ballot. If you're voting no, it means you do not. And if you're abstaining, uh, I, you're abstaining. I, I, I don't understand why there is not a discussion before voting, even if it's an amendment. I don't understand. I was trying to save time. Um, but uh, but that's, that's the purpose. If I want to talk, it's related to that. It's not why. Yeah, why sure. Can I discuss it? Huh? Um, sure. If, uh, yeah, go ahead, Ari, if you want to discuss it. Uh, can I motivate? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Right. So in the event that you're calling a secret ballot for um, concerns of, um, what do you call it, intimidation, retaliation, and so on, uh, there is sort of an implied, well, the fact that you're holding the vote itself in open session kind of defeats the purpose. All right. Thank you. Uh, are you? Yeah, uh, a secret ballot exists uh, in every single democratic institution to have the right to vote without fear, intimidation, or we know, a harassment. Then, um, from the moment I have to explain why I want to second ballot, I have to disclose my vote. So it's, it's, it's stupid because I, 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 I feel harassed. So, and I have to explain, is that like asking a, a woman who has been violated, why, why, he, why she feel like that? And, and she needs a majority to, to have the right to express herself. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and so yeah, it's, it's, I need a majority to not be harassed. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, I mean and, and this has already been discussed uh, uh, two meetings ago. So it's just yeah, because uh, uh, the council that, that has been this that uh, she's going to win. So in, if, if, in, in, in three months, if this change, I will bring this uh, again. So this is uh, very childish. It, it has already been voted. This. Right, thank you. Um, is there any more discussion on this amendment? Discussion or move to vote? Can, can I say something about Yeah, the sure, go ahead. I think this has been echoed multiple times, but the name, the reason why, the only reason we're having this is because it's been, the secret ballot is not just because you don't want to show your vote at every single, whether it be diversity motion or when you have an, um, an opinion that you just like, oh, let's go secret ballot. Like at the end of the day, all of like, we're a public company. We're a public organization, non-for-profit. You guys are the directors of this corporation, non-for-profit, whatever it was, and you have to be accountable for your decisions. So if people were not using secret ballots left, right, and center, we wouldn't be having this discussion. As you see, we use secret ballots for when appointing peers for, so that people don't hold resentment for who voted for who. But I'm like, for every, the, the reason why you came here was to make these decisions. And if you spend a little less time offending people and thinking about what you're going to say and how you're going to say and why you want to vote, how you want to vote, I don't think, I personally, professionally don't think that people are going to come after you. But if you keep on offending people and want to use this channel and this platform to say whatever you want and then just vote behind closed doors, I don't know why you're here. So you I'm like, I justify the harassment. You're justifying the harassment, that's what you're doing, saying. Then they are I mean because the way I vote, that's what you're saying. Can I finish? Okay, yeah, go ahead, Isaiah. I already said that. Okay, okay, let, let I, it's Isaiah's speaker turn. All right, so it's not, I'm not justifying any type of harassment, but harassment's a two way street. Having to come here, be mandated to come here once, twice a month, and then plus SEMs and get disrespected, that's harassment. But we put up with it in strides. People have said some deplorable things throughout this whole mandate. People are using metaphors and similes, using people's experiences as if it's just, oh, trivial discussion. I get it, people get upset, but I'm like, we have, if you, want a, if you want a long list of things to be upset about, we can talk after this meeting. But the issue here is as student representatives, you shouldn't be, your first priority is to be accountable to the student body, the same way the executives are accountable to the council. I can't go the same way James came and I put a motion in my report that everyone's supposed to read. I can't go and pass these motions behind closed doors because I'm afraid of getting shamed or harassed by people. I don't have that luxury. I have to open, we have to work in, in the light of day and show our stuff. That's what transparency is. That's what accountability is. If you don't want to be accountable, and if you want to say 
and vote the way you're doing to fit whatever agenda or whatever, whatever you're doing, whether it's yours or another peer's, go find another place because this is not the place or time for this. It's already 11, 11 o'clock at night. Thank God we're halfway through the agenda, but this shouldn't be an issue. Put a vote if you need a secret ballot. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, so Ari, like I've had people on, like I've, I've dealt with harassment a little bit, just preventing secret ballots. Like it's not the only way to deal with harassment. <laughs> Obviously, like, I went and found whatever person was making posts about me and whatnot, contacted whoever was part of the page and had them take it down. Like, don't think that you're limited on dealing with this just purely through this method. Like there's other ways to help with harassment on council. So just think smart about what to do and find other ways to skin a cat. All right, thank you. Um, so do we wanna keep discussing the amendment uh, that the vote for secret ballot must be in secret ballot or move to a vote? Um, can I add something? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, personally, I think having, sorry, it took me just a few seconds to understand exactly the second amendment of first proposal, but voting in secret ballot to enact secret ballot, um, personally, I'd be against it because it goes against the spirit of the initial motion. And bringing, the reason why I brought this motion back, it's not because I'm trying to be petty or childish, it's because I believe in transparency and accountability. And currently, as I've said, there's no policy that really enforces this. We're just doing this because we've been doing it. And a lot of people believe that it's time for change. And no one on council, I mean, if you've ever met me, you'll understand I really am not, I don't encourage harassment. I don't encourage like literally any type of negative behavior. So that's not why I want this to be enacted. I don't hope that everyone is gonna have a name attached to their votes and then people can hashtag them and everywhere. I just wanna make sure that when there is a reason for a secret ballot to be enacted, council members have a vote on whether or not they want it to be enacted because there has been many instances in council where secret ballot is just thrown left and right just because someone doesn't want their name attached to a vote not because it's a controversial issue, but because they're not transparent and they don't want to be held accountable for what they're attaching their name to. <laughs> so that's it. I agree, but the problem is when you have to disclose, that's the problem. I agree with what you said. The problem is when you have to disclose why you want the closer, but that's the problem. Well, if you don't want to disclose, then you your motivation will be no. Let's say you want a secret ballot. Okay, okay, okay. Folks, I, think, I think we're getting a bit too much into the back and forth. Um, do we want to keep discussing this amendment or move to a vote? Move to a vote. Okay, so if there's no further discussion, um, I'd already asked before if there was opposition, so there was. So um, if you're voting yes, it means that you want uh, votes for secret ballot to be in secret ballot. If you're voting no, it means you do not. And if you abstain, it means you are abstaining. I would like um, to have a secret ballot. You, you would like to have, sorry? A secret ballot. Okay, so um, in that case, since that's the only policy we have for secret ballot, um, we will do it in secret ballot. Uh, if I forget to <laughs> restart the recording after, please remind me um, the recording. Um, all right, so the uh, motion or the amendment fails. And then um, the third amendment that you have, Hirsch, was contingent on the first one. <clears throat> so that one we can't really vote on. Um, so in that case, we will move on to the next person. James, go ahead. Oh, what, this is for the main, yeah. main motion? Yeah, the main motion. Wasn't there also an amendment to make it 33%? But the first, the or amendment. 66%? It was to have it 33%, but the amendment to have a, a blocking vote failed. So the 33 required to have the blocking vote has to fail also. Oh, I, I thought those were separate, like to have the two thirds majority to enact it. Okay, fine. We're, if we're back on the main motion, we're back to the main motion. Um, <laughs> can, can I just have a moment to gather my thoughts? Yeah, no problem. 
Cause I can ask it's, yeah, because yeah, can you can you just put me back on the list at the end? <laughs> sure, no problem. Thanks. Uh, Hadassa, you are next. Hello, oh, hi. Hi. Um, sorry, I just don't understand why the fifty-fifty vote, like it was tied in the middle, and it then it didn't pass. Um, I don't really follow that. Yeah, um, I can explain that. It's because um, uh, motions that require a simple majority require a 50% plus one. Um, so if you have like four people voting yes and four people voting no, you need the actual majority, so the five to pass. Um, I just, I'm so used to doing secret ballot for nominations that I immediately said it, there's, it's a tie because um, for nominations it's different. Um, but in the end, it was a... Um, and not, not a past vote. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. A simple majority. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, James. Oh, is that the entire list? Okay, so... Sorry, the entire list. Sorry, I didn't hear that. I thought you said next. Oh, no, no, no. I said put me at the end so I can gather my thoughts from the whole late thing. Oh, no problem. Uh, Zachary, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to motivate a bit in uh, in favor of this of, of this motion. Um, so I mean, as some people here may or may not be aware, um, this council um, for a while, or and especially now, um, it has a bit of an image problem. <laughs> and I mean, frankly, it's not being helped by um, having much of a frivolous uh, secret ballot votes. Um, I mean, I mean, a lot of people here like to imagine like we're just like a little club or whatever, but in, in reality, we are elected representatives of our individual student bodies with mandates for the students we represent. You know, I, I represent uh, independent students and, you know, I think the independent students that are represent um, deserve to know how I vote, um, you know, like, you know, any other, uh, sort of representative democracy, you know, in the House of Commons, you know, we, they, they don't do frivolous votes in the National Assembly, they don't do frivolous secret ballot votes. Um, so I, you know, we, we really need to, you know, to, to, to solve this, 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 you know, students don't have, really have trust in us, you know, we, and I, I think we really need more transparency in this council. So I would encourage um, my colleagues to vote for um, this, uh, this motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chelsea, go ahead. I just wanted to motivate for this motive for this motion as like I completely agree with Desiree. Like we're student representatives, which means we need to be able to be held accountable by students. And this motion just makes it easier to do so. Obviously, you know, by by vote we we can. Um, we can make it so that, you know, if necessary, we can do a secret ballot. But in my opinion, in the past, it hasn't always been the best, the best for the student body. It has been more of a personal gain to, um, to do a secret ballot. So I just wanted to add uh, my opinion on that too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Arya, go ahead. Arya? I will come back to you. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. I, I am not oh. going to speak. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I am not going to speak. Okay, uh, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate just what was said um, already with um, Zach and Desiree. I think it's really important for our student population to just know exactly, you know, the discussions that we're having because most of the time students are like, what's going on um, with these certain situations? And I think it's our duty as people on this council to ensure that students know exactly what we're voting on, exactly how our even own political system is stated eloquently by Zach. Um, we know about what's voted on and what's transparent because it's like our duty to know as citizens, it's our, it's the student's duty to know, also our duty to know about what's going on within our own council. That way they can tell us feedback about how we should you know be delivering information instead of this you know um kind of gray zone area is what i'd say so you know if this is happening you know in other countries or other student unions we shouldn't have this issue 
like whatsoever. So thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. Okay, so I'll start off by saying that um, there have been cases where, you know, people have faced threats and whatnot. And I mean, we've all seen what the uh, solidarity with those looks like, and it is remarkably disappointing. So, uh, yeah, I'll leave that. I'll leave that as is. Um, yeah, this this strikes me as a motion designed with the goal of enabling bullying and uh, whatever you do, you. Thank you. Uh, Isaiah, go ahead. Yeah, um, what's it called? Um, Sarah, Desiree, Anna, Zach, they said it all. It's about accountability. It's no one's about, no one's about bullying, but it's also about kind of like just mutual respect for people's time. Calling a secret ballot, like just in a point itself, people are calling secret ballots just for the sake of secret ballot to prove a point. And that in itself takes time. Think about Caitlin. She's, she's chairing these Zoom meetings and this Zoom fatigue. Every vote, she has to turn off the recording. She has to go and collect them each and every time, whether or not. Like, it's just more so we can keep the process going. We keep discussions fair amongst each other and we don't attack each other. We just get to the point and you express without, I emphasize on without offending others. And it shouldn't be that hard, but all right, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, James, it's your turn now. All right, so uh, I think I'd like to begin to say this, um, to saying uh, the fact that um, I, I can guarantee, right, that at least a few of the, uh, of the motions that went through on secret pallet only passed um, because they went to secret ballot. Uh, because there's a lot of kind of like the one of the things that you know we have to kind of remember that uh, you know on on council uh, there are people that are kind of in you know in groups and allowing the secret ballot one of the things that it does is it allows you to vote against um, the group especially when you think that there's an opinion that's going to be prevalent there. Uh, without potentially facing backlash uh, on the fact that you want to work together with these groups uh, on a number of different issues. Uh, and this kind of protects the integrity of the process a lot. And I guarantee that many of the motions, especially the ones that required two thirds majority only passed because of, because of the secret ballot. And, and this is one of the things that I think is central to the system. And when somebody basically feels either that uh, they don't want, uh, for example, backlash from their, their fellow peers uh, for voting against them, uh, that I think is a very, like, I think everybody can sympathize with, with that. And especially like, like the, the fact of the secret ballots has caused uh, motions, more motions to pass. I don't think it's ever caused the motion to, to um, oh, many more times than it's caused motions to fail. Uh, and another reason is, for example, uh, we saw um, people falsely uh, attributing votes to people even when they were in, um, uh, even in open session and then threatening to, I mean, some of the people they got correctly, some of the people they got wrong back in June, and then threatened to go around, not to the students to keep the students accountable, right? But going to people's employers and finding their employers and getting them fired from their jobs because of how they voted in the CSU. And this is a thing that happened not too long ago. And so there are legitimate p fears that people can have. And I think, for example, uh, having a majority vote um, to require such a secret ballot, uh, then people would be able, would be making this inference um, that the people that, for example, are voting um, for the secret ballot are the people that are going to be voting uh, the way that whoever is, is there trying to go after people uh, does not like. 
Uh, and so it defeats the whole purpose of having a secret ballot. For example, if, for example, if you vote in favor of a secret ballot, then, for example, your groups might think that you want to vote a certain way. It puts a lot of like, especially if it's a majority vote, it, it and if it's open, uh, and everybody knows who is voting the way they are. I think like, it, like we have to kind of remember also the context that we're in, and uh, the fact that people can get incredibly uh, people outside of council uh in in the name of quote unquote holding you accountable uh go so far across the line uh that i think these kinds of measures are necessary to protect the members of this council uh so yeah thank you uh victoria okay so as you guys know i, I mentioned it a lot because i'm very proud of the year and a half that i did on council but i was a council member elected by the jmsb student body which means i represented the john molson school of business students which means every vote that i had was a vote made by one of my peers in the sense of i talked to my classmates i said hey guys this is something that's like on the table what do you what do you think we should be voting because it's not my vote it's my vote for my faculty which means i represent them so they should know how i'm voting they should know what i'm thinking they should know what my process is so that way if they say hey vic you know what that wasn't exactly what we thought is right i don't think that was necessarily the move that you should have made can you revoke this can you do something about this that's how you have those conversations i think the problem here is that there's a lack of wanting to have these conversations and having this transparency and having this accountability you need to talk to your peers and if you don't want to be harassed then why don't you start by having a conversation with them and saying like hey this is something that's being brought to the table this is something that is extremely important this is something that people are talking about what do you think what do you where are you where's your head at there's different opinions on the table. As you can see, we're a room of 30 here. We all have completely different train of thoughts. We all have different ways of going about things, but we come here, we read the room and we speak to one another. This is not removing secret ballot altogether. We're saying if we need a secret ballot, we will call it for specific reasons, but for the most part, we need to be transparent to the student body because that is who we represent. Students don't come here. The only thing they care about is how we voted and what we voted. So we need to emphasize and work on the fact that we need to have these conversations with them so we know what they're thinking, so they know what is happening. And there will be less harassment, there'll be less, whatever, I guess, bullying, because there'll be more conversations and more transparency and more, I guess, kindness slash openness with one another. Um, so yeah, just as someone who was a counselor, I really think that this is really important, regardless on when, what the votes were. You, if you followed anything on the CSU before, I would always say my vote, regardless if it was closed session, which technically was bad, but I wanted my student body to know how I voted and what I felt on the topic, especially when it was something that was important, like Black Lives Matter, or if it was something regarding sexual violence, or something regarding sensitive topics that need to be dealt with. So that's all I want to say, so thank you guys, and yeah, vote wisely. Thank you. Um, so we've been on this topic for a while now. Um, is everyone okay with just finishing the speakers list? So cutting it off at Desiree and then moving to a vote. Is there any opposition to doing that? Okay, so we'll do that. Um, Isaiah, go ahead. Yeah, kind of just like, kind of like um, to address some things that were said. I'm like, you didn't come here. Well, okay, I can't speak for everybody. I'm like, you, you shouldn't come here to be accountable to a group of people that were elected by the student body that like secret ballot is not this mystical power to allow people to kind of like, oh, like now peer pressure doesn't exist. And it's not about like a witch hunt to try to make people feel bad or bully them or make them feel like, oh, you disagree with me. But y'all, I don't know if some of y'all understand, but this is real life. What you say here holds weight on the people. I've said this multiple times. And so if you think in your head that you should be able to say whatever it is that you want and not, and like you can offend as many people as you want, you can make all the comparisons you want, you can do whatever you want, and there should be no system in place to ensure that you are saying, one, the things that the people who elected you are putting, like putting you here to do, and two, like that you think that people, no matter if you, like you can disagree with people, but the biggest problem is if you offend people, if you say, if you just like, um, reference or comment or use all these different things and offend people, what do you expect? It's not about voting like, oh, like my, my alliance or my group of people, now I have, I have to vote for them. You don't. You're independent, all of you. You're all in elected individually by your faculty. So just the fact that like, oh, we work in groups, the only group should be the council itself and the committees, and we come to find the issues. If you have a subgroup within a subgroup, 
and that's your loyalty, that's a, that's a big problem. You should be coming here as an individual voted by your faculty and making these decisions to better both your faculty and the Concordia community. Anything else is just like blasphemous. Thank you. Uh, Aria, go ahead. Yeah, the, it's very strange, but I agree with 95% of what Victoria said. Um, I agree that uh, John Morrison Business School has to know what she votes for. I agree with that. But secret ballot is about the exception. Like, how many of all of the time we vote is secret ballot? Maybe 5%. So we are talking about the exception, the, the, the specific situation where someone here could be harassed. We are not talking about the 95%. Today, all the, the, the votes were open. So did, we are talking about the exception. We are uh, talking about protecting the people who, who have been harassed in a specific situation, not in 95% of, of, of time. And unfortunately, if you are supporting this, even if you don't want to, in practice, you are supporting harassment when, when it's going to happen. Thank you. And I would like uh, that to be noted in the minute. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, what do you want noted? That in my opinion, uh, the council that are going to vote yes, even if they don't want, in practice, they are supporting harassment. Because I have to disclose why I want uh, to have secret ballot. So, so, it's a, so I have to open myself in, in this specific situation. In not, I am not talking about 99% of the situation. I'm talking about a specific situation where I need the secret ballot. And I need a majority to, 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 to be with me. So this is a, in practice a supporting harassment of the person who needs to be protected. Thank you. Uh, Desiree, go ahead. <coughs> hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the fear that a lot of people have with this motion comes from council's toxicity that, I mean, we've all felt very intensely, especially with the quarantine. You know, we had Zoom meetings till midnight, yelling at each other. And I don't think this motion is gonna fix whether people vote for or against this motion it's gonna it's not gonna fix the toxicity that we have and it's not gonna fix how people react to your vote uh, i think first of all we'd all just have to if ever y y people's fears about uh, voting against one's group and standing and saying something that people might disagree with um hopefully everyone not just hopefully Oh, no, sorry, I'm really tired. But yeah, hopefully everyone, you know, treats each other with respect and compassion, I think is the main thing. If ever a friend of yours votes, or not even a friend, a colleague of yours, a colleague of yours votes in a way you don't agree with. Um, I don't think this motion encourages harassment. And I don't think this motion um, allows counselors and, and the public to to harass or to be disrespectful to counselors. I think this motion is for transparency and I'm pretty certain most counselors around here had on their bios the words transparency and accountability and came into the CSU wanting to, um, to, to prove that uh, the CSU can be transparent and I think this motion will help achieve that goal. All right, thank you. Um, so we've exhausted the speakers list and can move to a vote. Um, so pretty obvious that there's opposition to this motion. So I will go by um, roll call. Um, <laughs> start with the list. Uh, Harrison, how do you, oh, sorry. So first of all, if you vote yes, it means you're voting um, for the motion. Well, I'll right. call secret ballot seeing as this is probably the last time I'll get to do it. Okay, um, so. Oh, I do suspect uh, harassment will be applied in the event depending on how this goes. Okay, so secret ballot, um, once again, y'all know the drill, just send me a message. Unfortunately, oh, okay. the counselor is no longer with us and unlike previous motions, there's no other sponsoree. So unless, 
so yeah that's why i'm like i mean i can take it over <laughs> if you want to take it over and sure. like and like so motion to table or motion to like well, either way just motion to table indefinitely it does the same thing yes th thank you oh yeah, yeah, and yeah it just means there's no set point for it to come back right okay oh. okay fine fine if anyone wants to bring it back they can if they don't they can't or they won't um is there any opposition to tabling indefinitely opposition okay that's good um and then uh yeah so i know we had the elections point um is there any can i ask a question yeah go ahead can i like can this be a direct question because the executive work plans were pulled from september 16th which is now a month ago so i'm like and we maybe also before we table like the rest or whatever can we address that point with the elections? Um, I mean, I mean, sure, but thing? can we just pass the elections thing just like it just to make sure that there's no like procedural <laughs> weirdness That's to it? Thing. I just wanted to take those two points, the election and that one. Elections first though, them. because as someone who, as James Hanna said, went through an election that was very not proper, elections first, please. Okay. Uh, can we deal with the things that were tabled from the SEM? Like, um, I have a problem. It's, it's 11.45. It's 11.45. Yeah. Uh, can we maybe? Okay, so I think we just need to decide what we're going to table and what we're going to keep, and then we can deal with the elections. So my proposition. Oh, sorry, Harrison. Yeah, no, I just had a question. Can we make another SEM maybe next week? So to like, because we're having like a ruling, you know. Because <laughs> I have okay, that's the thing. I want a very quick SCM to appoint the CEO mm -hmm. to kind of echo mm -hmm. the stress about elections. And then the rest of it, because we already have a second meeting in October. And so unless people are going to pile up another set of 100, 100 motions, I feel like the, what would come up naturally in that second October meeting wouldn't require an extensive SCM, um, SCM to be like this one. Because we got through at least a good half of the things that we needed to get through. And then um, what's it called? I was to interrupt, that. but can I just say, can we just do the external minutes now? Because I'm sick of seeing them every meeting. Sure. Um, but can we do the well, election first? Because I think it's more. Yeah, the election. Yeah, okay, we'll deal with the election just because if we don't deal with it, then we might not have an election and that would be bad. Um, so we'll just pretend that 8A is next. Um, James, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, just a second. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to, can I just say notwithstanding the relevant provisions? Yeah, be a resolved that the election be called notwithstanding. Yeah, okay, so notwithstanding the relevant provisions in the elections policy, be it resolved the election be called on the dates specified in the executive report. All right, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Hirsch. Um, is there any opposition to this? I think James explained it pretty well before. Um, in opposition, going once, twice. Okay, so that carries unanimously. So we have all our bases covered. And once again, thanks for noticing that. Um, are we okay with just dealing with the appointments at uh, the external committee minutes and then calling it a day? Well, that's the thing. I want I want the work plans to be addressed. <laughs> kind of like pulled. Okay. Um, how about dealing with external committee minutes and work plans and then Adjourning, finding a suitable time for the rest of the points. Can we deal with the external minutes, um, then figure out what we want to do? Because depending on if it's a two minute or an hour agenda point, that can really make a difference. Sure. I guess, but my, my just general question is, why are the like reports pulled? Because if it's an if it's if it's an issue, was it a typo? Was oh, it? Oh my bad. Uh, I should have explained that earlier. I just wanted them to be uh, explained, like, although that's not going to be a short thing. Um, is it yeah, something I, that can be dealt with in our friendly appointment of CEO meeting, Isaiah? Or like, I mean, like, I feel like they can be approved. And then if you want an explanation, like, well, just put some time with us. I feel like an explanation before we approve them would make more sense. But do you have specific questions about them that requires an explanation? Oh, I did, but I don't remember them. So uh, that's the part where we ask them to actually be explained what's in them. <laughs> Isaiah. Uh, is... Are you okay, Caitlin? Yeah, I'm good. 
um, Isaiah, is there, sorry, I keep thinking I mute myself when I cough, but apparently I don't. Um, is there anything bad with um, a, approving the work plans on the 28th, Isaiah? Like, is there something that you folks can't start without them approved? Well, it's just a thing where it's like, technically by like as long as nobody comes for the pay deductions or whatever or blah then we're fine but it's just like i don't understand procedurally why it's being put off because the procedure is you submit them similar to a report if you like I, it's being put off because there are other items on the agenda that have been there for far longer yeah that's a fair assessment um okay can we just deal with the external committee minutes and then move on to like TBD the rest to be determined what we will do after that, just so we can get this off the agenda first. Um, okay, external committee minutes. Uh, Hirsch, this one's yours. Motion to rescind the motion previously passed by council and uh, adopt the full uh, motion as passed by external committee regarding the incident regarding Matthew uh, uh, Matthew, the general coordinator, and Vincent Mousseau. Um, the general coordinator was not actually in the act in the complaint. I removed he wasn't him from the complaint, complaint. But, but he was involved in the incident. Um, uh, I'm just trying to find what was the original motion. Where is that written? Uh, it would be in the um, oh, right in the minutes. Yeah. Um, is there a second for this motion? I second. Second by Matthew. Um, do you want to motivate Hirsch? I'd like to give my motivation to Matthew. Sure, yeah. Matthew. Sure. It's basically, I'm just like, it's the basics. I'm asking for an apology for anti Semitism. If you believe that Jews deserve even the bare minimum to be like to, the human decency, just please vote yes. Like, what more do you want? It's an apology for anti Semitism. If someone just went and like called a black student an offensive name, would you not want an apology? This is like, it's, there's no in between on this. It's literally, you're, you're like asking for an apology for anti-Semitism or you're at, or you're saying anti-Semitism is completely fine. Like this is the bare minimum I can ask for. Point of personal privilege. Uh, yeah, go ahead. As to bring up my point from before with the secret balance when ballots where we come to comparisons, please refrain from comparing anybody's plights to the plights of the black communities. It's like we all suffer, but like it's instances like that that rub people the long way. That's that's all I'm saying. So, right, thank you. Um, so yeah, let's just avoid comparing. Uh, yeah, it was a good way to put it. Comparing plights. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Like I'm confused what you're asking for here, Matthew, because the motion that we did pass asked that Vincent give an apology, but it's like you can't force someone to give an apology. So if like they want to give an apology, like that's up to them. Like all we can do is ask for one from them. And I thought that's what we did. So how is this different? Can I respond? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the exact wording yeah. of the motion. But yeah, go ahead, Matthew. You, you didn't, there, there's a punishment <laughs> for it. Like you were literally saying someone, letting someone who did an anti-Semitic uh, an anti statement, like literally teach anti-discrimination. Like, do you not see the problem with this? If he's not willing to, or if they are not willing to, uh, to, ba to basically apologize, how are they qualified to literally just teach anti-discrimination? It's just... They weren't. <laughs> the, here's, here's the... But this is for future hirings. <laughs> that, that was the motion that was passed on September 2nd, the one that I just posted in the chat. So it's be it resolved that based on so be asked to apologize to Matthew Benzrahim for the anti-Semitic remark, but not to make the apology contingent on their rehiring. So that's the, the, the part in question. Right, that's the motion that we're trying to rescind because it's toothless. Yeah, that's that, because people were asking what, what was actually being rescinded. Um, Hirsch, go ahead. Right, so as I was saying before, uh, the motion that was passed was extremely toothless. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, the, the apology is up to whether or not they would like to make the apology. Um, but sure, we, at the same time, when we're hiring people to run uh, such trainings, I think there's a bare minimum of uh, standard. And you know what? I mean, it is within their right to uh, appeal this decision. But at the very least, there should be some bare minimum of teeth to the motion requiring a, uh, what do you call it, an apology. 
Great, thank you. Um, Arie, go ahead. Well, just because Lauren asked the question, I mean, if, if he does not want to apologize, it's up to him. But why we have to hire him again? That's the problem. He, sh uh, he should not be hired at the game if he has not apologized. That's the issue. Sorry, was that a question? Oh, I am answering what, what she oh. was asking. All right, thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Well, I mean, like, if you talk to the executive team at all, like, and you talk to Eduardo about what happened, <laughs> then I think it would be pretty clear about what the executive team's stance is on. Like, although we did not create an official motion banning Vincent from the CSU or anything like that, like the executive team does take your feelings into consideration and new rehiring Vincent would be very touchy for this, like for counselors and our community and whatever. So it's like, I mean, we cannot make an apology contingent on a rehire because in my opinion, like this is a professional workplace. Nowhere in corporate North America are you going to find a company being like, no, you're like, you are forced to make an apology contingent upon your rehire. Like that's very unprofessional. No one does that. And we're a professional organization. I don't see why we should be doing things like that either. Like, obviously, like, I mean, I just really encourage you to talk to the executive team about what that situation is, because making a formal motion to go out and personally attack one single individual, like, please don't do that. Like, make a policy to help hiring processes, like, be better or something like that. Like, I really, like, I understand this is very personal, but it's, like, I really don't feel comfortable making, like, going after one person about one incident. You're on mute, Caitlin. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, go ahead. You're right. They wouldn't ask for apology. They would be fired, and there would be no high rehiring at all. And they, and they would not give any sort of endorsement or anything they would tell future employers because that's how serious discrimination in the workplace is. Like, do you not see what you're doing with the obfuscation? Like when it's other people, it's fine, but, or it's, and when other people, it's a bad, but when, when it's a Jew, like that just seems to be always the problem with the CSU. Again, I encourage you to talk to the executive. I did talk to the exec. They, I asked three yeah. of them and I got three of their approval for this, for the previous one. Thank you. Uh, Harrison, go ahead. Look, I'm not going to get into to se semantics and the argument about this. What I am going to do is I'm going to talk about how I felt um, being in that meeting and with the situation that went on since I was there. And I will say that their actions were inappropriate. Um, and, and the reference that they made to uh, my fellow counselor was inappropriate. And I just want to echo that. It made me uncomfortable. And frankly, I will say this, I don't think that asking this is, is too much to ask. There are many people in this city, in this province, that are able to provide uh, uh, an integrational, uh, uh, you know, uh, multifaceted approach to oppression as Vincent was able to do. And there, in my opinion, is no reason why they should be rehired in the foreseeable future. And unless they apologize, which they have the opportunity to do. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Roman, you wanted to speak? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanna say that uh, I support my, my fellow Jews on the council and I propose that we get rid of Vincent. Um, he is unfair, and we should uh, <laughs> we should um, we should get rid of him because he's a racist. Uh, uh, Vincent just... uses they them pronouns. What? V Vincent uses they them pronouns, not he. Oh, my apologies. Um, Vincent is racist. Uh, Racism can be applied to, to like, to, to whatever. It doesn't have to be necessarily towards black people. 
and racism should be treated from all sides since uh, to make it truly equal. And for that reason, uh, I say we get rid of Vincent. I don't, I don't, I don't like him. He's racist, and uh, and let's let's eliminate him forever. <laughs> Can we please not like directly? Yeah. Accuse you? Desiree, go ahead. Two, uh, just a second. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. Um, I want to say I'm I'm kind of touched by what the counselors have spoke of. You know, the emotions that are being felt are, are real, and I can tell it. And discrimination is never okay, no matter who it comes from. I'm kind of confused as to what happened. The, I'm sorry, it's it's a long time ago. I think it was last month. Why we did change in council. How, how did it change from what was brought forth to the external committee to what we're trying to rescind right now? What was, why did we change it? We changed uh, first. Did you want to answer that? Yeah, we changed it because it was like, thought it was unfair that we were carrying out like certain actions without hearing Vincent's or giving Vincent an opportunity to speak on his, on their behalf. So that's why we changed it to begin with, to allow them an opportunity to speak as well. Okay. Um, what if, well, would Matthew be open then to take into consideration the, the, the thoughts we had last council meeting if we uh, deleted the last line in the RB it resolved? So delete the, but not make the apology contingent on their rehiring. So that kind of takes care of the, the fear of that we had last council meeting, but also kind of just um, makes us trust the executives that they still won't. No, because I'm asking the bare minimum. I'm sorry, but like, I want an apology for, for the events. Like, how is this controversial? I don't understand. You hire someone for anti-discrimination training and then they discriminate against some, someone in the training. How is this okay? Like, seriously, can someone please answer that? It's not okay, but you can't- And why are you making excuses? All right, okay, folks. Um, Victoria, you are next on the speakers list. Well, no, I just wanted to say that, like, I, I hear both sides. Well, first of all, Matthew, you're 100% right. No, no one should have said anything anti-Semitic because obviously the Jewish community is, a, like, is important, is a community that we recognize. The thing is, and, and the thing that, what you have to really understand is that we cannot control their actions. I personally have not hired them. And I've told my the campaign team exactly why we cannot hire them. They know. I can tell you that I, like, I stand by you on that. I don't know who's hired them. I don't know what you're concerned about, but like, it's just that we can't make them apologize because we can't make anybody do anything. Even if we want to, even if we said whatever we want to say, we can't force them to do what they don't want to do. That's their actions. That's what they have to do. You've mandated us not to hire them. We, I personally listened, we've listened. If there's an incident, well then like, <laughs> bring up a certain incident but as of right now like i feel like this is all very ambiguous motion to call a five information. minute um need five minute break to caucus uh, I'm I'm sure. Sure there's Point a massive, information first. Uh, miscommunication here yeah yeah, sure. uh, yeah what was your question matthew first uh it's more just like i to count the exact haven't been mandated that's the entire issue that's the thing this is to mandate you not to hire them that's the entire issue of this uh of this motion. Just to clarify, unless they give an apology. Yes, it's if you're not allowed to hire them, so there's a mandate not to hire them unless they give an apology. That's I thought they the, passed already. No, no, no. That oh, was yeah. for that. That basically what happened is that was passed. Then it rescinded. Then, then they passed a new motion which removed that. Um. Oh, well, Hirsch. I think we accidentally went into five minute caucus already. Uh, is everyone okay with five minute caucus of just talking to each other for five minutes? Will this be reflected in the minutes? Uh, not, no, it is not. It's basically just suspending Robert's rule so that y'all can explain to each other a couple of things and then we will reconvene in five minutes. Does that make sense? Fair. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So I, Wait, so, so I, I don't have to write anything down? No, no, it's just like, it's, it's like a super unofficial just chat. You don't have to write anything down. You can just write like, we took a five minute. 
Oh, you're on mute, but thank you. Oh, sorry, no problem. What's it called? Um, I guess since Robert Tool suspended Matthew, um, realistic, like, okay. This could be the first opportunity or first of many times that we all work in good faith, knowing that like, cause Ed is not, um, what's it called? There was a situation or a brief overlap in time where the possibility that Vincent could have returned and done an event that was outside of the training or anything, but that was along the lines when we had the discussion here at council and knowing how it made you and your fellow counselors feel, we took the necessary steps to make, to cancel their participation within um, the event, talk to them in the sense and like, it didn't work out. And we don't know, we're knowingly, like my team and I are smart enough and like we care enough about counsel in the sense of like, we're not gonna go there. So Wait I'm like- a second, I just wanted to just point one thing out. It's not you I'm afraid of, it's whoever comes after you. It's that if someone comes after you and they don't notice and they decide whatever, I'm just gonna do, uh, make the Jewish counselors feel comfortable, uncomfortable by, uh, by appointing this. It's because I have complete faith of you and your team. It's, this is important because it's the people after you. So can we write a policy about it? Like, because I feel like this, like, because you don't want discrimination of any kind, right? So, or like any racism or anything, like why can't we make a broad- I'd be, I'd be completely open to doing a policy, but I also want this to pass. Like, I don't see any reason for it not to pass. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Can I just ask, after that motion on council was passed, like the spirit of it was because when it went to external, there wasn't a proper procedure and to fix that. So was Vincent reached out to again and did they not apologize again? Because if, you know, that happened and that didn't happen, then I don't see a problem with just passing this motion. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't um, express issue to make an apology. Question to Caitlin? Yes? How much longer do we have to wander off and get drinks and whatnot? Three minutes. Wonderful. Along the same lines, uh, just to clarify, Isaiah, so Vincent, Vincent they were asked, um, <laughs> and they did not want to apologize, correct? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So they still don't want to apologize, right? Just, okay. Like, I believe the spirit was to have them come and kind of like explain their side of the events or what transpired or whatnot, or okay. like all but, this, but yeah. Like, like the rules are the rules that I understand, but that being said, like, I'm sorry, Matthew, but ultimately disagree with Vincent's decision, but it's ultimately their decision if they want to apologize or not. No, isn't no the motion isn't to mandate an apology. The decision <laughs> is to mandate Vincent specifically to not be rehired if they hey, didn't apologize, which is the case in this case. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's so, so nobody got it into a a, of course. They are agreeing. But the problem is all agreeing right now. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're all on the same page. Okay. But he doesn't want to apologize, so his apology won't. Roman, be Roman, clear. Roman, Roman, they, they, they. They, they don't want to apologize, so and what is an apology? An apology is someone being sincere. If he's not going to sincerely apologize Roman, right from the beginning, Roman, then it's Roman, useless. Roman, Get they, rid of him. Roman, they. They. So Roman. is there anyone with that information who is opposed to this mandating of not rehiring them <laughs> i just want to say that again we can't control whether they apologize or not that's not what we're trying to do we're trying to control that for the future not only for this year we trust your executive uh or at least i yes, do i right? trust the executives they were it, very we're helpful talking about for the future for the foreseeable future for next yeah. year for the year after should yeah. a person that made a comment like that be hired if they consistently don't want to apologize <laughs> i say no me neither yeah me too there. Right. I, I, um, I'm like I, I completely agree um, you know I think we should just well I can't but, but like pass the motion to not have Vincent hiring I think it's just best practice for now and this year <laughs> what was said what was said to Matthew was unacceptable so I think we should you know like you know just pass it you know like I think it's just common sense here like we don't want someone back who's going to we want someone who's professional who's going to be making the right decisions so I think let's just pass it I it's just it's common sense you know discrimination is discrimination so you know let's just not have Vincent and you know, there are a million other people like we can find to do like an oppression training. So, you know, it's not going to be hard. 
Like, let's just... Yeah. Let's just also, talk. sorry, I interrupted you. Finish what you're going to say. Go ahead, Shivani. No, it's fine, but I'm just agreeing, like, we should just pass it. Yeah. That's all. Also, to address, I forgot which one of you said it, but one of you said it's not professional for, to uh, fire someone based on one comment. I mean, I would agree that it's not a common practice, but it should be because it happens way too often. Someone, when people do this exact same thing of discriminatory remarks and people are like, oh, but it was just a one thing. They'll just learn and then not having uh, repercussions on that behavior. So this is exactly that, that it should be a thing. Well, I agree, but this is like, we're talking a one-time deal if they get fired. Like, I agree, like it's too much, but like, we're talking about someone refusing to apologize and- No, I'm agreeing with you. In a different situation, in my opinion. Yes, the thing yeah, she's like, she agrees. <laughs> I'm very confused. Okay, I'm we all agree. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. most of us everybody, agree. Everybody, think, everybody, think, everybody, think, everybody. Can, we, can, can think, we call the question? I think for the first time- No, she's the very back Robert's rules. Yeah. We're all on the same page. We don't need to argue. Yeah, no. Can we call the question? I was actually looking up caucuses and Robert's rules while you were talking. And um, apparently they are to be governed by the same rules. Oh. Formal, no, in, informal rules as one would use in a committee. So oh. uh, whatever that means to you. Okay. Can um, we bring back Robert's rules and call the question? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, is everyone good with moving to a vote or do we want to? Lauren, I think Lauren wants to say something. Sure, go ahead, Lauren. Okay, like, okay, so we're gonna, we're all in agreement on the motion that we're gonna vote for it. Yes, okay, like, but it's like, I don't want what happened to Matthew to happen to anyone in the future. Like, can we please mandate policy committee to like create a formal procedure? Because the whole reason why this happened is because there was no formal procedure. Motion to uh, to make policy committee work on a procedure for what to do in the case of, of in a discrimination of any kind during trainings or by, hired by CSU. Second. Um, so that's an amendment, I guess. Yeah, I'm just uh, finding some wording. Be it resolved, be it further resolved, that policy can be mandated to work on a procedure for ewing for dealing with discrimination occurring during trainings. Um, <laughs> does that does that effectively sum up your what you were looking to do? Um, I was like thinking more broadly, like in terms of like CSU employees or like like. Th- like in terms of like, not just during trainings, but like kind of like across the board. Um, That's good. Yeah, the only thing is that like, um, employees means something different. Like when you're talking about CSU staff and stuff. So could we Um, do like third party hires? Sure. Isaiah, does that make sense? Or I'm just asking you because you know more about um, yeah, so any contract or honorarium work, whatever it is. <laughs> Discrimination. Um. No, that's not right. Third party entities. Yeah, that works. Sorry? That works. Okay. Um, entities is okay with everyone. So do we have a second for that? Oh, second. Seconded by James. Is there any opposition to uh, tacking that amendment onto the main motion? Opposition once, twice. Okay, so that goes on to the main one. Um, and then just a reminder of the main motion. Um, Isaiah, did you want to say something before we move to a vote? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, so I would like to seek unanimous consent for the motion before us. Yeah, I was just trying to find the wording. But anyways, we all know what the, what, uh, the wording was that um, Hirsch had submitted. Uh, so is there any opposition to adopting the uh, motion as amended? Opposition... Going once, twice. Okay, so that carries unanimously. Um, And now we must decide what to do with the agenda before us. I motion. Yes. 
Okay, just wait a second. Yeah, I motion to uh to to table everything to next meeting and adjourn. Next, I presume you mean regular, 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 regular meeting. Hold on. Regular. Pause, 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 pause. Um, table the like table the elections motion indefinitely because it already passed. So that's. Oh. Didn't we already motion to do that? Yeah, we already dealt with it, okay, so it's definitely. technically done. Everything <laughs> remaining, <coughs> next regular meeting, and adjourn. Is there There's stuff on there that's so easy to pass that, like... Yeah, I agree with the calendar thing. Could we just like, do the calendar thing very quick? I think calendar. we should do Lauren's calendar. Actually, motion. the calendar thing, like, I'm going to have to post. What, what's the never calendar mind, thing? table at all. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll look at the calendar thing, just a sec. So, I think uh, we should just pass, yeah, like... <laughs> well, okay, I, I should explain why I would oppose the calendar thing. Uh, it's just that, how do you define the term emergency? I don't know, like a pandemic, that'd be a good emergency. <laughs> no, 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 like, like an emergency meeting, I think, is what they're referring to. Yeah, so, so the calendar thing was like an 11 day warning. Yeah, because like you want to give sufficient time for it to be put on the calendar for people to know about it for students. You know what? Uh, let's not have the discussion about why we're not having the discussion. Yeah, yeah. please table, 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 yeah, table. Is everyone in agreement to table? No. <laughs> what if we do, what if we do something so very simple? Like we the, problem, some... the problem is that then one person wants to put their motion and then another person wants to put their motion and everyone thinks it's simple, but in the end it's not. No, no, no. I have an idea for Lauren's motion. What if we, we give the executive's power to look into like a proper way of doing this? That will be for next meeting. We have to ready to go <laughs> immediately. It is ready to go. The executives already have it all sorted out. It just needs council approval to be implemented. Like they have the systems. They've already been working on it. Oh, in oh. that case, I think we should actually vote on this. <laughs> I take it back Wait. on the table. Do we want to deal with 7E committee meetings? No offense, you probably yes. should have led with that. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Seven. Okay, so we'll do 7E and then we'll deal with James's motion. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Like to motivate for it or to read it? Oh, yeah, you have to read it, sorry. Oh my God. It's so you can just nice. read the people, there will be it resolves. That's oh. really long too. <laughs> Do you want me to read it really, really fast? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, I don't have a lot of air in my lungs. Be resolved that council tasks the internal affairs and student life coordinators to create a collaborative calendar that displays committee meetings and their agendas. Be it further resolved the committee chair is responsible for sending out a when to meet to committee members. Be it further resolved committee members are responsible for filling out the when to meet to finalize the meeting time within 72 hours. Be it further resolved the chair will call the meeting no later than Thursday at 6 p.m. of that week. Be it further resolved the chair of each committee be responsible for sending the meeting's agenda, date, and time to the internal affairs coordinator and the student life coordinator by 6 p.m. on Thursday. Be it further resolved the meeting will take place seven to 11 business days from the time the meeting is called. Be it further resolved the internal affairs coordinator is responsible for receiving committee meeting agendas, the date and time and sharing all the necessary information with council and students slash members at large assigned to the committees via the appropriate platforms by Friday at 6 p.m. Be it further resolved that the student life coordinator is tasked with updating the student events calendar on the CSU website with the committee meetings by Monday at 6 p.m. Be it further resolved the student event calendar on the CSU website includes the agenda of the meeting in the events description. Be it further resolved students at large that would like to attend committee meetings will email the chair giving their name and student IDs in exchange for the meetings teams link. Be it further resolved a committee be able to supersede this process when an emergency meeting dealing with time sensitive matters is necessary. Be it further resolved an emergency be defined as an event situation or a movement that needs an immediate action response from the committee. Be it further resolved in the event of an emergency meeting the committee chair is still required to send the date time and agenda of the meeting to the internal affairs coordinator and the student life coordinator. Be it resolved the system will come into effect the week of the 21st of September 2020. Be it I presume that has to change. Be it further resolved, the budgetary impact is nil. Um, second. Do we have a second? I, I would like to, to, to just, just say something quickly. <laughs> um, mandating the use of specific software, like when to meet, is, is bad practice. Like when I wrote the elections policy stuff, I, I made sure to like avoid putting like specific software names and just put like this type of software because who knows Motion next year there might be a better system that comes Motion. out and i don't want to deal with like we don't we shouldn't necessarily deal with i think it's a waste of time okay, to deal with solution like, motion to change it to a software like uh when to meet sure 
that works. Yeah. When you're muted. Sorry, I said or a scheduling software. Or scheduling software. There we go. That's a better term. Scheduling software. That part. works. I got all the boxes. Um, yeah, Isaiah, go ahead. I don't know if your hand was raised from before. Yeah, but um, okay. Can because that's it. A lot has happened since September when we were ready for like I would guess like maybe like the go live. Can we start fresh, like approve the motion, but kind of like do it for the winter semester, or like because right now we're kind of like in the swing of things and like or just give us flexibility from when we have to start because right now it said for that to be in place by September twenty first, which is now I think two to three weeks ago. So if we could have that flexibility, if we can kind of like take all our different pro like the projects and like align it better type of thing. So can like Eduardo and um, Daniel answer that maybe? Because like from what I heard, like it's pretty much all ready to go. It doesn't need additional work to it. I can't yeah. speak for Eduardo's um, system. His is probably going to be a bit more complicated because his he has to basically redo the website. Like I think I think he, I think he already has like most of it ready, but he still has to like work with the marketing director to make sure the website's ready to go. Mine is really like using like Outlook or the calendar to set that up. Um, I mean, it's not like ready to go just because I don't have the the schedules and everything. So I would just need like I don't know. I'd, I'd need like two weeks or something to set it up and make sure it's functioning. Like, that's okay with me because, like, essentially there's two parts to this calendar. There's one that makes it accessible to students and yeah. the other that makes it just accessible to counselors. So mm -hmm. if we can, like, because since Daniel said we can have it up and running, like, the counselor side of it in two weeks, like, we can do that. And Eduardo can take as much time as he wants to deal with, like, the CSU website end of it. So, yeah, that's that's what hence like flexibility aspect of it so that we can kind of like base off everybody's like workload and project scale so I don't I mean like as long as it's not like oh by tomorrow or before the end of semester before like whatever it is but just something a little flexible to give them to make sure that it's ready for go live type of thing. Yeah, that whole part about the deadline like that's so should we either strike that um part of the motion or change the date it's up to council I'm like, being moved to the next council meeting, our regular council meeting, but I just don't know about Eduardo. I don't want to speak for him. Uh, Eduardo, are you here? I think he had to drop off because it is. Pop we didn't motion to extend, but we already extended. Hence, True. But yeah. Strike it from the motion. Like it, there doesn't need to be a deadline. Like obviously, Eduardo and Daniel can self-manage themselves on that. They don't need a hard deadline. Thank okay, you. so are you all in agreement with just striking that um, someone can make an amendment to strike the deadline, um, be it for the resolve? Motion to switch the deadline to, when am I switching it to? Oh wait, just to strike it, because we can manage uh, themselves. Motion. Wait, so wait, if we strike it, that means it goes into effect immediately. That would be the implication. That's a good point. Um, hmm. Yes, it is worded that way. Um, motion to committee meetings that are scheduled this week and next week just stay the schedule and have it start the two weeks at from the now. discretion. Just so, have it start at the discretion of the internal and student life coordinator. There we go. Does that make sense, Hirsch? Sure. I mean, we're giving Daniel um, a lot of power here, but I hope he doesn't get drunk on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> is there any opposition to um, changing September, I think, 21st to add the discretion of the internal affairs and uh, student life coordinators? Okay, so that um, carries unanimously. Um, so I see there's nobody left on the speakers list. So do we want to move to a vote? Wait, oh, vote, yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, so is there any opposition to uh, adopting this motion? Opposition, going once, going twice. All right, that carries unanimously then. Um, yes? Oh, I was just saying yay. <laughs> yay. All right, yes, congratulations, Lauren. That is your motion. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering if we could just do both my motions today instead of like pushing it off to the next one, just get them out of the way 
they'll be quick anyway. So I mean, that's okay with everyone. You pinky swear that they'll be pit, they'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> swear, <laughs> I'll fast. So uh, I know everyone's tired, but like, I just don't want to pile on more stuff. So, um, are people okay with dealing with H, B, and C before adjourning? I I confident. Sorry, was it was that yes no? Yes. Okay. Um, all right then, uh, Chris, go ahead. All right, so I'll just I'll start off with the um, the hygiene one. Sure. Um, so whereas women have been disproportionately affected during the COVID nineteen pandemic, whereas the closure of Concordia University during the fall twenty twenty semester for the foreseeable future have led to accessibility issues for women to obtain hygiene products. Or is the CSU is responsible to make these products as accessible as possible during the COVID-19 pandemic and post-pandemic times? Um, or is the CSU must reduce accessibility issues amongst women, BIPOC, and LGBTQ plus communities? So be it resolved that the CSU delivers a package of hygiene products from those who request it, that um, each package will consist of diva cups or tampons at the request of those who choose, condoms, bar soap, equal pads, and information package on proper usage, disposal, and general education, and be further resolved that all products are environmentally friendly and are sustainable products. And uh, all unused products by the end of the academic year will be donated to homeless shelters or women advocacy groups. And just to speed it up, um, after COVID-19, when the school opens up, we have an online system for those who like can't pick it up in person, and it will be available through my Concordia and that the budgetary impact is $7,500. Right. Um, do we have a second for the motion? Second. Second by Shivani. Um, you're already motivated. Chris, uh, Howard, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm a complete favorite. Chris actually brought it to me before and we discussed it in length and I feel this is very good and I see as a community, as the CSU, you know, it's been very contentious this semester. And I feel this could be a good way to, you know, for us to agree on something unanimously, I hope, and for us to just get together and make a positive change in the community. That's it. All right, thank you. Uh, Isaiah, go ahead. Yeah, if I could make one amendment or whatnot, because I'm like, um, I guess I would mandate the sustainability committee rather than mandating kind of like the CSU. It's like, mandate the sustainability committee to kind of like do this initiative with council's blessing or we mandate sustainability committee to kind of like um like take it because i'm i'm assuming that depending budget mid-year reviews coming up soon where it's like you guys can just repurpose funds in your budget that you don't think you're going to use to fit the project and work out some of the logistical um, issues that or concerns that people might have at the <laughs> Um, is there any opposition to changing uh, mandating the CSU to mandating the sustainability committee? Well, I mean, um, I think, well, I mean, I presented it to them already and like they're all in favor, but I brought it up uh, to council just. Yeah, in good faith, but like, yeah. I'm, like instead of like, because right now it's like as if like it's an action item as if we need council permission to do it. But at your committee level, like y'all could have like made a motion type of thing. Then like we want to allocate this, put it in consent yeah. agenda, and then um, like done it. Like if somebody had a problem, they could have pulled it. But like this is this is right too. It's like you didn't do anything wrong. But I'm saying that like you guys be the one to kind of like initiate the process. Because right now you're saying the CSU, but who is the CSU? We are all the CSU. So I'm just giving it a little, it's the same way when we have a policy issue, we direct it to policy, so it's kind of like a sustainability, kind of like how sustainability kind of like bring this to life. Okay. Right. Does that make uh, sense? I have no problem with it, so. Okay, great. Is there any other, or is there any opposition in general to changing uh, CSU to sustainability committee in the motion? Opposition going once, twice. Okay, so that will be uh, amended in the motion. And uh, Daniel, go ahead. Um, this is more of a logistical question, but will this be done like during COVID, like effective immediately, or would this be something once we're back on campus? Because we were just curious about like how we would be able to, like, would we have to like bring all these things to <laughs> the executive's house and then we drive around and drop it off and whatnot? Um, the idea I had originally before we went back to <laughs> code red was if 
like a portion of us were allowed to go to the CSU. We would go there, set up everything ourselves and, you know, use it like as a bonding experience too. I mean, especially for me, like I've never met anyone in person. I think it would have been cool to like prepare these packages um, with fellow counselors as well. And then when it comes to delivery, like whoever has a car and then we could like reimburse them for like gas or something. And then when it comes like to post COVID, uh, again, council members assemble and then like we'll partner up with like a local like delivery company, whoever uh, that's at the exec's uh, discretion. But like, that was my idea for now. So if that makes sense. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I have a question related to uh, the semantics of the uh, of the um, the motion. Um, on on one of the lines, it says um, that the CSU de delivers a package of hygiene products from those who request it. Should it be to those who request it? Um, likely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Just wanting to get that out of the way. Okay, yeah, so we just take a little, uh, is that, that is what you meant, right, Chris? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so just a little typo to change. Uh, Hirsch, go ahead. Sorry if I was uh, spacing out when this part was covered. Um, this is more of a question to the chair, um, although I'm sure you can all answer it. Um, budgetary impact is no because it is spent off of the um, sustainability budget line, right? That was my understanding, or usually when it's null, it's because it, it belongs to a budget line that's already budgeted for. Um, was that how you had meant it, Chris? Yeah, we were going to use it with um, the sustainability budget. Oh, perfect. So. Okay, so that makes sense along with, like, it goes along with Isaiah's um, modification. Yeah. Right, cool. It's just um, for this one, I wasn't sure if like we had to go through there, so I brought it here instead. <laughs> but um, but yeah. Um. All right. Is there any more discussion, or we can move to a vote? I guess we can move to a vote. Um. So first of all, is there any opposition to this motion? Opposition going once, going twice. Okay, so that carries unanimously. Um, and we are on your second motion, Chris. And I'll, I'll just, um, can I just skip all the whereases, I guess? Yeah, yeah you're fine. as long as it's just the beer resolves, you're fine. So uh, be resolved that CSU engage in a minimum <laughs> can drives or donation events every year, roughly two per semester. Be resolved that donations will come from students and or the greater Montreal community and that the CSU be in charge of the events and like not uh, spend money. Be it further resolved that the CSU donate all items collected, so like canned foods or just foods in general, clothes, et cetera, to homeless shelters in Montreal, like natural disaster reliefs or like students with low incomes, or any initiatives that will improve the well being and quality of life of people, and that the budgetary impact is nil. Uh, do we have a second for the motion? Um, second. second. Uh, can, I, can I add uh, an amendment that one of those drives be a Christmas basket? Um. Is that okay with you, Chris? Yeah, I'm okay with it. Sure. Um, and your motivation, Chris? Well, I mean, it's just basically uh, like f canned food drives and like helping out people. Like I've done it all the time and I just, I just love helping people, making them smile. And we're going through like hard times right now, right? And I think at, at moments like this, you have to bond with others and like strengthen the community and like help improve the well-being of others and like these types of ways like definitely help with that so like you know we could help students or um homeless shelters or natural disasters and like just be there for people and i, I really want the csu and us to like get involved in stuff like that so that's pretty much it all right thank you uh, just, Victoria, go ahead well i just want to start by saying I love the initiative. Um, first of all, there's no way we can do it on campus, especially like that we're in a code red, but this is all like, I guess it's I have more of a question than a statement, but like this is all contingent on if we get out of a code red, because the thing is too, is that like, now they're saying we're about to hit a second wave and like, we can't do anything in person as a CSU, like we need to avoid it as much as possible because of the risks, because of all of that. And like, university has made about that- About to hit. 
clear with us. Pardon? No, well, we're in the About to hit wave. a second wave. I'm saying we're about to hit the second wave of the second wave. <laughs> <laughs> they extended even longer than they did the first time. So, like, I, I love this initiative, and I was thinking about doing it, too, but we need to maybe try to, like, for, put this as a thing to be, like, done maybe every year, because I think it, it's really an important initiative. But maybe this year, think of a way that we can help students it, with packages like that, but with COVID. Um, so, I think, yeah, just... Yeah, and, and what's the kind of sad thing is that like, like the moment I finished like writing this one, it was just like two days before we got to Code Red. So like I had like everything planned and then that happened. I was just like, okay, great. Um, so hopefully in winter, like, and like, and for the foreseeable future, like things actually go down so we could do this. So like, again, I'm, I'm open to being flexible with how many we do given okay. our current situation. So, but as long as like the initiative does happen. Okay, so then I might have a suggestion for you, but we can make that as a separate meeting. If anybody's interested, we can talk about that. All right, thank you. Uh, Harrison, go ahead. Just a quick comment. Uh, I know James had a recommendation to include one as a Christmas basket, I believe. Um, I just would like to, it's a friendly amendment, just change the name to holiday basket. Sure. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I'm good with that. Is everyone amenable to that? You will just do holiday, Jack. Um, okay, so if there is nothing further, um, then we can move to a vote. Uh, so is there any opposition to the motion as amended? Opposition going once, twice. All right, that carries unanimously. Um, Yay. Now do we get to my motion? Uh, wait, 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 sorry. I know I made fun of everyone for adding stuff to the agenda, but I swear we can do 9A in one word. It's just we have to fulfill the standing regulation that says as per the CSU's bursary distribution policy, the coordinator shall inform council by the regularly scheduled September meeting whether bursaries will be distributed during fall and or winter semester. I think it's Manuela who's dealing with this. Can someone... Motion to trust their word. Winter. Oh, they, they literally just have to say fall or winter and then we satisfy the bylaw. Winter. Okay, thank you. Oh, Isaiah, okay, perfect. Thank you. We have done this. 9A is complete. All right, James, go ahead. I motion to take everything that's still on the agenda, put it in a little ball and throw it into next meeting and adjourn. Second. Uh, second. All right, Please, second. Uh, motion to adjourn. Fourth. Is there any opposition to adjourning? No? Oh, wait, Isaiah, did you have to say something or you're just doing this? No, I just said motion to adjourn. Oh, okay, perfect. Motion to adjourn. I would just like to note that we only have five. It's ready for bed. <laughs> When's the next meeting? Um, two weeks. of October. In two weeks. 28? Yeah. Before I, before I forgot. They're all on even numbered days. <laughs> you have a, a cap on your table, right? On your desk. Sorry? Me? A cup. You were drinking before. Oh yes, yes. It's a cup. Yeah, where can I buy something like that? I like <laughs> I'll send you. I'll send you the link. <laughs> Thank you. I like big cups. I'll, I'll I'll put it into the into the chat. Are you your company? Put it on the Facebook page. <laughs> it's somewhere on this site. Remember, you can put it along with the grout cleaner. It's like a two. Everybody. Like, 